Chapter 26 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Foreign Relations, the Kalmar War In internal administration, Christian IV had shown great energy and talent. An earnest desire to increase his own personal influence and the power and prestige of his realm are features characteristic of his reign. He showed such quickness and originality of thought and such executive ability that the people regarded him as a truly great king, to be compared with the most illustrious monarchs in history. But this view represents nothing but the fondness with which people are wont to cherish a talented ruler who possesses charming traits, and knows how to win their admiration by a jolly straightforwardness and bold alertness of speech and conduct. It is true that Christian IV instituted many useful reforms, but he was not a true reformer. There is not to be found in his many praiseworthy undertakings and happy innovations any constructive principle aiming at the gradual uplifting of the people through a steady improvement of their social and economic condition. He did nothing to rescue the Danish peasants from the wretched condition to which they had been reduced by the nobility. He confirmed all the old statutes aiming at the preservation of the privileges of the aristocracy, and only increased the burdens of the poor by unnecessary wars and extravagant building projects though in minor things he was so saving that, as he informed the council, he could not afford to get properly married. Morally, he was weak, and intellectually not much above the ordinary. Though a man of great courage, he was neither an able general nor a far-sighted statesman. His ambition often led him into undertakings which were beyond both his means and his ability, and which brought upon his kingdom suffering and disaster. He lacked the statesman's intuitive foresight. He spent much of his time in a multitude of details in which he was unable to distinguish the important from the unimportant, and his foreign policy was often dictated by personal pique and ambition, rather than by a wise forecast of political events. In 1597 the king married Anna Catherine of Brandenburg, who bore him six children, three of whom died in childhood. The queen died in 1612, but even before her death he had formed illicit attachments. In 1615 he acknowledged Christine Munk, a daughter of Ludwig Munk, to be his legally wedded wife, though nothing is known of the marriage ceremony, and he never gave her the title of queen. She bore him twelve children, but the marriage was finally terminated by a divorce accompanied by a scandal. He had many illegitimate children with different mothers. His illegitimate sons, Christian Ulrich, Hans Ulrich, and Ulrich Christian, received the surname of Yildenlöwe. Even in that age of no very delicate tastes, the king's moral laxity must have been a constant source of scandal and offense. In Sweden, serious clashes between the Protestants and the party representing the Catholic reaction had led to important changes. King John's son, Sigismund, an ardent Catholic, who had become king of Poland, succeeded his father on the throne of Sweden. But in 1599 he was deposed because of his attempt to overthrow the Lutheran faith. The Duke of Södermanland, a younger son of Gustav Vasa, and brother of King John III, was placed on the throne as Charles IX. The new king possessed some of the ability of the great Vasa dynasty, which was to place Sweden in the front rank of European powers, but he assumed from the outset a very aggressive and uncompromising attitude towards Denmark-Norway, due in part, perhaps, to the fact that Christian IV had shown himself a friend of Sigismund, if not an open supporter of his party. In 1610, Charles founded the city of Gothenburg, which would give the Hollanders a new harbor, where they could unload their cargoes and avoid paying the toll for passing through the Sound. The Swedish aggressions in Finmarken, which had caused trouble in the previous reign, became more pronounced than ever. Charles IX called himself King of the Laps in Nordland, collected taxes as far as Malingen and Tittisfjord, a distance south of Tromsø, and gave the merchants of Gothenburg right to trade from Tittisfjord to Varinger. Christian IV, who wished to maintain a naval supremacy both in the Baltic and the North Sea, resisted these encroachments vigorously, but neither protests nor negotiations could influence the independent and haughty King Charles IX. The northern Protestant powers were thus drifting towards open hostilities at a moment when their German brethren stood confronted by the Empire and the Papacy, who were marshalling their forces for the last great assault on Protestantism, the Thirty Years' War. In 1608, the Protestant Union was formed with Elector Frederick of the Palatinate as director, and the following year the Catholic League was organized with Elector Maximilian of Bavaria as commander-in-chief. 
the Union sought the support of Henry IV of France and of Christian IV of Denmark-Norway, but King Christian chose to wage war with Sweden rather than aid his Protestant brethren in Germany. In 1611, he finally forced the council to declare war against Sweden. It appears that he did not only intend to protect his realm against encroachments, but that he entertained a hope of being able to conquer Sweden and to establish once more the union between the three northern kingdoms. He invaded Sweden with an army of about 6,000 men, and while he laid siege to the city of Kalmar with the greater part of his force, he dispatched Sten Sehested with a portion of it against Elfsborg. The army was supported by the fleet, which was superior to that of Sweden. The Norwegian forces were stationed in the border districts and were instructed not to enter Swedish territory unless special orders were given. On May 27th, Kalmar, with the exception of the castle, was taken, an event which gave to the struggle the name of the Kalmar War, and on July 17th an undecisive battle was fought with the Swedish army under King Charles IX, who had arrived in the neighborhood of the city. The day after the battle, Kalmar Castle was treacherously surrendered by its commandant, and in a similar way Erland fell into the hands of the Danes. Though Gustavus Adolphus, the brave son of King Charles IX, recaptured the island before the campaign was closed in the fall. On October the 30th, King Charles IX died at Nyköping Castle, and Gustavus Adolphus ascended the throne of Sweden. He wished to conclude peace with Denmark, but Christian IV, who dreamed of large conquests, would accept no reasonable terms, and the war was continued. In March 1612, King Christian had greatly strengthened his army in southern Sweden, but he made the tactical mistake of dividing his forces, which proved of great advantage to Gustavus Adolphus, who had only a weak army of peasants, as the Swedish nobles took no part in the conflict. With his main force, King Christian turned towards the city of Gothenburg, which he destroyed after having taken the fortresses of Elfsborg and Gullborg. But the fleet, though superior to the Swedish, accomplished nothing, and he had won no decisive victories. After unsuccessful operations against Jönköping, the king returned in August to Copenhagen, whence he again advanced with his fleet against Stockholm. But Gustavus Adolphus hastened to the succor of his capital, and Christian sailed away without venturing an attack on the city. This was the last important event of the war. Through the efforts of England, peace was concluded at Canerud, January 20th, 1613. Sweden relinquished all claims to Finmarken, and agreed to pay a war indemnity of one million riksdaler. All conquered territory was relinquished, both countries should have the right to use the three crowns in their coats of arms, and they should both enjoy the same trade privileges and freedom from tolls. The war had produced no marked result except that of destroying lives and property, of creating bitter enmity between the closely related Protestant nations of the North, and of increasing taxes and public burdens. Some of the Norwegian forces seem to have taken part in the operations against Elfsborg, but the Norwegians were not much interested in the war. Some of the officers in charge of their forces were incompetent, and the soldiers were often disobedient and unwilling to fight. But two minor episodes occurred, one of which especially became of great importance to the Norwegian people. In the Kalmar War, both Christian IV and Gustavus Adolphus enlisted foreign mercenaries. A Flemish officer and colonel in the Swedish army, Jan van Munkhoven, was sent by Gustavus Adolphus to the Netherlands and Scotland, where he raised a force of 1,200 or 1,400 men, with which he hoped to capture Trondheim. He lost one ship, but arrived at Trondheim with the rest of the force, some 800 men. But the people defended their city well, and he sailed to Stjerdalen, where he landed his troops. A force of 250 soldiers and 1,000 bunder, which had been assembled, was scattered without difficulty, as the Lentera, Sten Bilda, was a cowardly and incompetent man, who did little or nothing for the defense of the country. Munkhoven crossed the mountains into Herjedalen and Jemtland, where he harried and plundered unmolested. He fought at Kalmar and fell in the siege of Gidolf in Ingermanland, 1614. The second corps of mercenaries, raised in Scotland for the Swedish service, met a different fate. The enlistment was entrusted to James Spence of Warmiston, who died later as a Swedish baron. He employed Colonel Andrew Ramsay to conduct the recruiting, and James I, King of England and Scotland, who was married to King Christian's sister Anna, and probably would not have offended his brother-in-law, learned nothing of the recruiting until it was too late to prevent the enlisted soldiers from leaving. A small force, possibly 350 men, succeeded in departing, led by Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Ramsay, 
under whom served the captains Bruce, James Moneypenny, James Scott, George Hay, and George Sinclair. On the 19th and 20th of August, 1612, they came to anchor in the Romsdalsfjord, and landed their troops at Klungnes, near a cliff which still bears the name of Skothammeren. They forced Tubunder to act as guides, and began their march through Romsdal. The people fled at their approach, and as they were a small force, they did not venture to harass the settlements through which they marched, but hastened on their way and crossed the mountains into Gudbrandsdal. But news of their approach had been received, and the brave lensmand Lars Haga had assembled the men of Lesia, Dovra, Volga, Fron, Lom, and Ringebu, who under the command of the foged Lars Gram took their position on a mountainside overlooking Kringen, where a road passes at the foot of the mountain along the Logan River. Their exact number is not known, but in a song written shortly after the battle they are said to have numbered 500, which seems to be approximately correct. The officers who were taken prisoners stated that the Scots numbered 350 men. The Bunder gathered piles of stone and timber on the mountainside, and everything was ready when the Scots arrived on August 26, 1612. The advance guard was allowed to pass, but when the main body arrived the signal was given, and an avalanche of stone and timber swept down upon them. Many were killed outright, and many more were swept into the river and drowned. The rest, attacked in front and rear, were forced to surrender. The advance guard was also captured, but most of them were put to death after they were taken prisoners. Only eighteen were escorted to Akershus, among whom were the officers Ramsay, Bruce, Moneypenny, and Scott, who were sent as prisoners to Copenhagen. Hay and Sinclair had fallen. Some of the Scots remained in Norway, and some enlisted in the Danish army. Insignificant as this episode was from a military point of view, it was, nonetheless, the spark which kindled the national patriotism and roused the martial spirit of the Norwegians. Hitherto they had been too indifferent even to defend themselves. Henceforth their valor became proverbial. A stone slab was erected on the battlefield of Kringen fifty years later, bearing the inscription, Here Colonel Sinclair was shot on the 26th of August, 1612. This slab was replaced in 1733 by a wooden cross bearing a bombastic rhymed inscription, which King Christian the Sixth read on his visit in Gudbrandsdal. Footnote. This inscription reads, Courage, loyalty, bravery, and all that gives honor, the whole world midst Norwegian rocks can learn, an example is there seen of such bravery, among the rocks in the north, on this very spot. A fully armed corps of some hundred Scots was here crushed like earthen pots, they found that bravery, with loyalty and courage, lived in full glow in the hearts of the men of Gudbrandsdal. Jürgen von Sinclair, as the leader of the Scots, thought within himself, No one will here meddle with me. But lo, a small number of Bunder confronted him, who bore to him death's message of powder and ball. One northern monarch, King Christian the Sixth, to honor on his way we have erected this. For him we are ready to risk our blood and life until our breath goes out and our bodies lie stiff. This not very happy translation is found in Thomas Mitchell's History of the Scottish Expedition to Norway in 1612. End footnote. A new stone slab with the inscription, In Memory of the Bravery of the Bunder 1612, was erected in 1826. This was again replaced by a new stone monument, August 26, 1912. King Christian had learned two things in the Kalmar War. In the first place, that his army organization was antiquated and wholly inefficient, and secondly, that Denmark could no longer seek territorial aggrandizement in Sweden. As soon as the war was over, he began to improve the army both in Norway and Denmark. In 1614, he issued an order for the creation of a small national militia, which should always be ready for military service. In Norway, this force was to consist of 2,100 men, but the order does not seem to have been systematically carried out, and the plan was soon abandoned. In 1617, the firearms which had been provided for this army were finally sold to the people. Not till after Denmark's sad experience in the Thirty Years' War was the plan of a better military organization carried out. In 1618, the Thirty Years' War broke out, and nearly all nations of Western Europe were drawn into its bloody vortex. Bohemia became the first theater of war. 
In 1620, the troops of the Emperor and the Catholic League defeated the Protestants in the Battle of the White Mountain, near Prague, and Frederick V of the Palatinate, who had been chosen King of Bohemia, had to flee, and was later outlawed by the Emperor. Tilly, the general of the armies of the League, wasted the Palatinate with fire and sword. Bohemia was fearfully ravaged, and the Catholic religion was re-established. This encouraged the fanatic Emperor Ferdinand II to make a general assault on the Protestants in Germany. In order to make himself independent of the League, he placed in the field a new imperial army under Wallenstein. The Protestant princes were in dire straits. Spain had also joined the Catholic alliance, and by dangling before the eyes of King James I of England a possible marriage between his son Charles and a Spanish princess, succeeded in keeping him inactive. France, though hostile to the House of Habsburg, was a Catholic power, and Holland lay bleeding and exhausted after the wars with Philip II. In their distress, the Protestants again turned to Christian IV. Elizabeth, the daughter of his sister Anna and King James I of England, was married to the exiled King Frederick of Bohemia. He sympathized with the Protestants, and what possibly weighed still more, he had for some time been trying to extend his influence in Lower Germany, in the hope that he might be able to obtain some of the secularized bishoprics for his sons, and also to gain control of Hamburg and Bremen. He did not fear the consequences of a war with the powerful Catholic coalition, but the council would not embark on so hazardous and expensive an undertaking. The king, however, turned a deaf ear to their remonstrance. A promise of aid from England, and the fear that Gustavus Adolphus might become the leader of a Protestant alliance, led him to decide for war. In May 1625, he entered Germany with an army of about 20,000 men, and the reinforcements sent him by the Protestant princes increased his available forces to about 30,000 men, the greater part of which consisted of German mercenaries. But Christian's operations were slow. He wasted much time in minor skirmishes which could lead to no decisive result, and nothing was accomplished in the first campaign. In 1626, Wallenstein defeated the Protestant forces under Mansfeld at Dessau, while Christian was facing Tilly with an army which was rapidly being reduced in numbers through sickness and desertions. Money was scarce, and the aid given by England was of little real value. At length, Christian risked a decisive battle, August 17th, at the village of Luther am Barnberg, near Wolfenbüttel, but suffered a crushing defeat. The retreat turned into a rout. Panic seized the fleeing army, and the king barely escaped falling into the hands of the enemy. When he reached Wolfenbüttel, he was accompanied by eighty horsemen who had gathered about him in flight. After this defeat, Christian showed remarkable energy. He raised another army for the campaign of 1627, but the resistance which he could make proved useless. In July, Tilly crossed the Elbe and united his army with that of Wallenstein, and the two generals began the invasion of Denmark. The whole peninsula was soon overrun and subjected to the wildest ravages, not only by the lawless warriors of Tilly and Wallenstein, but by the mercenaries in King Christian's own army, who turned brigands and marauders. Denmark was on the verge of utter ruin, and Emperor Ferdinand II and Wallenstein were already laying plans for extending the borders of the empire, and of establishing its control over the Baltic and the North Sea. This grave danger brought Gustavus Adolphus into the arena. The imperial forces laid siege to the city of Stralsund, but it received help from Sweden and Denmark, whose fleets controlled the Baltic, and Wallenstein failed to take the city, though he is said to have sacrificed 12,000 men in the attempt. Gustavus Adolphus wished to form an alliance with Christian IV for the defense of the North and the Lutheran faith, and nothing could have seemed more advantageous for Denmark at this moment, as Wallenstein offered Gustavus to partition the kingdom of Denmark and Norway in such a way that Sweden should receive Norway, while Denmark should be the portion of the emperor. But Christian's suspicion and jealousy prevented an alliance of the Protestant kingdoms of the North at this critical moment. It may be urged in his defense, however, that by avoiding an alliance with Sweden he could obtain more favorable terms of peace. On May 12, 1629, he signed the Treaty of Peace with the Emperor at Lübeck. He had to relinquish all claims to German possessions for his sons, he had to resign as commander of the Protestant forces in Germany, and had to promise not to meddle with German affairs in the future but he lost no territory, nor was he forced to pay any war indemnity. These easy terms were not granted by the emperor and Wallenstein from any kindness of heart, 
but because they wished to have their hands free for the coming struggle with Gustavus Adolphus. But though Christian had succeeded in making peace on better terms than could have been expected, Denmark had paid dearly for his participation in the war. The ravages and suffering brought upon the kingdom seem to have destroyed its vigor, and the battlefield of Luther on Barnberg marks the beginning of Denmark's national decline. In 1628, while the realm was in its deepest distress, the king began in earnest the reorganization of the army. According to an order issued on January 18th of that year to the Norwegian stadtholder Jens Juel, four farms, gårds, or eight half-farms, or sixteen quarter-farms, should form a logd, which should furnish and maintain one soldier. According to this plan, an army was raised, consisting of five regiments, Trondhjem, Bergenhus, Tunsberg, Ankershus, and Bohus, and three Feniker, Stavinger, Agdesiden, and Jentland. After peace was concluded at Lübeck, this organization was again abandoned because of the resistance of the people to military burdens, but it was reestablished by the ordinance of September 19, 1641, which united the Stavanger and Ogdeseed and Fanniker into a sixth regiment. Each regiment numbered about a thousand men, and was divided into three companies, except the regiment of Bergenhus of 1,300 men, which was divided into four companies. Cavalry was organized through Vrostjanesta, i.e. mounted service demanded of nobility, clergis, and odelsbunder. According to the military ordinance of 1641, the cavalry numbered 520 arquebusers and 500 dragoons, but the latter, which was selected from the infantry, might be regarded as mounted infantry. Through the ordinance of 1628, 14 city companies, each numbering about 100 men, were also organized. Two in Trondheim, four in Bergen, two in Christiania, and one in each of the cities of Fredrikstad, Tensberg, Skien, Konghella, Marstrand, and Udevala. These companies, totaling 1,400 men, were recruited among the citizens of these cities, and were to serve as a sort of garrison for their protection. The fortresses in Norway at this time were Vardahus, Trondheim with Munkholmen, Bergenhus, Akershus, Bohus, Fredrikstad, Marstrand, and the redoubts of Vinger, Flekere, and Frusan in Jemtland. These fortresses had permanent garrisons, which were greatly strengthened by Christian IV. The term of military service was fixed at three years, and no one could rent land or own or operate a farm who had not rendered the required military service. Norway had thus received a national army, which in time became an invaluable aid in the struggle for national liberty, and which was of far greater value to the country in time of need than the lawless foreign mercenaries employed at that time in the wars in all countries. End of chapter 26Chapter 27 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. New National Growth, Hannibal Sæstad, A New War with Sweden. Immediately after the introduction of the Reformation, which destroyed what was still left of the old spirit of independence, Norway reached its lowest ebb of national weakness. But signs of a new social and economic growth soon began to manifest themselves, and before a century passed, considerable progress had been made towards a new and more vigorous national life, which was characterized, however, by a more distinct stratification of social classes. A Lutheran clergy had arisen, generally well-educated, and imbued with the love of learning and the more advanced ideas of the Renaissance. A new merchant class sprang up in the cities, and a new nobility springing partly from the old Norse nobility and partly from immigrated noblemen also came into existence. The growth of these new classes resulted, however, in increased burdens for the Bunder, who, prior to the Reformation, had enjoyed a very high degree of social and economic independence. Christian IV, who needed money for his expensive wars and buildings, increased the taxes and augmented the military burdens through the new army organization, while the three upper classes, whose interests were not identical with those of the Bunder, sought to increase their own privileges and powers. The Bunder, who up until this time had virtually constituted the whole nation, were gradually reduced to the fourth and lowest estate. But their freedom was not destroyed, their spirit was not broken, nor was their economic well-being and independence seriously impaired, though they lost much of their former power and social prominence. Four distinct estates were gradually developed, 
nobility, clergy, merchants, and bunder, and assemblies of estates replaced the old log things. From 1548 such assemblies of the four estates were summoned to do homage to a new king, but in the latter part of the reign of Christian IV they also took part in the levying of taxes and in the making of laws. The new social classes, though often grasping and selfish, represented in many ways a more enlightened patriotism than the bunder, who loved intensely their rights and freedom, but who failed to understand the demands which new ages bring, and lacked the scope of vision necessary to develop the country along national lines. The development of the four estates was a distinct organization of new forces which were to lift the nation to a higher plane both politically and intellectually. The new national army, the fortification of the cities, the creation of coast defenses, and other timely improvements were made possible through their support. Closely associated with the development of the estates was also the consolidation of the government officials into a distinct and influential class, a bureaucracy. In 1547, Norway received again its own chancellor, who was the keeper of the seal and exercised supervision over the courts of law, and in 1572 the Lensherre of Akershus was made stadtholder of Norway. Christiania, as his resident city, became the center of Norwegian administration, the place where the assembly of estates met, where kings were hailed, where the leading men of the kingdom assembled, a center from which social and political influence began to emanate. The new city, though small, was becoming the capital of the kingdom. In 1642, Hannibal Sæstad, a Danish nobleman, was made Lensherre of Akershus and Stadtholder of Norway, and the same year he married King Christian's daughter Christiana. The new Stadtholder was a gifted man of fine appearance and noble bearing. In company with one of the princes he had visited Rome, Naples, Paris, and London. He had been sent on important missions and had become acquainted with the leading statesmen, and especially as the king's son-in-law he could appear with royal dignity in his high office, though he was yet only thirty-four years of age. On his arrival in Norway, Sehestad entered upon the important duties of his office with great energy and earnestness. He studied conditions closely and aimed to make all possible improvements with the aid and advice of the estates, which he summoned to meet in Christiania. He sought to perfect the yet incomplete military organization, to secure firearms for the army, and to aid the mining industry, which was in great need of encouragement and able assistance. In these efforts he was aided chiefly by the nobility, the clergy, and the cities, while the bunder held aloof or showed opposition. Partly because their burdens were already heavy in proportion to their income, but partly also because they still lacked understanding of the value of national improvements. With his good judgment and administrative ability, Sehestad might have done great things for Norway if his work had not been suddenly interrupted by a new war with Sweden. The crushing defeat of the Danish army in Germany, and the phenomenal victories of Gustavus Adolphus, which shed the brightest luster on Swedish armies, and filled all Europe with acclaim, suddenly changed the political aspect in the north and awakened the keenest jealousy of the ambitious King Christian. Not only was Sweden assuming political leadership in the north, but the hitherto insignificant kingdom was becoming one of the great powers of Europe, while Denmark, which but recently had treated Sweden as a dependency, was sinking into obscurity. Gustavus Adolphus's brilliant career was closed on the battlefield of Lützen, 1632, but the great Swedish general still wielded the sword valiantly. The foreign policy of Sweden was wisely guided by the sagacious statesman Axel Oxenstierna, and an alliance with France made her position quite secure. By pursuing a friendly policy, King Christian might have profited by the new situation. But would he, could he admit that Denmark-Norway had lost the coveted leadership in the north? No bitterer chalice could be brought to the lips of so proud a king. He would still oppose Sweden, not openly, but he began to systematically annoy the Swedish government by posing as a peacemaker and by trying to prevent Sweden from securing possessions in Germany. In the fall of 1637, he even offered the emperor to resist with armed force any attempt of Sweden to secure German territory. In vain, Peter Viba, the Danish minister in Stockholm, warned him. The king thought that the course which he was pursuing was not dangerous. But Sweden was not in a humor at this moment to bear patiently with a jealous and meddlesome neighbor. The Kalmar War and the indemnity which Sweden had been forced to pay by the Peace of Kinerod were not forgotten, and Axel Oxenstierna was much irritated by King Christian's duplicity. In 1643, orders were given the Swedish field marshal, Lennart Torstensson, 
to march against Denmark. The order reached him in Moravia in September, and he immediately put his army in motion. On December 12th he entered Holstein, and by New Year he stood in Jutland. Both King Christian and the council were taken by surprise. Before the end of January the whole Danish peninsula was in Torstensen's hands, and General Gustav Horn occupied Skalna with an army of 11,000 men. Louis de Geer was sent by Axel Oxenstierna to the Netherlands to attempt to secure an alliance against Denmark, as the Hollanders were opposed to the sound toll, which hindered their commerce in the Baltic. But they did not like to see Denmark annihilated, and Sweden too powerful, and de Geer only succeeded in collecting a fleet of thirty vessels, which was sent under command of Thiessen to cooperate with the Swedish forces. In Denmark all was consternation, and no one knew what to do. The king alone retained his presence of mind. He placed his confidence in the fleet, and Norway might be able to give some assistance since it now possessed an army. Stadtholder Sehested was in favor of an aggressive policy on the part of Norway, a plan also favored by King Christian, but the Norwegians strenuously opposed an attack on Sweden. The quarrel was not theirs. They would never, they said, attack Sweden, for their Swedish neighbors wished them no harm, and they well knew that if they touched Sweden it would be to their own misfortune. Their opposition to the stadtholder in this matter grew very bitter, and it must be admitted that their view was justified by the situation, as it was proven to be correct by the issue of the war. But the Danish lords cared but little for the public sentiment in Norway. Jakob Ulfeld in Jemtland had already opened hostilities by sending forces to raid the neighboring Swedish districts, but they had to withdraw before the Swedes, who occupied Jemtland. Daniel Buscovius, a chaplain from Elfdalen, also advanced from Dalarna with 200 men into the districts of Indre and Serna in Østerdalen, and persuaded the people to swear allegiance to Queen Christina, the daughter of Gustavus. The Norwegians again advanced, captured Mersel Redoubt, and recovered Jemtland, which remained in their possession during the rest of the war. In the meantime, Sestad had made preparations to invade Varmland with a force of 2,000 men, assisted by a similar force under Henrik Bjelka but he was ordered to cooperate with the king, who had already spent some time before Gothenburg. On the arrival of Sehestad, King Christian departed to take charge of the naval operations. On May 16, 1644, he met Thiessen's fleet, and defeated it in the Battle of Listdieb, off the west coast of Schleswig, and after a second engagement a few days later, Thiessen had to return to Holland. On July 1st, King Christian and Admiral Vind fought the great naval battle of Kolberger Heide, off Kiel, with the Swedish fleet under Klaas Fleming. The old king showed the greatest bravery. Even after he was so severely wounded that he lost the sight of one eye, he stood on the deck of his flagship, Trefoldigheden, and encouraged his men. As a result of the battle, the Swedish fleet was bottled up in the harbor of Kiel, but through the negligence of the Danish Admiral Galt, it managed to escape. Galt was sentenced to death and executed, and Erik Ottesen Ornig, a Norwegian captain, became chief admiral. When Thiessen had repaired his ships, he again put to sea, sailed through the sound under the thundering cannons of the Kronborg, and joined the Swedish fleet. A Danish squadron of seventeen ships under the Norwegian admiral, Pros Mund, was attacked and destroyed. Only three frigates escaped into the harbor of Copenhagen. Sehestad did not engage in active operations till in June, when he attacked and destroyed the newly founded city of Wernersborg, and sent George von Reichwein across the border from Winger and Eidskog. Morast Redoubt was taken, but the Swedes dispatched Gabriel Oxenstierna to recapture it. Sehestad now joined the Norwegian forces, which numbered 2,825 men with 18 field pieces. A serious battle was fought, in which the Norwegians were victorious. Henrik Bjelke entered Dalsland and took the city of Almel, but the Norwegian forces found it necessary to withdraw again to the border, and in May, Morast Redoubt was the only point in Swedish territory in their possession. The newly organized Norwegian army had proven that it could render efficient service, but the active part which Norway had been forced to play in the war could not avert the disastrous outcome. After the destruction of Prosmund's squadron, Denmark's strength was so nearly exhausted that King Christian was compelled to negotiate for peace. The representatives of the two powers met at Bromsebro on the border between Blekinge and Småland, 
where the peace was finally concluded August 13, 1645. Christian had to cede permanently to Sweden the islands of Gothland and Ösel, and Holland for a period of 25 years. He also had to cede the Norwegian provinces of Jemtland and Herjedalen. The districts of Indra and Serna, where the people had sworn allegiance to the Queen of Sweden, were not mentioned in the treaty, but they were retained by Sweden, as they were regarded by the Swedes as a part of Herjedalen. The Norwegians, who had been dragged into the war against their will and had defended their territory successfully, suffered the greatest loss, and might well regard themselves as the victims of Danish politics. But the peace was nonetheless welcomed with joy because of the oppressive burdens caused by the war. In Bergen, the news of peace was hailed with the firing of guns, the flying of banners, and thanksgiving services in the churches. King Christian's unfortunate wars not only destroyed Denmark's preponderance in the north and transferred the leadership to Sweden, but they affected distinctly also the relation between Norway and Denmark. It became evident to a far-sighted statesman like Hannibal Sehestad that Norway, which was making rapid commercial and economic progress, and was so near a neighbor to Denmark's powerful rival, could no longer be treated as a mere dependency, administered in the interest of Denmark, and defended by a few companies of soldiers placed as garrisons in the leading fortresses of the kingdom. The altered situation had created new demands. Neither King Christian nor the Danish statesmen regarded the peace of Bromsebro as permanent. They would await the opportunity to regain what had been lost, but in a new conflict Norway might prove a source of weakness rather than of strength from a military point of view if the old system was continued. Sehested would introduce a new policy. Norway was to be made a power with sufficient military and administrative autonomy to act of her own accord. The kingdom was not to be a weak dependency which had to be defended, but an active partner in the Union. He had discovered Norway's strength in the war with Sweden, and saw that by a wise policy of administration the strength might be rapidly increased. He won the old king for his plan, and received such a plentitude of powers that he became virtually acting king of Norway. During the war, the king had given him the supervision and highest authority over the Norwegian army, a power which was not curtailed even after the peace was concluded, and he soon succeeded in obtaining control also of the finances of the kingdom. He could use the money in the Norwegian treasury at his own discretion. He was authorized to levy taxes in order to improve the defenses of the kingdom, and to borrow money in the name of the king and the realm. The revenues, which to a great extent had been sent to Denmark, were now largely used in the kingdom and Sehested finally convinced the king of the wisdom of using all the Norwegian revenues at home. On July 2, 1647, King Christian issued an order that all the taxes should be used in Norway for the support of the militia and for the payment of the debt. Sehested sought the active cooperation of the Norwegian estates, as he needed their aid to carry through his reforms as well as the information which they could give him as to conditions in various parts of the country and he summoned them often to give advice in nearly all matters touching the administration of the kingdom. At this point, says Professor Jonsson, he appears as a third power in the government beside the king and the council. He is more than stadtholder, more than viceroy. He is the representative of a definitive political policy, the representative of the interests of a whole kingdom in direct opposition to the one power, the council, and an alliance with the other, the king. But, in fact, the one in the alliance who takes the initiative, who is both the propelling and the guiding force. In October 1645, Sehestad submitted a plan for a permanent military organization to the assembled estates, and the result of the deliberation was that the German cavalry which had served in the war should be kept. This cavalry was, however, dismissed by a royal order in 1647. The regiments should be kept up and strengthened, and the able officers should be employed. According to Sehested's proposition, sanctioned by the king, the regiments of Bohus, Akershus, and Trondheim were to be maintained, and these were increased respectively to 2,000, 3,000, and 3,000 men. The fortresses were to be repaired, and the garrisons strengthened, and as they were far apart, forts were also to be erected at other places. Sehested sought also to create a separate Norwegian fleet of 30 vessels, but failed to carry out the plan as it received no general support. The Danish nobility and the council led by Korfitz Ulfeld, another son-in-law of King Christian, were bitterly opposed to the policy pursued by Sehested and the king in regard to Norway. They scouted the idea that Norway should have a separate army and navy, 
that the finances of the kingdom should be administered for Norway's own benefit, and that no contributions were to be sent to the Danish treasury. This policy, they believed, would lead to Norway's complete independence. The king was now old and weak, and when he lost his oldest son, Prince Christian, who had been elected successor to the throne by the assembled Danish estates, the council gained full control. The reform policy in Norway was abandoned, the expenditures for the Norwegian army were reduced, the Danish chancellor was given control of the Norwegian finances, and the Lensherer were instructed to send their contributions directly to Denmark. On the charge of malfeasance in office, to which he pleaded guilty, Sehested was dismissed and lost all his possessions. But though he was overthrown, his reform plans in Norway were destined to be revived. He had given the kingdom an army, he had organized a centralized administration separate from that of Denmark, and had placed autonomy as the goal towards which Norway should be striving. Such a lesson in self-government could not be wholly forgotten, and the Norwegian army remained as a result of what had been done, as a new repository of national strength to be used in future struggles. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frederick III King Christian IV died at Rosenborg Palace in Copenhagen, February 28, 1648, and as the elected successor to the throne, Prince Christian, had passed away in 1647, a new king had to be chosen. Prince Frederick, the king's next oldest son, born in 1609, seemed to be the next logical candidate. He was stadtholder of the duchies of Schleswig-Holstein, to which he was the sole heir. During his brother's lingering illness, both he and his ambitious wife, Sophia Amalia of Braunschweig-Lüneburg, had made it their aim to obtain the throne if a vacancy should occur, and the prince styled himself in all public documents heir to the throne of Norway. But the nobles opposed him because of his pronounced autocratic ideas. There could be no doubt that if placed on the throne he would attempt to strengthen the royal power to the greatest extent possible, but as he was the king's only legitimate son, his election could not be prevented. On the 18th of April, 1648, he was chosen king of the United Realms, and on August 24th he received the homage of the Norwegian people in Christiania. According to usage, the king had to sign a charter by which the nobility safeguarded their privileges and powers. The attempt was made to introduce a stipulation with regard to Norway which would have revived the long-forgotten clause in the charter of Christian III, and would have once and for all reduced that kingdom to a Danish province. The nobles proposed that Norway shall forever remain an inseparable province under the crown of Denmark, and that the king shall have no rights thereto either by inheritance or otherwise, but to this the king would not subscribe. The charter, as finally signed, created restrictions on the royal power which had never yet been imposed on a Danish king, but as a final compromise Norway was not mentioned. The charter became a purely Danish document. But while the Danish nobles would regard Norway as a province of Denmark, the national spirit was again awakened among the Norwegians. Through the development of the estates, they had again received a national representation after the Norwegian council had disappeared. It is true that the estates numbered many Danish nobles and officials, but it was nevertheless a representation which could speak in behalf of Norwegian interests. This they had done quite effectively when the question arose of using Norwegian revenues in the kingdom instead of paying them into the general treasury, and it is evident that the Danish government did not dare to disregard Norway's rights as a separate kingdom. When Frederick III was to be hailed in Christiania, the Danish chancellor, in a speech to the Norwegian estates, asked them to swear allegiance to the new king, but he did not mention with a word the clause which had been inserted in the Code of Christian IV, that whatsoever lord or prince the Danish council, nobility, and estates shall choose to be king of Denmark shall also be king of Norway. He offered an apology for the failure to summon the Norwegian estates to take part in the election, but said that it was owing to the haste with which the election had to be made. The native-born Norwegian chancellor, Jens Bjelke, replied that the Norwegian estates would take the oath of allegiance to King Frederick III as heir to the throne of Norway, as no one had a better right to the throne than he. King Frederick's position in Norway was not made clear, but the Norwegians had fearlessly maintained that their kingdom was an hereditary monarchy, a position in which they were supported by the king and the stadtholder, Hannibal Sehested. 
The Danish nobility were clearly put on the defensive to maintain the old elective system with which their power was so closely identified. The rent thus made in the antiquated Danish policy was still to increase until the system itself was overthrown. King Frederick III was very unlike his father. He was quiet and given to reflection. He spoke little and wrote still less. He was much interested in literature, art, and science, and especially in alchemy, to which he devoted special attention. He loved power, and felt confident that his future success was preordained by destiny. He possessed a high degree of self-control. He was a keen observer and kept impressions well in mind. But his anger was often of the vindictive kind which might prove dangerous to those against whom it chanced to be directed. When he ascended the throne, King Christian's sons-in-law had formed a political party and had gained full control of the government. The leader of the party was Korfitz Ulfeld, who was married to Christian's daughter, Leonora Christina. Much more gifted and scarcely less influential was Hannibal Sestad, a stadtholder of Norway. Korfitz Ulfeld rose to the highest position in the realm through royal favor, but he possessed also the royal favorite's pride and arrogance, and became generally hated by the nobility. Sehested's overthrow has already been mentioned, but he humbled himself before the king, admitted his faults, received pardon, and was destined to rise again to the highest influence and power. Ulfeld, who was stiff-necked, pursued another course, and fell to rise no more. The relations between Korfitz Ulfeld and Frederick III were strained from the outset. The king well knew that Ulfeld was responsible for the restrictions placed upon the royal power by the charter, and the proud magnate could not gracefully submit to the authority exercised by the new king. The ambitious queen Sophia Amalia also looked with jealous favor on the gifted and beautiful Leonora Christina, whom she regarded as a rival. Ulfeld secretly left Denmark and went to Sweden, where he was well received by Queen Christina. King Frederick instituted an investigation into the way in which he had conducted his high office as steward of the kingdom, and Ulfeld, who refused to return to answer to the charges before the Danish council, became more and more an open enemy of his king and his country. His foul treason and the long imprisonment of his innocent wife cast a dark shadow upon the reign of Frederick III. The overthrow of such powerful magnates as Ulfeld and Sestad could not but weaken the Danish nobility, and render them less able to resist the king, who aimed to curtail their power, if not to destroy it. In 1650 his eldest son, Prince Christian, was elected successor to the throne, but the election was made only in behalf of Denmark, and when the royal successor was to be held in Christiania, 1656, the question again rose whether he was to be regarded as heir to the throne or as elected crown prince. On this occasion, a treatise entitled Norges Riga Arvoriga, written to prove that Norway had always been a hereditary monarchy, was submitted to the king. The author is thought to have been a Dane, Jens Dolmer, who had been the tutor of King Christian's illegitimate son Ulrich Christian Yildenlöwe, who at the time of the festivities was granted a yearly pension from the royal purse. Professor Gustav Storm says, When the document was submitted to the king at a Norwegian council by a man who was personally so well acquainted with him, and who a few days later received a pension from the royal treasury, it is evident that the author has written it at the instigation of the king, and expresses the views of the king and his surroundings. The treatise is therefore a link in the chain of utterances by the king regarding the hereditary kingship in Norway, and reveals the plans which were maturing at the court. That King Frederick should welcome such a plan to increase his power is quite natural, but he was less favorably disposed to a petition submitted by the Norwegian merchant class, or third estate, aiming at securing new improvements and privileges for Norway. The petitioners prayed that Norwegian officers might be employed in the army instead of foreigners, that Norway might get a chamber of commerce, a superior court, and a university. These were all timely and useful improvements, but no attention was paid to the petition, though it was renewed the following year. Even though hereditary kingship and absolute power were established, Norway might derive but slight benefit from the change. After the death of Gustavus Adolphus, his gifted but eccentric daughter Christina succeeded to the throne of Norway, after a regency had conducted the government during her minority. She became of age in 1644 and ruled till 1654, when she abdicated, and her cousin, Charles Gustavus, became king of Sweden as Charles X. 
King Frederick III had been longing for an opportunity to regain the provinces lost in the late war with Sweden, and when Charles X, shortly after his accession to the throne, became involved in a war with Poland, he thought the time had come for the inevitable contest with the rival power. Without much preparation, and without weighing carefully the possible outcome, the king signed the declaration of war July 1, 1657. Seldom has a war been declared more from pure motive of revenge and the feelings associated with it, says Professor Ingvar Nielsen. In his work, Adelsvelden Sidste Daga, J. A. Frederica says, Weak and poor was the kingdom, Denmark, when the war began, dismembered and ruined when it ended. No single man can be made responsible for its weakness and poverty, the reasons for which lie deep in the people's history, in exterior misfortunes, in unfortunate errors made by kings and statesmen, in the absence of a powerful merchant class, but especially in the arrogance, demoralization, and worthlessness of the nobility. Perhaps this weakness and poverty would sooner or later have led to the same dismemberment and devastation which the kingdom now suffered, but for the misfortunes as they happened in these years, that prince whose will was the war of 1657 cannot be wholly free from blame. The Norwegian army was able to render able services during the war. Attacks were made against Sweden both from Trondelagen and from Bohuslän. Peter Vibo was commandant of Trondheim, but the expedition against Sweden in this quarter was to be led by Jürgen Bjelke, probably the ablest officer in the Norwegian army at that moment. His forces numbered 2,000 men, who had been recruited chiefly in Trondelagen. With this force he invaded Jämtland and Herjedalen, drove out the Swedish garrisons, and placed the two provinces once more under Norwegian administration. In the northern districts, Preben von Annen, commandant of Bodegard, raised a small force and attacked and destroyed the Swedish silver mines at Nazafjell and Silbejoki. The expedition from Bohuslän was led by Ivar Kraba, commandant of Bohus. He was successful in a battle at Hjertrum, but failed to effect a junction with the Danish army, which had crossed the border further south. While Sweden was attacked by the Norwegians in Jämtland and Bohuslän, and by a Danish force operating from Skåne, the principal Danish army was assembled in Holstein to march against Sweden's German possessions. But King Charles X Gustavus was above all a warrior. He was a great tactician and a resolute and energetic general, who was always ready for new military exploits. When the declaration of war reached him in Thorn in Prussia, he put his army in motion and advanced by forced marches to the borders of Holstein. The Danish commander, Anders Bille, had kept his forces scattered, and the unexpected encounter with the Swedish main army under King Charles's own command created such consternation and disorder that no effective resistance could be made. Charles Gustavus did not stop to take the scattered fortresses throughout Holstein, but hastened forward, crossed the border of Schleswig, August 23rd, and pitched his headquarters at Kolding, as it was found necessary to lay siege to the important fortress of Frederiksoda. The Danish army, operating in Skåne under Axel Urup, met with no success. Urup was defeated in the Battle of Genevon Bro, and although he succeeded in defeating the Swedes under Gustav Stenbock at Katorp, the advantage gained was of little value, as he failed to make a junction with the Norwegian forces in Bohuslän. At sea, Denmark was more successful, though no signal victories were won. After the undecisive naval battles, September 12th to 14th, the Swedish fleet withdrew to the harbor of Wismar, where the Danish admiral, Henrik Bjelke, succeeded in keeping it shut up for the rest of the war. Denmark had already been placed in a most difficult situation, but new hope was created by an alliance with Poland. Austria also attacked the Swedish forces stationed in that kingdom, and Brandenburg joined the enemies of Sweden. King Charles succeeded in forming an alliance with the Duke of Gottorp, but the situation was nevertheless so complicated that he consented to attempt peace negotiations. Councillor Sten Bjelke and the traitor Korfitz Ulfeld, who was now in the service of Sweden, were empowered to treat with Denmark, but it could scarcely be expected that the Danish government would treat with the traitorous Ulfeld, and the attempt was abandoned. Denmark received no aid worth mentioning from her allies. On October 24th, the fortress of Frederiksada was taken by storm, 1,000 Danish officers and soldiers fell, and over 4,000 were made prisoners, a defeat so crushing that it filled the people with despair, and aroused their anger against the nobles, who were accused of incompetence and treason to the country. 
After the fall of Frederiksada, King Charles crossed the Little Belt on the ice to Fian, defeated and captured the Danish army of 4,000 to 5,000 men at Tibringvig, and seized the island. He did not tarry, but rode across the Great Belt with 2,000 horsemen to Longeland, which surrendered without resistance. On the 8th of February he entered Falster, and on the 11th he stood in Sealand, where Gustav Wrangel joined him with the rest of the Swedish army. There was now nothing left for Denmark to do but to conclude peace, no matter how humiliating the terms. Peace negotiations were begun, and after a preliminary protocol had been agreed upon, the treaty was finally signed at Roskilde, February 26, 1658. Denmark had to cede Skåne, Holland, Blekinge, and Bornholm. Jemtland and Herjedalen had to be evacuated, and Bohuslän and Trondheim's land in Norway were given to Sweden. King Frederick III was furthermore to give King Charles 2,000 horsemen. He had to agree to abrogate all hostile alliances against Sweden, and to seek to prevent any foreign fleet, hostile to either of the two realms, from passing through the Sound. For the second time, Norway had become the victim of a Danish foreign policy aiming solely at the maintenance of the power and glory of Denmark. Norway's interest had never been considered, and the Peace of Roskilde not only alienated great portions of Norwegian territory, but almost destroyed the kingdom by dividing what remained into two dissevered halves. But in those days war was still a royal sport, and Frederick III did not appear to be very downcast by the overwhelming misfortunes which he had brought upon his realm. He invited King Charles to visit him at Frederiksborg Palace, where a great festival was arranged in his honor. For several days the two monarchs feasted, drank, chatted, and made merry, and when Charles departed from Denmark, the batteries of the Kronborg gave royal salute in honor of the victor. Both kings were, however, dissatisfied with the terms of the Treaty of Roskilde. King Frederick III, because he had lost so much territory, and Charles Gustavus, because he did not take more when he had the opportunity. With regard to Trondheim's Len, the treaty was very vague, and King Charles claimed that the district of Romsdal as well as Nordland and Finnmark and were included in the session. Romsdal was recognized to be a part of Trondheim's Len, but King Charles still planned to renew the war. In July 1658, he decided in a meeting with his council at Gotorp to attack Denmark, and Gustav Wrangel was instructed to begin operations against Copenhagen. The city was invested and a siege begun. Kronborg was surrendered to General Wrangel without much resistance, but animated by the desperate situation, the Danes concentrated their forces within their capital, which they were resolved to defend to the last extremity. The unprovoked attack and the fear that Sweden would gain absolute control in the north soon moved other powers to intervene in behalf of Denmark. Holland sent a fleet of 40 vessels and 28 transports with a force of 2,200 men under Jakob von Wassenaar Optom to Danish waters. This fleet passed through the Sound in spite of the fire from the fortresses of Kronborg and Helsingborg, defeated the Swedish fleet, joined the Danish squadron, and sent the transports with provisions and reinforcements to Copenhagen. Brandenburg and Poland also commenced war against Sweden and sent an army into Holstein, which forced the Duke of Gottorp, King Charles' ally, to remain neutral. King Charles Gustavus had planned this time to take possession of all Norway, but the Norwegians were determined, not only to defend their country, but to recover the lost possessions. The people of Trindelagen regretted bitterly that they had been forced under Sweden. The Swedish commissioner, Lorenz Kreutz, who acted as governor of the province, was ordered by King Charles to raise a force of 3,000 men for the Swedish army, but this was so violently opposed by the people that the order could be carried out only with the greatest difficulty. Finally, 2,000 men were impressed to fight in Sweden's foreign wars. They were ordered to be sent to Livonia, and the king wrote to Jan Oxenstierna to watch carefully so that the Norwegians did not desert. Many escaped, but about 1,400 were transported to Livonia, few of whom ever saw their native land again. The Swedish king did nothing to win the favor of the Norwegians. His only thought had been to raise men and money in the conquered provinces. The taxes were increased, and the Trunders, who had hitherto been well disposed towards the Swedes, were now eager to aid in any undertaking which promised freedom from the foreign yoke. King Charles issued a manifesto to the Norwegian people, asking them to separate from Denmark and join Sweden 
but such a thought did not exist in Norway at that moment. A new national feeling had been awakened. The people would now fight for freedom from Swedish oppression, and Jürgen Bjelke, who had been placed at the head of the Norwegian army, undertook to recover Trondelagen. As soon as the war broke out, King Frederick III sent word to Norway to Stadtholder Nils Trolla, and to Jürgen Bjelke, that they should resist to the utmost. Communications with Denmark were soon destroyed, however, and Bjelke became the leader of the military operations. His father, the old chancellor, Jens Bjelke, encouraged the people of Trøndelagen through private letters to break away from Sweden, in which they also succeeded, says an old writer. A formal manifesto signed by the stadtholder, the chancellor, and Jürgen Bjelke, addressed to the estates of the lost provinces, asking them to renew their allegiance to the old government, was also published. Bjelke would lead the campaign in southern Norway and dispatched George von Reichwein to Trondelagen. Reichwein's forces increased as he advanced until they numbered about 2,000 men, and another force from Bergen under Reinhold von Hoven was dispatched to Trondheim by sea to cooperate with Reichwein. Nordland also sent a detachment. The new Swedish governor, Klaus Stjernskold, felt alarmed. Everywhere the people rose against the Swedes, and the detachments which he sent out to reconnoiter met the advancing Norwegian troops and were forced to fall back on Trondheim. King Charles, who had not failed to understand the gravity of the situation in Trondelagen, speedily sent a force of 500 men to reinforce Stjernskold. The Swedish governor might have been able to successfully defend it, as he would then have had a garrison of about 1,200 men. But Eilerik Wiesborg, who had been sent to Verdalen with a part of the forces from Bergen, met and defeated the Swedish reinforcements, and the Norwegian forces, numbering about 4,000 men, laid siege to Trondheim. The garrison of the city numbered about 750 men, but as many of these were Norwegians, desertions occurred almost daily. The supply of provisions and war material in the city was small, and after a siege lasting from October 3rd till December 11th, Stjernskuld capitulated, and Trondheim's Len again became Norwegian territory. Jürgen Bjelke was personally leading the defense of the southern districts, where he had raised an army of about 4,000 men. September 13, 1658, the Swedish general, Harald Stakke, crossed the Swedish border with a force of about 1,500 men and marched upon Halden, Frederikshald, which was defended by 900 men, of whom the greater part were volunteers. This force, led by Peter Nordmond and Matthias Björn, took up a position in the hills east of the town, where they resolutely attacked the Swedes when they arrived. After a battle lasting from 8 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the Swedish general was forced to retreat, and he led his army back to Sweden. A second attack was commenced in February, this time by an army of 4,000 men, also commanded by Staka. The town was defended by a force of 1,800 men under Jürgen Bjelke and Tuna Huitfeldt, who defeated the Swedish general and forced him to retreat to Bohuslän. After the attack had been repulsed, Huitfeldt began to construct more efficient fortifications around Halden, and Bjelke advanced into Bohuslän in the fall of 1659 and attempted to wrest that province from the Swedes. But a Swedish army of 4,500 men under Marshal Kog was advancing to renew the attack on the small Norwegian fortress, and Bjelke had to return. He increased the garrison of the place to 2,100 men, and placed Huitfeldt in command. In January 1660, the Swedes attempted to take the fortress by storm, but the attack was successfully repulsed. In the meantime, Bjelke had raised an army of 3,800 men, with which he had hoped to reinforce the garrison of Halden. The army was attacked by Kog at Hundebunden, and a stubborn battle was fought, in which the Norwegians were victorious. A second assault on the fortress on February 13th was likewise repulsed, and a third attack on the 20th was also unsuccessful. On February 22nd, the siege was raised, and Kong led his forces back to Sweden, where he received the news that the warrior king, Charles X Gustavus, had died in Gothenburg February 13th, 1660. The defense of Halden and the capture of Trondheim were events of the utmost importance in Norway, even from a military point of view, they were great achievements which awakened the people's self-confidence and national pride. Hitherto, the Danes had looked upon Norway as wholly incompetent in military affairs, 
but the late events had awakened such admiration of the bravery of the Norwegians that when Frederick the Fourth visited Norway about forty years later, he caused a coin to be struck bearing the superscription, Courage, loyalty, bravery, and all that gives honor, the whole world among the rocks of Norway can learn. This was undoubtedly done by the king to flatter the Norwegians, but they had shown in these wars with Sweden that they could defend their country, and that they could bring victory home from the fields of battle, even in struggles with experienced generals and the best troops of Europe. The disasters which had befallen Norway in the wars between Sweden and Denmark, and the struggles through which the people had to pass to throw off the Swedish yoke, and to defend their country, were instrumental in finally rousing them from their national lethargy. They had now regained the most important part of the lost territory, and had become animated with a new self-consciousness. The Norwegian borders had been permanently fixed, and a national aspiration, born of the people's firm resolve to lead their own free existence, had become deeply rooted in all hearts. An efficient army had been developed, and able and patriotic leaders had appeared. These distinct gains were doubly important since they would constitute the basis for a new national development. The war was still continued, but the end was nevertheless in sight. Copenhagen resisted bravely, and when the Swedes attempted to take the city by storm, they were repulsed with heavy losses. As England and France, as well as Holland, were interested in preserving Denmark's independence, Sweden's plan of subduing the whole kingdom was becoming ever more hopeless. Holland's great admiral, Mikael de Reuter, was dispatched to Danish waters with a large fleet, and when the Swedish army in Fian was defeated and captured, the three western powers, Holland, France, and England, finally came to an understanding as to the terms of peace to be offered the belligerents. Norway should retain Trondhjem's land with Romsdal, Sweden should keep Skana, Holland, and Blekinge, together with Bohuslän, and Bornholm, where the Swedes had been driven out, should be returned to Denmark. These terms were at length agreed to, and the Treaty of Peace was signed at Copenhagen, May 26, 1660. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hereditary Kingship, the Introduction of Absolutism The peace of Copenhagen was hailed with joy, but the people both in Denmark and Norway had been brought to the brink of ruin, and suffering was intense in both kingdoms. An assembly of estates met in Copenhagen, September 10, 1660, to consider the difficult problems confronting the Danish people. The aristocracy still insisted on retaining the privilege of freedom from taxation, though the feeling against them had become very bitter, but the clergy and the third estate united and demanded equal privileges. When the nobles were finally forced to yield, the opposition had become strong enough to control the situation. Under the leadership of Mayor Hans Nansen of Copenhagen and Hans Fana, Bishop of Seeland, they resolved to overthrow the rule of the aristocracy by means of a coup d'etat. The city gates were closed, the harbor was blockaded, and the garrison was held in readiness. If the nobles should refuse to submit, force would be used. Their resistance was soon broken, and on October 13th they signed a declaration that they would join the other estates in acknowledging the hereditary principle. The charter was returned to the king as a token that the restrictions on his royal power therein expressed were annulled, and on October 18, 1660, Frederick III was formally hailed as hereditary king of Denmark. The right to the throne was vested in his family, both in the male and female line. Under the date of January 10, 1661, a document was drawn up entitled Instrument eller Pragmatisk Sanktion om Kongens Avret til Denmark's August Riga which made the king not only heir to the throne, but granted him all royal prerogatives and social privileges as absolute hereditary king. This document was circulated in the kingdom to be signed by nobles, bishops, chapters, priests, and cities, in order that formal sanction might be given to the introduction of absolutism in Denmark. In accordance with the power which had been granted him by the assembled estates, the king undertook to prepare the new constitution, the Kongelov, Lex Regia, which should outline in detail the various powers which he was to exercise. This document bears the date of November 14, 1665. 
The author of the law was Peter Schumacher, Griffenfeld. The document, which was long kept secret, was finally published and remained the constitution of Denmark and Norway till 1814. According to this document, the king had the right to change, make, and annul laws, to appoint all higher officials, to disregard all established customs, to declare war and make peace, to levy taxes and coin money. He is declared to be subject to God alone, and to be above all laws except the fundamental laws of the realm. The second article states, The king has the highest and most unlimited power, for he is the supreme head here on earth, elevated above all human laws, and he recognizes no other judge, either in secular or spiritual matters, than God Almighty. The seventeenth article states further that he can take no oath or make any declaration of any kind whatsoever, either orally or written, as he, being a free and unrestrained absolute monarch, cannot be bound by his subjects through any oath or obligation. The emperor of ancient China could possess no more unlimited autocratic power. In introducing absolutism and the principle of hereditary kingship in Denmark, nothing had been said about Norway but the king claimed that he was already heir to the throne of that kingdom. The Norwegian estates were summoned to meet in Christiania in order to hail him as hereditary king, May 27, 1661, but as he could not be present, he sent the crown prince, Christian, together with Hannibal Sehested, and five commissioners to act as his representatives. A draft of a new fundamental law for the kingdom of Norway introducing absolutism was submitted, and the estates signed the same, August 7, 1661. This was a counterpart to the Danish Act, and granted the king the same absolute power as he had received in Denmark. The Norwegians had reason to be satisfied with the change. Hereditary kingship had been established, and Norway was freed from the rule of the Danish nobility, which had treated the kingdom as a province to be administered by the Danish council for their benefit. Norway now had the same constitution as Denmark, and was henceforth regarded as equal in rank with the sister kingdom, as the basis for Danish supremacy, the usurped power of the Danish council to choose a king for both realms, had been removed. The two realms were usually called the twin kingdoms, and the citizens of one realm might hold any office in the other. Under the rule of an absolute monarch, the Norwegians could hope that their affairs would be more fairly and impartially dealt with than under the old regime. This they found was also done to some extent, and it would possibly have been done to a much higher degree if the absolute kings of the House of Oldenburg had been gifted men and able rulers. But their incompetence and lack of ability often rendered them unable to exercise a power in any manner answering to the fullness of their authority. Professor Sars says of them, The most gifted of them did not rise above mediocrity. Those among them who devoted themselves most diligently to administrative duties became absorbed in official routine and trifles, and never developed to become what may be termed independent and capable rulers, howsoever low a standard we may establish. A couple of them were wholly unfit to govern, and their rule was purely a nominal one. Among those who formed the immediate surroundings of these kings, their favorites, chancellors, and ministers in a more special sense, only two attempted to assume in the name of the king the power which according to the constitution belonged to him, namely Griffenfeld and Struency and both were overthrown after a short rule. The place which through the constitution was given the king remained in many ways vacant throughout the period here mentioned. Contrary to what might have been expected, judging from the principles expressed in the new constitution, Kongeloven, the government became of a very staid and impersonal character. According to the letter of the constitution, the government should have been distinctly monarchical, but in reality it became distinctly bureaucratic. Its center was not formed by the kings personally, nor by their council, Geheimerad, privy council, or their ministers in a more limited sense, but by the colleges placed at the head of the administrative departments. The Danish-Norwegian government in the period 1660 to 1814 was with the exception of a few interruptions essentially a government by the colleges with all the faults and advantages which usually characterize such a rule. Shortly after the hereditary kingship had been established, King Frederick III created five administrative colleges, or committees, by the ordinance of November 4, 1660, among which the various administrative duties were divided. The Geheime Council, Privy Council, was also created, consisting of the five presidents of the administrative colleges. 
The council convened daily in the presence of the king, and exercised quite naturally a great influence upon his decisions. In his cabinet, the king kept protocols and private secretaries for receiving petitions and communications. These matters would either be passed upon by the king personally, or he would turn them over to the administrative colleges. A new judicial tribunal, the Hurjestret, was also created. This was a court of final jurisdiction for Norway, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland, as well as for Denmark. It represents a very marked improvement over the old method, according to which the councils of magnates acted as a higher court. But it was an essential drawback that the new court was a purely Danish institution, which always convened in Denmark, where Norwegian cases could not be properly investigated. But the king, who exercised as absolute power in judicial matters as in other affairs, was superior even to this court, and could act as supreme judge. The office of Stadtholder of Norway was retained with about the same powers and duties as before. The Stadtholder was to exercise supervision over all subordinate officials, and he should so encourage the economic development of the country that the royal revenues might increase. He had to watch the relations with Sweden, keep army, fortresses, and magazines supplied with the necessary stores and equipments, and guard against the violation of treaties with foreign nations touching Norway's commerce. But he retained no power over the revenues of the kingdom, as in the days of Hannibal Sehestad. As a result of the introduction of absolutism, the nobles lost their exclusive right to the lens, and these might now be granted to anyone whom the king might see fit to appoint. In 1662, Frederick III abolished the name Len, which still reminded him of the time when the king's power was limited, and substituted the German name Amt. As the name indicates, the Amts became mere administrative districts, and over these he placed officers called Amtmend, who were not always of noble family. They received a fixed salary, and had to render strict account of income and expenditures. Under Frederick's son and successor, Christian V, Norway was divided into four Stiftsamter, Akershus, Christiansand, Bergenhus, and Trondheim, each of which consisted of one principal amt and two of subordinate rank, except in the case of Bergenhus, which had three subordinate amts. The power of the amtmend was much more limited than that of the lensherr, who had exercised both civil and military authority within their len. The amtmend were only civil officials, and their power was much curtailed, as they could not appoint subordinate officials, such as fogids, mayors, and councilmen, who were all appointed by the king. Their office was nevertheless one of great dignity and power, as they were the king's deputies and personal representatives in the local administration. The enforcement of the laws, the management of public property, and the supervision of the work of subordinate officials were some of the more important executive duties delegated to them but they should also act as the guardians of the common people in protecting them from oppression and injustice. They were to be watchful in preventing fogids from collecting excessive taxes and merchants from cheating the bunder, and they were given special instruction to see to it that the renters were not unjustly treated by their landlords. The Stiftsamtsmend were superior to the others in rank, and acted as superintendents over the Amtmend, fogids, and Skrivere, judges, within their Stiftsamt. The office of Stiftsamtmand of Akershus was connected with that of Stadtholder of Norway, that of Stiftsamtmand of Kristensand with the office of vice Stadtholder, created in 1669, and in Trondheim and Bergenhus the Stiftsamtmand were respectively Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor of the kingdom. The management of the finances was left to new fiscal officials called Kammerere, later Stiftskrivere, who acted as local treasurers and had to render account to the royal treasury in Copenhagen. But the collection of the taxes was left to the fogids as before. In conformity with the principles of absolutism, all officials of whatever rank, even the mayors and councilmen in the cities, now became royal officials, deriving their authority as well as their office from the king himself, who was the source and fountain of all official power. Their local communities lost their autonomy. The parishes could no longer call their own ministers, and the University of Copenhagen could not appoint its professors. Every change, in fact every public act, would henceforth depend on the royal will. Gradually, the central government left more freedom and power to the local authorities, especially in the cities, where this became quite necessary, but the fundamental idea that the king was the source of all power and authority, that the will of the people no longer existed as a factor in administration and government, could not be altered. 
The transfer of political power from the aristocracy to the king and his officials resulted also in a new alignment of social classes, as the officials, especially in Norway, appeared as a new upper class, a bureaucracy. This class was partly recruited from the aristocratic families, who possessed learning and culture and still wielded a great social influence. But as rank and birth were no longer necessary qualifications, many wealthy and influential men, especially from the cities, were appointed to various higher offices. As the power and influence of this new class depended on their office, and not upon their rank, the development of a new aristocracy was arrested, and the aristocratic families existing in Norway at that time were too few to exercise any real power. The royal officials were haughty and arbitrary enough in their dealings with the common people, but their origin as well as their interests bound them to the common classes, and in the future political struggles for national independence and political freedom, they became the leaders of the people, and showed a devotion to their cause which could not have been expected of an aristocracy. A very important administrative reform in Norway introduced by Frederick III was the taking of a census, and the registration and valuation of all taxable property, which should constitute a new basis for the levying of taxes. Hitherto the various taxes, land tax, lading, foring, tithes, etc., were levied upon each gård, farm, without reference to its value, and a very unjust distribution of public burdens resulted. Some property was taxed too low, and some too high, so that it had to be abandoned. The king appointed a commission of fifty members who were instructed to list every farm, its value, its occupants, and all notable advantages, and on the basis of this census new tax tables were to be prepared. In 1669 the work was finally completed, and it was decided that the taxes should be based on the valuation of the property found in the new tax lists. The work had been very imperfectly done, however, owing largely to the unwillingness of the people to give the necessary information, as they feared that their taxes would be increased. The total income from all sources of revenue in the Kingdom of Norway at this time has been estimated to be about 650,000 riksdaler, $650,000. Of this amount, about 200,000 riksdaler were used in Norway for the maintenance of the Norwegian army and the payment of officials. The balance, 450,000 riksdaler, was sent to Copenhagen to be used for the support of the joint court and navy. Hannibal Sehested's successors in Norway, Nils Trolla and Ivar Kraba, were men of mediocre talents who showed no trace of originality or special administrative ability. In 1664, King Frederick's illegitimate son, Ulrich Frederick Yildenlova, was appointed stadtholder. He was a young man, accustomed to the splendor and exciting social life of the higher circles of the Danish capital and people feared that he would be wholly unfit to shoulder the irksome burdens of this high office. But Yildenlova, who possessed talents as well as will and energy, became a worthy successor of Hannibal Sehested. He studied conditions in Norway very closely, and became the ardent advocate of many important reforms. Some of these had, indeed, already been suggested by Sehested, but through Yildenlova's efforts the government was finally persuaded to take action. He advocated the simplification of the system of taxation, and the valuation and registration of taxable property. He urged the creation of a Norwegian fleet of smaller war vessels for coast defense, the improvement of Norwegian fortresses, the creation of a Norwegian superior court, from which an appeal could be made to the king alone, and finally the revision of the Code of Christian IV. After encountering much indifference and opposition, he finally succeeded in persuading Frederick III to decide in favor of some of these reforms. By royal edicts it was decreed that Norway should have a separate superior court, Overhofreten, from which, however, an appeal could be made to the Høyesteret in Copenhagen. It was also decided to revise the Code of Christian IV, a work which was done under Frederick's successor, Christian V. Yildenlova became very popular, as he knew how to win the people's favor by straightforward manners and cheerful goodwill. Karl Dijkman has described his popularity as follows. The Norwegians regarded Gildenlova as their patron saint, and they had a peculiar veneration for this lord, because of his excellent conduct, democratic spirit, brave leadership, and gay life. He extended his protection to all, especially to the common people, whom he defended against seizures and unjust depositions. He could persuade the nation to do whatever he pleased. He listened to the people's complaints, and seldom did he leave them unconsoled. 
The bunder in the mountain districts always addressed him, Thou Gildenlebe. Many stories are told that he often traveled about in disguise in order to learn if the people's love for him was to be relied upon. Molesworth says of him, He is about fifty-six years of age, has been one of the handsomest, and continues one of the finest gentlemen that Denmark has produced. The Faroe Islands retained their old judicial system of six Sissel things and the Log thing as a superior court, but appeal could be made from the Log thing to the Hurjestre in Copenhagen. Frederick III granted these islands as a fief to his favorite Gable and his son Frederick. These lords and their fogods oppressed the people sorely, and though the king would seek to redress the wrongs when the complaints grew loud, no marked improvement was made in the people's conditions till after the death of Frederick Gable. Also in Iceland the old system of sissel things and log things was suffered to remain, but here, as in Norway and the Faroe Islands, the Hyestere in Copenhagen became the highest court of appeal, while the administrative colleges and governmental departments in Denmark gradually assumed the functions of government for the island. In 1683 a Landfogel was appointed to receive the taxes and revenues, after these had been collected by the Sisselmand. The following year a Stiftsamtsmand was appointed, and two years later an Amtmand was added to the list of crown officials, an indication that the administration was being directed from Copenhagen. But as the Stiftsamtsmand never visited the island, the royal government must have been limited principally to the collection of taxes and revenues, while the domestic affairs must have been largely left to the local authorities. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Foreign Relations Of the powers which had aided Denmark-Norway in the war with Sweden, only Holland maintained the alliance until peace was concluded. But the relations had grown less friendly as the war proceeded, and Denmark began to look around for other allies. In 1663 a treaty was formed with France, and Denmark joined the Rhenish alliance which had been formed between France, Sweden, and some of the German states for the defense of the peace of Westphalia. This step was taken by Frederick III in the hope of being able to force France and Sweden apart. In this he failed, but France promised to pay Denmark a subsidy in case it was again attacked by Sweden. In 1665, the great naval war for commercial supremacy which Holland and England had waged with such fury in 1652 to 1654, was formally renewed, after hostilities had already lasted about a year. England was jealous of Holland's commercial superiority and extensive carrying trade, which she had sought to harm by navigation acts. Sweden concluded a defensive alliance with England, and the English king, Charles II, sought to form an alliance with Denmark-Norway against Holland, but Frederick III hesitated. Different opinions prevailed among his counselors, and no definite step was taken, though he secretly favored England throughout the war. This favor he even displayed in a manner which throws a dark stain upon his character. As a result of their naval victories, the English became masters of the North Sea, and in the summer of 1665 a large fleet of Holland merchantmen sought refuge in the neutral harbor of Bergen. Sir Gilbert Talbot, the English ambassador in Denmark, suggested to Frederick III that he should cooperate with an English squadron in capturing this merchant fleet, and the booty should be divided between the two kings. Frederick should publicly protest his innocence, and Charles II should reprimand his admirals for violating the neutrality of Denmark-Norway. King Frederick consented to this plot, and ordered his general Olifeld at Bergen to seemingly protest, but to do nothing to hinder the English from attacking the Hollanders. But Olifeld received the orders too late. He aided the Hollanders and trained the cannons of the forts upon the English squadron, which was defeated after a sanguinary battle. The plan had miscarried, and Denmark's peace was greatly endangered. But Frederick's vacillating foreign policy again changed. In 1666 he formed an alliance with Holland, but the hostilities which broke out with England in consequence of it were terminated by the Peace of Breda, 1667. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Kinu Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Norwegian Emigration to Holland, England, Russia, and America in the 17th Century and Later The great development of commerce and naval activity in Holland and England had created a great demand for seamen. As recruiting was not yet prohibited, sailors were enlisted in large numbers in Norway, especially for the fleets of Holland. So great was the number of young men who left their homes in the seacoast districts that it amounted to a veritable emigration. And though some returned, by far the greater number settled permanently in Holland or lost their lives fighting for her great naval wars. Robert Molesworth says, The best seamen belonging to the King of Denmark are the Norwegians, but most of them are in the service of the Dutch, and have their families established in Holland from whence it is scarce likely they will ever return home, unless the Dutch use them worse, or the Danes better than hitherto they have done, for the Danish sea provision is generally very bad. In 1670, Marcus Gure, the Danish-Norwegian minister to The Hague, wrote to his government that a great number of the king's subjects lived in Holland, and that most of them were Norwegians. He added that they were sailors and officers of lower rank, as the Hollanders were too jealous to make them lieutenants or captains but Admiral Niels Ewell, who had been in the Dutch service for many years, stated a few years later that the officers who were good for anything were mostly Norwegians and Englishmen who had come to Holland to enlist. Even church history shows that many Norwegians and Danes settled in Holland. In 1634, King Christian IV gave 300 Riksdaler to a Lutheran church in Amsterdam, and in 1663 a Danish-Norwegian congregation was organized there, whose first clergyman, Christian Pedersen Abel, published a hymn book for his congregation. Many Norwegians fled to Holland, either to escape punishment for crimes and misdemeanors, or because of religious intolerance at home, in time of war also to avoid military service. But the greater number had emigrated with their families because of the higher pay and better opportunities offered in the service of the Dutch. With the growth of Norwegian lumber export to Holland, the communications with that country became very active, and young men of the seacoast districts found new opportunities for adventure and profitable employment as Dutch seamen. Even in the early part of the 17th century, many Norwegian sailors had gone to Holland, and in the war with England in the time of Cromwell, 1652 to 1654, the Dutch had enlisted such a number of Norwegian seamen that England's jealousy was aroused. In the war of 1658 to 1660, the Hollanders aided Denmark-Norway against Sweden, and sought to persuade Frederick III to cede to them Trondheim's Len. But the English protested, because they saw the advantage which Holland would thus be gaining. In an official English document, the following comment is made upon this attempt. If ye English should suffer ye Hollanders to become masters of Trondheim, there would thereby accrue to ye Hollanders an incredible strength at sea, seeing that province alone by ye occasion of ye great fishing that is upon that coast is able to set forth in short time some thousands of seamen whereof ye english have the proof in ye war between ye hollanders and them at which time they had only ye king of denmark's leave to levy seamen there and then we may easily guess what is to be expected if ye hollanders should come to be holy masters there also in the Dutch merchant marine a large number of Norwegian sailors had found employment, and took part in the voyages to the Cape Colony, East India, Greenland, and other distant countries. The same relations between Norway and Holland continued to exist also in the 18th century. The emigration to Holland continued, but the Dutch nevertheless deplored that a smaller number of Norwegian and German sailors flocked to their country than formerly and recruiting officers were sent to Norway in spite of the drastic measures taken by the Danish government to stop the traffic. The emigration to Holland was greatly deplored by Norwegian and Danish writers, as well as by the government authorities. Gerhard Schoening, 1758, considered this emigration one of the chief hindrances to the development of Norwegian agriculture, and regarded it as a calamity even worse than the Black Death. As to the number of emigrants who yearly left Norway, but few and incomplete statistical data exist, but we get a general idea from the statements of contemporary writers. Eric Pontepeden, 1698-1764, states that when the merchant fleets returned from the East Indies, the West Indies, Greenland, and other countries, the Norwegian, Danish, and Holstein sailors assembled in Amsterdam numbered 8,000 or 9,000 by a conservative estimate. 
Some of these visit their homes about every three years, and finally in their old age remain at home to live on their earnings, but a great number remain abroad all their lives, not to speak of those who lose their lives in the service. L. F. Römer, who was born in Holland, says, We have aided the Dutch in that many thousand Norwegian, Danish, and Holstein seamen and officers yearly have left their homes to earn something abroad, since we have nothing for them to do. Such yearly losses of the ablest youth of the country would naturally be felt as a calamity, especially in the districts along the sea coast, which were most directly affected by the emigration. The government bewailed the decrease in the quota of army recruits, a truly alarming thing for the Danish kings, who esteemed soldiers their only true riches, as Molesworth puts it. But the losses, real or apparent, caused by the emigration were probably more compensated for in other ways. What the Norwegians needed at this time was stimulus strong enough to stir them to mental and physical action. Experiences of a kind which could invigorate the phlegmatic and bloodless national organism. Such a stimulus was given by the life of adventure and enterprise in the Dutch maritime service. Many private accounts show that it was a hard service. Often the Norwegian sailors in the cities of Holland were kidnapped and brought by force aboard the ships, which were to sail around Africa to India, across the Atlantic to the West Indies, or distant Greenland. The life on board was hard, and the punishments inflicted for offenses were barbarous. Often they were in danger of attack by pirates, or of falling into the hands of Moorish corsairs, who would carry them into slavery. But this hard school again showed the Norwegians the path to greatness, the sea. Once again, as of old, they became skillful and daring navigators, inured to the hardships of the sea and fascinated with its freedom and adventures. New ideas, capable seamen, a spirit of enterprise, knowledge of the world and its commerce, and a desire to go abroad were the returns which Norway received for her losses. The old spirit was rekindled, and the Norwegian merchant marine was created, largely through this new impulse. Ludwig Dahl says, Historical research regarding the great, yea, even remarkable development of our merchant marine will undoubtedly prove that it is due directly to the relations with Holland, which I have here tried to elucidate. Holland's sea power was declining, and in the war with England, 1780, and finally in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic period, it was crushed. But Denmark-Norway rose to new significance as a maritime and naval power. As neutrals at the time of the American Revolutionary War, they developed a great carrying trade, and in course of the next century, Norway developed a merchant marine of which Johan Deering says that it is of greater relative importance to the Norwegian people, even when we consider its size, than that of any other country on the globe. In view of modern development, we are able to see the question of the emigration to Holland in a new light, and to put the proper construction on the pessimistic views of the old writers. The emigration from Norway was not wholly limited to Holland. Many also went to England, especially because of the flourishing lumber trade with that country. Ludwig Dahe cites the following interesting passage from a book of travel written by Judge Christian Grom of Christiania, who visited England and France in 1757. While he was staying at Dover, says the judge, a strange incident occurred. A Dutch ship was brought to that city by a British privateer. The Dutch Republic was indeed neutral in that war, but the Dutch refused to be searched by the Englishmen, and a combat followed in which hard blows were dealt on both sides, until the English privateer was finally victorious. The remarkable thing in connection with this occurrence, he continues, was that the captain of the English privateer, as well as of the Dutch ship, were both native-born Norwegians, who under foreign flags had given each other a thorough drubbing. The captain of the Dutch ship was a somewhat old man from the west coast of Norway, who had established himself in Amsterdam thirty years before. The captain of the English privateer was a young man from Christiania. This incident illustrates the situation in a striking way. The Norwegians who had begun to seek remunerative employment abroad were also found in the English service in considerable numbers, and in these wars with Holland they often fought against their own countrymen. The lumber trade also brought many Norwegian merchants to England, and the sons of rich burghers came to London to study commerce and to form friendships, which might be of value in the carrying on of trade. A Norwegian-Danish congregation was organized, and in 1694-1696 a Norwegian Lutheran church was built in the English capital, 
which was described as beautiful by a traveler at the time of the Seven Years' War. Early in the 18th century, a Norwegian-Danish club was organized in London, and towards the close of the century, De Nordiske Selskab, a truly Scandinavian society with members from all three northern countries, was founded. The war between England and France during the reign of Napoleon put a sudden stop to the Norwegian emigration to Holland and England. In 1806, Holland was made a feudatory kingdom by the French emperor, with Louis Bonaparte as king, and Holland's military forces had to join the French armies. Through Napoleon's continental system, Holland's commerce was destroyed, and when Louis Bonaparte abdicated in 1810, the Kingdom of Holland was incorporated in the French Empire, and the Norwegian sailors in Holland were forced into the French service. The Danish diplomat J. G. Reist writes that the transportation of seamen from Holland took its beginning in the winter of 1809 to 1810, and that at Hamburg he turned about 2,000 seamen over to the French authorities. It pained me, he writes, to see these healthy men, of whom the greater part were Norwegians, carried as prisoners to the unhealthy Vlissingen. A mutiny broke out among the men because of the bad treatment accorded them, and several officers who were implicated were sent home as prisoners, among others Hans Holsten. In the beginning of 1811, the crews for two warships were again sent, and these seamen remained in the French fleet till 1815. England's attack on Denmark-Norway led to a war which terminated all intercourse with Great Britain. When peace was established after the downfall of Napoleon, the old relations were not re-established either with England or Holland with regard to emigration. New conditions had been created, and the remarkable development of the United States of America soon offered far better opportunities to the Norwegian emigrants. Of the Norwegians staying in Holland, not a few went to the Dutch colonies in America during the 17th century. Mr. Torsten Jarr of Washington, D.C., who has made special investigations to the Norwegian emigration to the Dutch New Netherland, shows that the great patroon Van Rensselaer received a large tract of land near the present city of Albany, in the state of New York, on the condition that he should bring over fifty colonists within four years. In 1630 he sent nine colonists, of whom three were Norwegians. In 1631 he again made a contract with nine men to go to New Netherland. Four of these were Norwegians, but only two finally went to America. In 1636, Van Rensselaer made a contract with Albert Andresen of Fredrikshald in Norway, who sailed from Amsterdam September 25th with the ship Rensselaerwick, and 38 colonists, of whom many were Norwegians. Among these colonists were six women, one of whom was Captain Andresen's wife, Annetje, who on the voyage gave birth to a child, which was baptized in England, and received the very suggestive name of Sturm van den See. The colonists arrived safely at Manhattan, March 4, 1637, and many of Albert Andresen's descendants still live in and about the city of Albany. Among the pioneers in Schenectady, New York, were also many Norwegians. Jarr says, In all the Dutch settlements in New Netherland one can find more or less distinct traces of the Norwegians. Those about whom we have any knowledge were capable and honest people, who have done their share and deserve their part of the honor for the colonization of the new land and they fostered strong and energetic descendants to continue the work of increasing the homesteads of their fathers. Among the more prominent Norwegian settlers in New Netherland, the same author mentions especially Anneke Jans, Janssen, and her husband, Roloff Janssen, who came over in the ship Eindracht in 1630. Roloff became overseer of Van Rensselaer's farm, de Letzberg, in 1632, and in 1636 he received deed to a 62-acre tract of land now included between Warren and Canal Streets, Broadway and the Hudson River in the city of New York. He built a house and began to clear and cultivate his farm, but he soon died, and his widow Annecke married Reverend Eberhard Bogerhus, the first regular clergyman in the colony. Her mother, Trina Jonas, came to the colony in 1633 as practicing midwife in the employ of the Dutch East India Company. She received deed to a parcel of land near the foot of the present Pearl Street, where she built a house. Trina Jonas had also another daughter, Maritia, who also came to New Netherland with her husband, Tim and Janssen. These people became wealthy and influential, and Yar observes that the New York families De Lancey, De Paster, Gouverneur, Ye, Knickerbocker, Morris, Schuyler, Stuyvesant, 
Van Cortland and Van Rensselaer, became related to them through marriage, and that nearly all the old families in New York State, who pride themselves on being the genuine Knickerbockers, can trace their lineage to the Norwegian midwife Trina Jonas and her daughter Anneke Jans Bogerhus. It is noteworthy in this connection that on April 7, 1909, Mrs. Mary A. Fonda began a lawsuit against the Trinity Corporation of the City of New York for the possession of a part of the Trinity Church property, of which she claimed she was the rightful owner, because she descended directly from Anneke Jans Bogerthus. The new development of Russia in the time of Peter the Great and Catherine the Second induced many Norwegians to enter the Russian service. The most noted of these is the Norwegian naval officer, Cornelius Kreutz, formerly employed in Holland, who was engaged by the Tsar to organize and equip the Russian navy. He received the rank of vice-admiral, and played a similar role in the Russian fleet as Court Adelaire did in the navy of Denmark-Norway. He employed so many foreign naval officers that a reliable writer states in 1715, most of the Tsar's naval officers are Hollanders, Norwegians, and Danes. Kreutz was a leader of the Russian fleet in the wars with Sweden, 1705 to 1713, and served with great distinction. In the Russian army, as well as in the navy, a great number of Norwegians were employed. End of chapter 31「Chapter 32 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Close of the Reign of Frederick III, Christian V, The Gildenleve War. On February 9, 1670, King Frederick III died. His reign had been more eventful than successful. He had accomplished much in the direction of increasing his own power, which seems to have been his chief aim as it was the passionate ambition of his proud and pleasure-loving queen, Sophia Amalia. But in war and diplomacy he had been unsuccessful, and he did not attempt to use his great power to improve the condition of his poverty-stricken subjects. If any reforms were instituted, they were wholly due to the energy and forethought of others. He basked with self-satisfaction in the glory of his own autocratic power, which only hardened his heart against the much-abused common people, whose misery, especially in Denmark, only served to fill him with unsympathetic pride and arrogant disdain. During the latter part of his reign, he devoted himself to alchemy and fantastic speculation rather than to the care and development of his kingdom. He used unnecessary, harsh methods in collecting taxes from his impoverished subjects. A sordid love of gain had led him into the vile bargain with Talbot, and it was probably avarice and superstition rather than true scientific interest which made him an enthusiastic alchemist. Autocratic power had isolated him from his fellow man, and he developed symptoms of the mental eccentricity and the suspicion and fear of others peculiar to autocrats. His people ceased to love him, and though they continued to show him the most humble courtesy, his heart must have felt that it was hollow mockery, empty ceremony. He would probably have retired more and more from the world, but the queen did not allow it. She needed him to grace her luxurious carnivals, which were arranged with gaudy splendor. Enormous sums were spent in royal entertainments and other like wasteful and unprofitable ways. Some nobleman or favorite might receive a present of 200,000 riksdaler, while taxes were wrung from the peasants by selling their bedclothes, their wooden chairs, and the very coats on their backs at public auction. Molesworth says, Yet upon the occasion of the late poll tax I heard that the collectors were forced to take from this and other towns, in lieu of money, old feather beds, bedsteads, brass, pewter, wooden chairs, etc., which they took violently from the poor people who were unable to pay, leaving them destitute of all manner of necessaries for the use of living. But conditions were no better a decade or two earlier. King Frederick III and his proud queen seem to have entertained ideas of their duties as sovereigns akin to those of their younger contemporary, Louis XIV of France, that the state existed for the monarch, not the monarch for the state. The common people had ceased to be thought of except as soldiers, taxpayers, and common drudges. King Christian V was born in 1646 and was 24 years of age at his accession to the throne. In character and temperament he resembled his grandfather Christian IV, but he was less gifted and lacked his interest for intellectual pursuits. 
He was a great hunter, a fine horseman, lively and energetic, and though he was not good-looking, he made a good impression by his fine bearing. He was friendly and good-natured, well-liked, but weak in character, and easily influenced by his surroundings. In 1667, he had been persuaded to marry Charlotte Amalia of Hesse Kassel. She was very devoted to him, learned to speak Danish, and sought to win the goodwill of all. She was one of the kindliest and most popular queens which Denmark-Norway ever had, but her wedded life became an unhappy one, for even before his marriage the king seems to have become attached to a young lady, Sophia Amalia Moth, daughter of his former teacher, on whom he bestowed all his affection. Her numerous relatives, who all sought promotion through royal favor, soon came to exercise great influence at the court. His mother, the proud and imperious Sophia Amalia, also continued to wield a great influence, especially during the early part of his reign. As a prince, Christian V had visited France, England, Holland, and Germany, where he had become acquainted with absolutism in all its splendor, and it became his aim to imitate as far as possible the great model of all autocrats, Louis XIV of France. His coronation was celebrated with great splendor, and with all the devotional veneration and supplicant obeisance shown monarchs in that age of autocracy. Edward Holm says, of another form than the old one, as a sign that the royal power had been changed, and it was so rich and elegant that it was at first estimated to cost 700,000 to 800,000 riksdollar. New were also the scepter, the orb, and the sword, and their value answered to that of the crown. As the royal power was the gift of God and not of men, the king could not receive the crown and the symbols of royal authority and other regalia from human hands. He therefore placed the crown on his own head, and took the regalia before he went to church to be anointed, a ceremony which he said he regarded as an act of devotion by which he, with the all-ruling God, did more firmly and closely connect and unite himself. When a king was crowned in days past, the charter was read, and the king had to confirm it with an oath. But now the Kongelov, with its recital of the greatness of royal power, was read. The one of the bishops present who took it from its cover made a deep obeisance before it. The language used by Bishop von de Luzeland in his speech in connection with the anointing was keyed in a lofty tone which corresponded to that used in his great work about absolutism written a few years earlier. It is, he said, the king's right and dominion and the people's proper subjection that the king shall rule over the persons of his subjects, likewise that he shall rule over their goods and possessions, their fields and vineyards, their best olive yards, their grain, cattle, and asses. With such phrases of cringing flattery and disavowal of every right, the people welcomed the new custodian of their destiny and welfare. King Christian did not retain his predecessor's advisers, but chose new ones, the chief of whom were Ulrich Frederick Yildenlova, Frederick Olefeld, and Peter Schumacher, the author of the Kungelov a young man of rare nobility who soon became the real leader of the government. He was later raised to the nobility under the name of Griffenfeld, by which name he is generally known. Through his influence, the king was persuaded to organize the Order of the Danebrog, and to create two new classes of nobles, the counts, Grever, and the knights, Freeherder, the purpose being to gradually destroy the old nobility, which was hostile to the monarchs, and to create a new one wholly subservient to him. The new nobility was therefore regarded as higher in rank than the old. A number of new titles were also introduced, and the royal officials were placed above the old nobility in rank. All honor and distinction was to radiate immediately from the court, as in France. In Norway, the new court nobility never became very numerous, but Ulrich Frederick Yildenlova became Count of Larvik, and Peter Count of Griffenfeld received Lem near Tunsberg, later also the barony of Rosendal and Kvinherid. The talented and popular Gildenlöwe returned to Denmark when Christian V mounted the throne, but his eagerness to suggest various reforms again manifested itself. In 1670 he was commissioned, together with Jürgen Bjelke, to propose plans for the betterment of Norway, and the two submitted a document advocating reforms in Norway's internal administration, in its defenses, in taxes and revenues, trade and commerce. The kingdom should henceforth consist of four stifts, four principal amts, nine subordinate amts, fifty-six folgdrier, and nine chartered cities. They showed that by abolishing many unnecessary civil offices and reducing the salaries of others, 
30,000 rix dollar a year could be saved. They complained of the excessive burdens which had been placed upon the people and advocated a reduction of taxes. The importance of commerce was strongly emphasized, and the building of minor warships for defense, which could also be used as merchant vessels, was urged. It was pointed out how important it was to get foreign seamen into the kingdom, and especially to prevail on the thousands of Norwegian seamen in foreign service, chiefly in that of Holland, to return to their own country. The number of civil officials was reduced, and the taxes were lowered from 236,000 reeks dollar to 156,000 a year, but many of the more important suggestions were passed by. In 1673, Jodenlöwe again returned to Norway as stadtholder. Griffenfeld's ambition led him to snatch for ever higher power. The system of administrative departments or colleges he found too cumbersome, especially since they checked his will and limited his influence. He persuaded the good-natured king that it would be more convenient to rule with the assistance of one minister of quality than with the colleges, and in 1673 he was made count and chancellor of the kingdom. In this high office he exercised the supreme influence in administrative and diplomatic affairs, and no important matters could be decided except with his counsel. His political views, wrought into a permanent system, and carried out in diplomacy and administration, became the chief feature of the reign of Christian V. As the author of the Kongolov, Griffenfeld had already formulated the theory on which the new absolutism was based. It was left for him as chancellor and virtual head both of internal and foreign affairs to elaborate it into a fixed policy which permanently affected Denmark's future political development. According to his views, the people had no rights, either as individuals or as a nation, except what the king would graciously grant them. To the king belonged all the power. The kingdom and all its possessions were his. But how these possessions were originally acquired, by what rights they were held, the historical reasons for existing conditions, and the people's right as a nation to safeguard their own development and future destiny, were ideas for which there was no place in the system of political science formulated by this astute politician, this keen but short-sighted statesman. He worked for the interest of the king, the welfare of the nation and the realm he never clearly understood. For the future development of the Danish people, it would have been of the greatest importance to join the duchies of Schleswig-Holstein more closely to the Danish kingdom. But he did not attempt it, not because it was impossible, but because the king had some sort of title to them, and as everything was regarded as the king's personal possessions, it made no difference by what title he held them. Neither do we find that Griffenfeld, with his great talents and still greater power, attempted to institute any reforms which could serve to develop the nation socially and economically. He devoted his attention chiefly to diplomacy and foreign affairs, in which he had gained a great reputation and exercised great influence, but so far as Norway especially was concerned, the reforms instituted were chiefly due to the initiative of stadtholder Hildenlöwe. War clouds again obscured the political horizon of Europe. Louis XIV was preparing to seize the Spanish Netherlands, and no one could doubt that an attack would also be directed against Holland. The danger of French preponderance had for some time alarmed the statesmen, and a triple alliance of England, Holland, and Sweden had been formed in 1668 to resist the ambitions of the French king. But Louis the Fourteenth used his excellent diplomatic service and his treasury to destroy the alliance, an effort in which he was quite successful, as Charles the Second of England was induced by large subsidies to join France, and Sweden soon followed a similar course. In the meanwhile, William of Orange, stadtholder of Holland, the most sagacious statesman of his time, sought to form a new coalition against France. Frederick William of Brandenburg and Emperor Leopold of Germany were persuaded to form an alliance with Holland, and Christian V of Denmark-Norway was also strongly urged to join. An alliance with Holland under these circumstances would probably mean war with Sweden, the ally of France, but Christian V nevertheless favored this course, while some of his advisers, notably Griffenfeld, advocated neutrality. The war party gained the upper hand, and on June the 30th, 1674, Denmark formed an alliance with Holland, and promised to place 16,000 men in the field, if France received aid from any other power. As Brandenburg and Spain soon began war against Louis XIV, and Sweden rushed troops into Brandenburg to aid France, the die was cast, and the rival northern powers were launched upon a new struggle. 
It seems that this war ought to have been averted, especially since Denmark had not recovered from the ravages of the wars waged in the previous reign, but the hope of recovering Skåne and other possessions tempted Christian V to hazard a new armed conflict. As soon as circumstance pointed to the possibility of a new war, Gildenlöve was sent as stadtholder to Norway, 1673, to organize the military forces and strengthen the defenses of the kingdom. He made a tour of inspection through the country, and found that neither the army nor the fortresses were in so good a condition as they ought to be, but the recommendations for improvements which he substituted were opposed, especially by Griffenfeld, until the war was on the point of breaking out when some concessions had to be made. Griffenfeld seems to have feared that Yildenlova was becoming too powerful in Norway, and he sent a trusted friend, Jan Yule, to assist him, and to watch his movements. But to Gildenlöve, who needed help in his many duties, Ewell was not unwelcome. Together with the generals Russenstein and Löwenheim, the two formed a council of war, which henceforth directed all military preparations in Norway. In the summer of 1675, 1,800 men were kept at work on the fortresses of Akershus, Fredrikstad, and Fredrikshald, and the king authorized the creation of a war fund of 100,000 riksdaler to be used in case of emergency. Instructions were also given in a royal proclamation regarding Bohusland, that the people of that province should be induced by fair promises to leave Sweden and renew their allegiance to the government of Denmark-Norway. However faulty the military organization might be in minor details, Norway was much better prepared for the war at this time than in any of the previous conflicts with Sweden. The army numbered about 12,000 men, consisting of five regiments of infantry, six companies, 800 of cavalry, and an artillery division of 76 field pieces. A sixth regiment of infantry, numbering 1,000 men, had been sent to Denmark. The war between the Scandinavian countries was fought partly in Germany and partly in Skåne and along the Norwegian border. In Danish territory, it is called the war in Skåne. In Norway, it is generally known as the Yildenlöve War, because the stadtholder was commander-in-chief of the Norwegian forces. Denmark had especially been making progress as a naval power, under the able management of the great admiral Kort Sivertsen Udalair, who was placed in supreme command of the Danish-Norwegian navy by Frederick III in 1663. Adelaer was a Norwegian by birth, but like many of his countrymen he had gone to Holland, where he enlisted in the navy and became an able seaman. In time he became the owner of a ship, with which he entered the service of the Venetian Senate, and upon his return to Holland he became very prominent. Frederick III invited him to Denmark, made him chief admiral of the Danish navy, granted him a large salary, and finally raised him to the nobility. Adelaer possessed great administrative ability, and brought the fleet to a point of efficiency which soon made Denmark-Norway a great naval power. He died shortly after the war broke out, and was succeeded by Admiral Niels Ewell, the great Danish naval hero. Christian V had planned to direct his first attack against Sweden's German provinces, and war began in August 1675, when a Danish army of 16,000 men marched into Mecklenburg. Footnote. By the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, Sweden received the city of Wismar and the greater part of Pomerania, together with Rügen, and the bishoprics of Bremen and Verden, but not the city of Bremen. End footnote. The main part of this force advanced into Pomerania, while some minor detachments besieged Wismar, which was taken before the campaign closed for the year. In Bremen, a smaller Danish force had cooperated with the Allies, and a greater part of the bishopric was taken. The operations along the Norwegian border had commenced with minor skirmishes in which the combatants tested each other's strength. The Swedish general Aschaberg had taken a position at Svartoborg with 2,000 men, and a similar army of reserves was quartered in Värmland while the Norwegians concentrated 4,000 men at Frederikshald under General Rusenstein, and kept the mountain passes well guarded. No important battle was fought in this campaign. Gildenlöve sent a force of 1,000 men on galleys along the coast of Bohuslän with orders to land at Saltkelan, and cut off Aschaberg's retreat. But the Swedish general had been informed of the plan, and both Swedes and Norwegians went into winter quarters in the border districts. The success gained by the Danes in Germany was undoubtedly due in a large measure to the superiority of the Danish-Norwegian fleet, which under Kort Adelaer had gained full control of the Baltic Sea. At this time the Swedish fleet was in such a wretched condition that it could not even seriously attempt to maintain communications with Germany, 
which had become the theater of war and where its armies were in need of reinforcements, a situation which shows that Sweden was ill-prepared to expose her scattered dominions to the dangers of a new war. A young and untried king, Charles XI, had just ascended the throne, and the armies in the field had been hampered in their operations through jealous rivalry among the generals. The success gained in the first campaign strengthened the influence of the Danish war party. Duke John Adolf of Pluen was chosen commander-in-chief of the army, and a vigorous campaign for the conquest of Skana, supported by an attack on the Swedish border provinces by the Norwegian army, was planned for the following year. Griffenfeld, being an advocate of peace, not only opposed the war, but he sought still through diplomatic negotiations to maintain friendly relations with France, the ally of Sweden. Great power, flattery, and royal favor had made him very arrogant, so that he even offended the king himself and aroused the hatred of the nobles. He continued to take bribes in spite of continued warnings, and as his diplomacy and statesmanship began to take course ever more opposed to the policy of the king and his generals, who were determined to push the war with vigor, it became easy for his enemies to undermine his influence and bring about his overthrow. His most powerful opponents were General Frederick Arnstorff and the king's mistress, Sophia Amalia Moth, who was created Countess of Sanseur, and became the head of a court Camaria, which virtually controlled the king. But Griffenfeld also had numerous personal enemies, especially in the court circles, and no man in so exalted a position possibly ever had fewer real friends. On the morning of March 11, 1676, when the Chancellor arrived at the palace to lay the latest letters before the king, he was accosted by General Arnstorff, who informed him that he had been ordered by the king to arrest him. His house was placed under guard, his papers were seized, and the distinguished prisoner was locked up in the citadel. After being tried on several grave charges, among others perjury, simony, treason, extortion, and the taking of bribes, he was sentenced to be executed, and to have forfeited all his honors, titles, and possessions. He had already placed his head on the block, when he was pardoned by the king, and his sentence was changed to life imprisonment. Griffenfeld was undoubtedly innocent of many of the gravest offenses with which he was charged, and the sentence was manifestly unjust. But he had himself created the conditions which brought about his fall, and by his conduct in his high office he had made himself justly liable to severe punishment. For twenty-two years he remained imprisoned. In 1680 he was transferred from Frederickshaven to the castle of Munkholmen, near Trondheim, where he stayed till 1698, when he was liberated from prison and allowed to stay in the city because of his failing health. He died in Trondheim, March 12, 1699, and his body was brought to Denmark, where it rests in the cemetery of Varer Church in Jutland. The Swedish king, Charles XI, exerted himself to the utmost to bring Sweden's military forces, both on sea and land, to the highest state of efficiency for the next campaign. He would send a fleet to Germany with sufficient reinforcements to protect his German provinces, while an army should attack Seeland and carry the war to the very heart of the Danish kingdom. But Nils Jul, who had succeeded Court Adelaire as admiral of the Danish-Norwegian fleet, seized Gothland and concentrated his whole fleet of 26 ships near Bornholm. The Swedish fleet of 50 vessels carrying 1,100 guns advanced to attack him, but as Yule had strict orders not to engage in battle with a greatly superior force, he retreated towards the coast of Skåne, and anchored behind Falsterbo Reef, followed closely by the Swedes. Here he received reinforcements of five Danish and four Dutch ships, but had to turn over the chief command to the Hollander Cornelius Tromp. After some maneuvering, the two fleets finally joined in battle off Öland, June 1, 1676, where the Swedes suffered a serious defeat. Both flagships were destroyed, the two admirals, Kreutz and Uga, lost their lives, and many ships were captured. This defeat so crippled the Swedish fleet that the contemplated invasion of Skana could be undertaken without fear of serious opposition. Gildenova fortified the pass of Kvistrum and seized Udevala without encountering much opposition. Venersborg was also taken after a sharp engagement. An attempt to seize Gothenburg was unsuccessful, but Gildenova turned towards Bohus, where he was joined by reinforcements under Turner Huitveldt, which increased his forces to 5,000 men. In their operations in Skana, the Danes were very successful, as their countrymen in that province welcomed them as liberators. Helsingborg opened its portals to the invaders. Lanskrona was taken without great resistance, 
and Kristianstad was forced to surrender after a severe engagement. As the people of Skana also rose in arms and organized bands of guerillas, Snafenerna, who everywhere attacked the Swedes, Charles XI was obliged to withdraw from the province. Sweden had been placed in a most critical position. Its German provinces, with the exception of the strongest fortresses, were held by the armies of the Allies. Its fleet was unable to render efficient service. Gothland and Skana had been seized by the Danes, and Bohuslän was occupied by the Norwegians under Gildenlöve. The time seemed to have come when Denmark would get revenge for past defeats and losses, but Christian V, who appears to have had a jealous and irritable temper, threw away the final victory at the moment when it seemed to be within reach. Having taken offense at Duke Pleuren's haughty bearing, he lent such willing ear to his opponents that the duke resigned as commander-in-chief of the Danish armies. The king himself assumed command, but proved to be wholly incompetent, and misfortunes befell the Danish arms in rapid succession. A force which had been sent into Holland under the Scotch general Duncan was destroyed by Charles XI at Philibro. Duncan fell, and only a few hundred men escaped from the field. This victory, which gave the Swedes new hope and increased their confidence in their king, was of no slight military importance as it prevented any further cooperation between Gildenova and the Danish army in Skåne. When he heard that a large Swedish army was approaching to attack him, Gildenova raised the siege of Bohus and withdrew from Bohuslän. More disastrous still was the Battle of Lund, December 4, 1676. When Charles XI learned that the Norwegians had left Bohuslän, he advanced into Skåne and sought to surprise the Danes in their winter quarters. His movements were discovered in time, but a bloody battle ensued, in which the Danes were defeated with a loss of several thousand men, together with artillery and baggage. This victory re-established the self-confidence and reputation of the Swedes, and gave the Danes a stunning blow from which it was difficult to recover. The people of Skåne submitted to King Charles XI, and Helsingborg received a Swedish garrison. But some sinews of strength still remained to Christian V, his superior fleet, and the undefeated Norwegian army. King Charles's plan for the campaign of 1677 was to strengthen his fleet to such an extent that he could re-establish communications with his army in Pomerania under Königsmark, and by an attack on Zeeland force the Danes to withdraw from Skana. But Christian V, who aimed to regain what had been lost by the defeat at Lund, hurried reinforcements across the Sound as soon as the campaign opened in the spring. During the winter, the Norwegian army had been increased to 17,000 men. In July, Gildenlöve, with a small Norwegian force, captured the fortresses of Marstrand and advanced to join General Leuvenhem, who was marching into Bohuslän with the main Norwegian army. At Udevala, they encountered a Swedish army of 8,000 men under General de la Gardie. In the battle which ensued, the Swedish general was outmaneuvered and ordered a retreat which soon turned into a disastrous flight. A great part of his force were made prisoners of war. His artillery and nineteen standards fell into the hands of the Norwegians, who gained control over the whole of Bohuslän with the exception of Bohus Castle. This defeat also affected the campaign in Skåne, where the Swedes had continued to make progress. The siege of Kristenstad was raised, and Charles XI hastened into Holland to forestall an invasion by the Norwegian forces in Bohuslän. In August of the same year, a force of 2,000 men from Trundelagen under Reinhold von Hoven and Christian Schultz marched into Jemtland and drove out the Swedish detachments under Count Spara. But though they were well received by their countrymen, no effort was made to take permanent possession of this old Norwegian province, as General von Hoven soon withdrew his forces in obedience to an order from the king. At sea, the united forces of the two kingdoms were very successful, and won some of the greatest victories in Danish-Norwegian naval history. In the Battle of Rostock, or Muen, Admiral Nils Juel almost annihilated a Swedish squadron under Admiral Sjoblad, and on July 1st he fought the memorable naval battle of Kyuga Bay with the Swedish main fleet under Admiral Horn. The Swedes suffered an overwhelming defeat. Their admiral lost 20 ships with 700 cannons, and 3,000 men were killed or captured. After the great battle, many of the foreign captains who served under the great admiral were court-martialed for incompetence or negligence. Jan Peppe was dismissed. Jan Vogel escaped a worse fate by timely flight, and three others were sentenced to pay fines. But the Norwegians had served with great distinction, notably Mikkel Tennyson, Morten Pedersen, Hans Schönebel, Thomas Sirup, and Hans Garstensen Garda. These, and many other brave Norwegian officers, had learned their seamanship in Dutch and English service, 
and their bravery and competence to a large extent made these victories possible. The great naval wars between Holland and England had been a severe military school, in which the Norwegian sailors and sea captains had been such apt pupils that they often surpassed their teachers in bold adventure and clever seamanship. The success gained by the Norwegian army and the fleet was however neutralized by new defeats inflicted on the Danish land forces in Skåne. In a fruitless attack on Malmö, Christian V sacrificed 4,000 men, and after a crushing defeat at Landskrona, the plan of capturing Skåne had to be abandoned. In the next campaign, confidence would chiefly be placed in the Norwegian army, which was reinforced with Danish troops, and efforts would be made to occupy new Swedish territory in Germany. Already in September, 1677, Christian V seized the island of Rügen with an army of 6,000 men, but General Königsmark defeated the Danes and recaptured the island. Gildenöve entered Bohuslen and laid siege to Bohus Castle. All the outer works were carried, the stronghold would have been taken, but he was so embarrassed in his operations by orders from the Danish Council of War, and by the disloyal conduct of the generals Gisa and Degenfeld, who commanded the Danish auxiliary forces, that the opportunity was wasted, and when a large Swedish army under Otto Stenbach approached, he raised the siege and retreated to Udavala. Hostilities continued also during the next year, but no important military event occurred. The two powers still held the same territory as before the war, but the border districts of Skåne and Bohuslän had been severely harried by the plundering soldiers, both friend and foe. The hope which Christian V had entertained of humbling Sweden and recovering the lost provinces gradually but surely vanished with the breaking up of the coalition against France. The Peace of Nimwegen between Holland and Louis XIV was signed July 1, 1678, after protracted negotiations, and in January of the next year the German emperor concluded peace with France and Sweden. Only elector Frederick William of Brandenburg now supported Denmark-Norway against France and Sweden, and it was certain that Louis XIV would subscribe to no terms of peace derogatory to the interests of his ally. When Brandenburg also concluded peace with France, and a French army threatened the duchies of Schleswig-Holstein, the situation became critical. But the war spirit had finally ebbed away, and peace between Denmark and France was signed at Fontainebleau, August 23, 1679, stipulating that all territory taken from Sweden should be returned, and that the terms of the peace of Roskilde should remain in force. In September, 1679, a peace between Denmark, Norway, and Sweden was signed in Lund, reaffirming the conditions already established in the Treaty of Fontainebleau, and providing also for a defensive alliance between the northern kingdoms, which should remain in force for a period of ten years. The unfortunate war had ceased, but only after the three Scandinavian peoples had wasted the strength which they should have employed in peaceful development, or which they might have preserved for resisting more dangerous foreign foes. End of chapter 32「History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Internal and Foreign Affairs in the Reign of Christian V. In civil, as in military affairs, Christian V sought to retain all power and influence in his own hands in conformity with the principles of absolutism, but he lacked the ability to develop an efficient personal rule. He hated the old nobility, as he suspected that they would use any favorable opportunity to re-establish their former power, and after the overthrow of Griffenfeld, he was also careful lest any of his counselors should become too powerful. Among his advisers were many from the commons whom he had elevated to high positions besides the prominent men of noble birth, like Olafeld and Yildenlova, but no one enjoyed his full confidence. As he hated any restrictions upon his own personal influence, the administrative colleges were not allowed to exercise any independent activity, but in all matters the decision was to be left to the king. In military affairs he demanded an account even of the minutest details of the service. Not even the purchase of necessaries for the fleet exceeding five hundred rix dollars would be valid without royal sanction. In diplomacy and foreign affairs he was equally careful to centralize all influence in his own hands. After the fall of Griffenfeld, his instructions to his new chancellor, Frederick Olafeld, 
were that all communications with representatives of foreign courts, how insignificant soever the matter may be, should bear his own signature, and that all dispatches from abroad should be placed before him without delay. The creation of commissions which gradually absorbed the greater part of the duties of the administrative colleges was a part of the general plan to strengthen his own influence, as these commissions, which could be dissolved at any moment, would be in the highest possible degree subservient to the royal will. King Christian had a jealous dislike for those who could win popular favor and exercise great influence. He would not only wield all power, but he could not bear any one who towered above him intellectually, a weakness not uncommon in small minds. Of Griffenfeld, the special object of his hatred, he could have said as Macbeth did of Banquo. He hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. And Griffenfeld, the only statesman who possessed sagacity enough to guide the state through this stormy period, was overthrown at a moment when his experience and insight was most indispensable. Duke Pluen, the general who successfully conducted the campaign in Skana, was dismissed because the king did not like him. Christian himself would be chief general, a position for which he was as little qualified as for that of diplomat. Armies were destroyed, and opportunities wasted through lack of competent leadership, until Louis the Fourteenth could dictate the terms of peace. In matters of internal administration, his efforts to play autocrat and emulate the great French king only brings to light a lack of ability which forms a glaring contrast to his unlimited power. During a long reign of twenty-nine years, he was unable to develop a well-systematized form of administration, and we look in vain for new ideas or an effort to create better economic and social conditions. By the wars with Sweden and the extravagance of the court, public burdens had been increased to an almost unbearable degree, and as the peasants were unable to pay the taxes, the government resorted to the scheme of making the larger landowners responsible for the revenues, in return for which they were exempted from taxation. The German-born nobles, who had emigrated to Denmark in large numbers, owned a great portion of the largest estates, but they resided in Copenhagen, and their estates were managed by overseers, Riedefogeds, whose business it became to extort the taxes from the peasants. The wooden horse and other instruments of torture were invented by them, and the condition of the peasants grew even worse under the rule of the nobles. Agriculture fell into decay, and no progress was made by the cities. Rather than to seek to ease the people's burdens, and to further economic and social development, he would maintain old social conditions, and play guardian of his people in minor domestic affairs, where his meddlesome interference could do naught but harm. The king showed no interest for scientific research, but his solicitude for the religious and moral life of his people was of the most anxious kind. He ordered that the daily hours of devotion in the city churches should be better attended, and that in the country districts the people with their children and servants should spend some time in prayer both morning and evening. If people did not go to church, it was to be regarded as sacrilege, and by the ritual of 1685 the deacons were instructed to be present and observe who went to communion, and to write their names in a book kept for the purpose. Against luxury of all kinds, the king instituted a vigorous campaign, and sought to regulate in detail the people's daily life. Efforts to limit luxury had been made also in the previous century, both by the kings and the clergy. The 16th century was especially the period of luxury laws. France took the lead, and other nations followed her example. In 30 years, from 1545 till 1575, not less than eight statutes were issued against luxury in France. In Denmark, Frederick I began to legislate against luxury in 1528, and laws on this subject appeared at brief intervals, but usually to no purpose. End footnote. Regulations were issued regarding funerals, describing in what sort of coffins people of the various classes should be buried, and the ceremonies to be used for each class. To give food and drink to those who carried the coffin to the grave was forbidden, likewise also the burning of candles or excessive decorations of the house of mourning. Funeral orations could be delivered only if the deceased were persons of quality and if the funeral took place in the evening, the oration should not last over fifteen minutes. 
Still more annoying were the royal orders issued by Christian V in 1683 regarding attire, weddings, parties, etc. In a solemn introduction, the king declares that he perceives how the extravagance in attire as well as food and drink at weddings, confinements, and parties is carried to such extremes that God thereby must be highly offended, and as one will not be inferior to the other in such matters, they waste their means until they are utterly ruined. He then proceeds to lay down rules, says Holm, as to who are to be allowed to wear gold and silver embroidery, precious stones, lace, gold, and silver brocade, flowered velvet, rings above a certain price, etc. Only those belonging to the highest classes were numbered among these especially favored ones. There was one kind of attire, for example, black or plain colored velvet, which all persons of rank, as well as the nobles, might wear. Regulations were also made how promoti doctores in theologica, and promoti doctores in other faculties, should be attired. Those who had studied abroad, the principal royal officers who were not of rank, the thirty-two members of the city council of Copenhagen, etc., were regarded as equal to these. Those who belonged to this class might wear mantles of black velvet or other suitable attire of silk, grofgrun, tersonel, ferrandin, taffeta, and other plain silks manufactured in this country, and likewise also all kinds of India silks which are brought hither with the company's ships, and rings to the value of a hundred rix dollar, lynx, marten, and squirrel, and other lining of a reasonable price. All others were forbidden to wear silk, nor could they wear any rings save plain gold rings. Regulations were made as to the length of the train of ladies' dresses, according to rank, what ornaments they should wear, what kind of braid people should use on the uniforms of their lackeys, what kind of carriage they should drive in, etc. A series of regulations for weddings, banquets, and childbirth parties were made to correspond. It was stipulated how everything was to be done at engagement feasts and weddings, according to people's rank, and a fixed gradation was established regarding the decorations of the bridal bed from gold and silver fringes for privy councillors, counts, and knights, down to craftsmen and services, who are permitted to use woolen cloth which can be made in this country, but without fringes, tassels, or braids. People were in general allowed to invite twelve couples to a wedding, besides their nearest relatives, but a limit was placed on the number of meals to be served, and it was expressly forbidden to offer the guests more than eight different dishes, and no pyramids of confectionery were allowed to be placed among the victuals. Craftsmen and servants should not invite more than six couples, and they should serve a frugal meal of only four dishes. Not more than eight couples should be invited to a country wedding, and not above six ordinary dishes should be served. A general provision, which was made binding upon all, specially forbade the giving or receiving of wedding presents by any one whatsoever. But parents might give their children presents according to their means, and wedding presents might also be given to servants. But while the king sought to limit so strictly what he termed the luxury of the common people, he would not in any way curtail his own pleasures, or the excessive extravagance of the nobility. The old hunting laws were kept in force, as it was the king's chief care to preserve the game and maintain the pleasures of the chase. Whether the wild animals destroyed the people's grain fields, or the fox killed their geese and chickens, was a matter about which the royal conscience felt no compunction. But such barbaric punishments were inflicted on all poachers, i.e., anyone outside the privileged classes who ventured to kill a bird or animal, that it seemed a less offense to kill a human being than a deer or a partridge. Ordinary poaching was punished by flogging, branding, or life imprisonment. If a landowner who possessed the right to hunt killed a deer on the royal hunting grounds, the fine was 1,000 riksdaler, for a bird 200 riksdaler but if the offender was a servant, he would be punished by death, even for shooting a snipe. In order to carry numerous provisions of this kind into effect, it was necessary also to increase and extend the police service of the kingdom. In 1682, Christian V appointed the first chief of police in Copenhagen, and delegated to him such a multitude of duties that it would have required a whole army of police officers to attend to all. He was not only to maintain general order in the city, but all servants were placed under his special supervision, and it was his duty to punish disobedience, dishonesty, and carelessness on their part. The cleaning and lighting of the streets, the waterworks, and the fire department were also placed under his command. 
it was his duty to prevent strangers from staying in the city on an unlawful errand, and he should give good heed that no cheating was done with coin, weight, or measure, that the lawful prices were maintained, and that the rules for crafts and guilds were enforced. He should also watch over the Lutheran church so that no writings against religion or other forbidden books were offered for sale, and that no lampoons were published, and he was especially delegated to ensure the proper observance of the royal decrees regarding wedding parties, funerals, ranks, and wearing apparel. But his activity should not only extend to the city, but to the whole kingdom of Denmark. He should watch lest any unlawful trade was carried on in any city in the kingdom, that travelers were carried from place to place at the stipulated rates, that inns and taverns along the main routes were properly equipped, etc. In this way, a police regime was created which possessed some good features, but which in many respects would have been intolerable if it had been in any degree efficient. The kind of administration created by Christian V shows the king's own mental caliber, and illustrates in general the character of the 17th century absolutism. The government was chiefly occupied with a multitude of trifles which ought to have been entrusted to the care of local authorities, if they could not be left, as they ought to have been, to the good judgment of the private citizen. But the most private domestic affairs were to be controlled by royal decrees to an extent which made the state resemble a well-regulated home for orphans. Society was stratified into ever more sharply demarcated classes, based on rank, titles, and special privileges, and as no encouragement was given to individual enterprise, as small room was found within this system for originality and real ability, the government suffered in nearly all departments from a dull incompetence which made it unable to meet a crisis with resolute energy. Royal favor was looked upon as the source of promotion rather than talent and energetic individual effort. Titles, pensions, or even a smile or nod from the absolute sovereign was esteemed of more value than solid achievements in art or industry, a most serious impediment to true social progress. Some improvements might occasionally be made, but they were happy accidents rather than part of a systematically pursued plan of national development. Among such improvements must especially be mentioned the Code of Christian V, a new law book prepared for the Kingdom of Norway. The Code of Christian IV of 1604, which is already stated was but a wretched translation of the Code of Magnus Lagerbeter, Lonsloven, of 1276, had become so antiquated that it had become almost useless, and the plan of preparing a new code had been considered even by Hannibal Sehested and Jens Bjelke. Many changes had also resulted from the introduction of absolutism, and the need was more imperative than ever of bringing the laws into harmony with the new conditions. In Denmark, the preparation of a new code, which had been begun in 1661, was finally completed in 1683. After some abortive attempts, four Norwegians, among whom was the able and learned jurist Christian Stockfleth, were appointed to prepare a new law book for Norway. This was indeed an important concession, as the judicial affairs of the two kingdoms would thereby remain separated, and special attention would be paid to local social environment in Norway. The work submitted by this commission was naturally based on the laws of Norway, but the king, who favored strongly a uniform system of laws for both kingdoms, subjected it to revisions which brought it into close harmony with Danish jurisprudence. But the law of Odal and other laws governing the tenure of land in Norway were nevertheless retained, and in regard to hunting the Norwegian code contains few and very liberal provisions. The code was completed in 1687. The following year it was put into use in Norway and the Faroe Islands, and in part also in Iceland. In conformity with the spirit of the times, it prescribed the most cruel punishments for crime. A long list of offenses was punishable by death, while maiming, banishment, and life imprisonment were frequently inflicted for no very grave crimes. But the code contains some good features. It attempts especially to maintain the principle of equality before the law, and to ensure a degree of personal liberty quite uncommon in those times. The code was received in Norway with general goodwill, as it met a long-felt want, but much confusion was caused by the introduction of Danish laws which were not adapted to Norwegian local conditions. It must also be regarded as a distinct national loss that the old system of Norwegian jurisprudence, the codes of St. Olaf and Magnus Lagerbøtter, had been discarded, and the Norwegian code had been based on principles largely foreign to the people. During King Christian's reign, the Norwegian army and defenses were greatly strengthened. 
At the outbreak of the war in Skåne, 1675, the Norwegian army numbered 12,000 men. By 1683, it had been increased to 16,300, and in 1700, it had reached a total of 21,000 men. The joint Danish-Norwegian fleet experienced an even greater development under the efficient leadership of Kort Adelir and Niels Juel. Through purchase, as well as by the building of new ships, a relatively strong fleet was created before the outbreak of the war with Sweden, and by encouraging the Norwegian merchants to construct ships which could be converted into war vessels, a valuable auxiliary squadron of defense ships had been created, which was to be used for the protection of the Norwegian coast. In 1674, the fleet, together with the defense ships, numbered 63 vessels, of which 17 carried 50 guns, and 46 were defense ships. By 1679, the fleet had been increased to 107 vessels, of which only 17 were defense ships. In 1700, after some reduction had been made in the number of vessels, it still numbered 33 ships of the line, carrying 2,778 guns. Denmark-Norway had become one of the leading naval powers. The fortresses of the kingdom were much improved, and new forts were built under the direction of Gustav Wilhelm Wedel a German by birth who was made commander-in-chief in Norway, 1681, during the absence of Stadtholder Jildenlöwe. Fredriksten was strengthened by the building of new forts, and the Glomen River was made a strong line of defense through the construction of several fortresses and redoubts, a work which proved to be of great value in the next war with Sweden. Finger was completed in 1682, Christiansfjeld, Blakier, and Basmo were founded the following year, and the Kongsvinger and Sponviken fortifications were also erected at this time. In 1685, Christian V visited Norway, and the people welcomed him on all occasions with enthusiastic loyalty. From Christiania, he journeyed across the Dover Mountains to Trondheim, and after visiting Bergen, Stavanger, and the towns of southern Norway, he returned home. King Christian was neither broad-minded nor very gifted, but he was conscientious, and he devoted himself with great diligence to the numerous routine duties which devolved upon him as absolute ruler. He was a lover of moderation, always kind and good-natured, and by his gentle manners he won the hearts of the people to quite an unusual degree. Molesworth speaks of him as a prince of singular ability and good nature, but adds that he is often overruled by those about him, to whom he leaves the whole management of affairs, because he neither loves nor has a genius for business. He died August 25, 1699, at the age of 53. Touching his policy of internal administration in Norway, Professor Oscar Albus Jonsson says, He regarded Norway and his other possessions with a feeling akin to that with which a landed proprietor looks upon his estates and his subordinates. Everything existed for the benefit of himself and his family, and was to be administered in such a way that it yielded him and his family the greatest and most lasting profit. He sought to promote the interests of the Bunder because they were good taxpayers. He was interested in shipping, for without it there would be no able seamen to serve in the wars. From his diary it is clear that it was principally the more elementary features of administration which interested him, the defenses, taxation, and economic conditions. With regard to Norway, he pursued a policy of political amalgamation with a definite aim to obliterate as far as possible the national existence of the Norwegians, and to reduce the two kingdoms to one country. This policy comes to view especially in the Norwegian Code of Laws, which is based almost exclusively on the laws of Denmark. He wished to introduce a uniform code for both kingdoms, and the same laws were henceforth made to apply as far as possible to both kingdoms, even when they were not adapted to Norwegian local conditions. In the administration, the two countries were often treated as one estate, and the specific Norwegian interests were often ignored or neglected. Norway received no university or central administration, though an earnest desire for these very necessary improvements had long been expressed. Neither did the kingdom have a bank or a capital city, all features which would have tended to unite its scattered cities and separate communities into a more firmly consolidated state, and would have given a new impetus to the development of national patriotism. But the kings of the period of absolutism, like the kings during the Union period from the time of Queen Margaret, wanted a strong Denmark, not a strong Norway. The kingdom united with Denmark should lose its own individuality, in the hope that it would gradually become an integral part of that realm. This short-sighted statesmanship, which was of no benefit to either kingdom, 
often resulted in a wanton neglect of Norway's most vital interests, and retarded, though it could not wholly arrest, the national development of the Norwegian people. The absolute kings, like their earlier predecessors in the Union period, did not attempt to further the true development of either nation. Their interests were personal, dynastic, and wholly self-centered, which made their rule a monotonous routine, or a greedy desire for lands and revenues, usually barren of all good results. In Sweden, the late wars had caused great losses. The fleet had been destroyed, cities burned, and the German provinces, as well as the border districts of the kingdom, had been devastated by repeated raids. A great public debt had been created, and the burdens upon the common people were excessively heavy, while the nobles were still exempted from paying taxes. A change had also taken place in the government. Though the old forms were to all appearances maintained, the council had been pushed into the background, and the king had begun to act with more independence than before, partly because the stress of circumstances had made it necessary, but partly also because his growing popularity enabled him to assume more direct control of the affairs of government. In order to meet as well as possible the exigencies of the situation, the estates were assembled at Stockholm in 1680. The commons demanded that the crown lands which had been given or sold to the nobles should be confiscated and that the royal power should be strengthened. The council and the nobles had to yield, and the king became virtually absolute also in Sweden. End of chapter 33。Chapter 34 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Economic and Social Conditions in Norway in the 17th Century After the overthrow of the Hanseatic merchants, the Norwegian cities found new opportunities to develop, and they gradually assumed a character very different from the surrounding rural communities, from which they had at first been but slightly differentiated as to economic interests and mode of life. The development once begun struck a rapid pace, and soon wrought an important change in the social as well as the economic life of the nation. At the assembly of the estates in Oslo, 1591, the burghers and the bunder appeared for the first time as two distinct estates, and this division of the commons into two separate classes with diverging social tendencies and economic interests grew even more distinct until it developed into a social struggle of far-reaching importance. The cities had been regarded from the outset as a part of the district in which they were situated, and the rural communities had been the local units of government and religious life. In course of time the new urban development inverted the order, and the cities through their growing influence and power became commercial, social, and cultural centers to which the rural districts were attached as tributary territories. The burghers were rapidly rising, and the bunder were correspondingly depressed in the social scale. The growth of the cities was favored not only by an increasing commerce, but especially through privileges granted by the kings, who became their special patrons, and sought to force their development. Limited privileges had been granted the cities by various statutes from quite early times, and from 1299 the right of the rural districts to carry on trade was restricted in favor of the cities. But more radical measures were taken by Christian IV who, among other things, issued a royal decree commanding the people of the neighboring towns to move into the new cities of Christiania and Christiansand, which he had founded. Each city was to have its own fixed district, inside of which it had a trade monopoly, and all harbors within a distance of twenty-one miles should be abandoned. Christiansand was especially favored, as the kings were determined to make it a metropolis in southern Norway. The bishop's seat, the Latin school, and the Stiftsamtmand were moved from Stavanger to Christiansand by royal decree. All the smaller towns in its neighborhood except Mandal, Arendal, Österreicher, and Flekkefjord were abandoned, and Stavanger's city charter was revoked. In 1685, Christian V even decreed that all inhabitants in Mandal, Arendal, Österreicher, and Flekkefjord who did not move to Christiansand before New Year should pay a double amount of taxes. It was manifestly the plan of the government, says Holm, that the four stift cities, i.e. Christiania, Christiansand, Bergen, and Trondheim, should be the trade centers of the kingdom. Bergen occupied the same privileged position in Bergen's stift as Christiansand did in its stift. The farther to the north, the four so-called Sjölen, naval districts, 
i.e. Ramsdal, Nordmer, Fosen, and Namdalen, as well as the coast along the Trondhjemsford belonged to the trade district of Trondhjem. In the privileges granted this city, March 7, 1682, it was stipulated that the inhabitants of the thriving towns of Molde and Fosen, Christiansund, who lived as burghers, should either move to Trondhjem, or build within that city in a year a home as good as the one in which they were living. The villagers and those who dwelt by the harbors in the neighborhood were also ordered to move to the city. But although towns were not allowed except at a certain distance from the chief cities, the burghers were instructed to erect trading posts at convenient places within their district, in order to facilitate trade and to enable the people to reach a market. The government also issued regulations regarding the importation of goods and the carrying on of trade. The wares should be bought directly from the producers, or where it was most natural and convenient to obtain them. Wine should be imported from Spain and Portugal, French wines and salt from France, Rhenish wine from Holland, iron and steel from Sweden and Prussia, etc. Anyone could engage in wholesale trade who could handle the required amount of goods, but the retail trade was governed in detail by a multitude of regulations aiming at the prevention of encroachment by one kind of merchants upon the other. In most cities, the merchants were divided into classes, having exclusive right to deal in certain specified commodities. The merchants of Trondhjem agreed to organize into 14 classes. In Christiania, a similar arrangement was made, but not in Bergen. This classification and close supervision was in harmony with the activity of the absolute government in all other lines, and coincided in general with the spirit of the cities where guilds and crafts still flourished. But it did not prevent the development of a powerful class of merchant princes, who sought to gain full control of all lucrative trade. In Christiania the complaint was made as early as 1643 that there was not thirty solvent merchants who without debt could carry on their small trade and in 1653 the cry was raised that some of the rich burghers had usurped all the trade with feathers, elk skins, goat skin, butter, tallow, and caraway by purchasing these articles in the country. And the city magistrate proposed that such purchasing in the country districts should be stopped. It is natural that the more opulent merchant classes, whose influence was increasing with their wealth, would not rest satisfied until they had gained control of the more important branches of trade. In 1656 and 1661, they formulated special demands for the whole burgher class of the kingdom, and as a result, a series of privileges were granted in 1662 to all Norwegian cities, which marks a new epoch in Norwegian commercial jurisprudence. The two chief articles of export on which Norwegian commerce largely depended were the fish trade in the northern and western districts and the lumber trade in the southern and eastern districts. The lumber trade with England was rapidly increasing at this time, as Norwegian pine lumber was in great demand for shipbuilding. Even Milton alludes to it in his Paradise Lost, 1658-1665, to where he says, His spear to equal which the largest pine hewn on the Norwegian hills, to be the mast of some great admiral, were but a wand. A new stimulus was given this trade by the Great Fire in London, September 3, 1666, which destroyed 89 churches and 13,000 houses. 300 streets, about two-thirds of the city, were laid in ashes. Lumber for the rebuilding of the city was eagerly sought, and the greater part of it was imported from Norway. Bishop Jens Berkerod writes in his diary, March 7, 1667, I heard a captain, who had come from Norway, tell of the great profit which the inhabitants of Norway had of the great fire which occurred in London last fall and that their timber, which was needed for the rebuilding of the city, was constantly exported in unusual large quantities, so that the people could ask as high a price as they wished to demand. For although there should at present be war between us and England, our king nevertheless permitted such export of timber from Norway because of the good money which was brought to the country. And it had already become a proverb among the Norwegians that the Norsemen have warmed themselves well at the London fire. This communication with England, says Dae, did not cease with the rebuilding of London, but continued uninterrupted through ages, and became an important factor in the development of Norway. By the privileges of 1662, the merchants of the cities received exclusive right to carry on lumber trade, and clergymen, fogods, and judges, Soren Skriver, were forbidden to carry on trade. This tended to concentrate the lumber trade in the cities, 
and to give the merchant class greater solidity and strength. In order to gain still greater advantage, the merchants demanded that the bunders should bring the timber to the city, where they again used the opportunity to pay a very low price. In order to protect the bunder from this crying injustice, the king gave them permission to sell their timber to foreign buyers, if the merchants would not pay the full value, and receive it at the customary places of delivery. Later fixed prices were established, but with the proviso that the right to the lumber trade should remain with the cities and their inhabitants, and the attempts to regulate the trade were generally lame and unsuccessful. In the northern districts the situation was still more unfavorable to the bunder. We have already seen how the Hanseatic merchants of Bergen had gradually reduced the small native traders, the Nordfader, who brought fish from Nordland to Bergen, to a sort of commercial serfdom by keeping them continually in debt, and these conditions were not improved when the native merchants gained control. They had learned from the German merchants how to take advantage of the fishermen from Nordland, who every year brought their catch to the great central market of Bergen, where they also brought their supplies for the coming year. In Peter Doss's descriptive poem of Nordland, The Nordland's Trumpet, from about 1700, the swindle and extortion practiced by the Bergen merchants in their dealings with the fishermen of Nordland are described with great vividness, sometimes with humor, but always with characteristic sympathy for the oppressed. Occasionally the king sought to put a stop to their cheating and extortion. He even reduced the amount of indebtedness of the bunder, and sometimes even canceled their old debts, but these attempts at regulation did not alter the general relation between the burger class and the bunder. In the early part of the 17th century, until the loss of Bohuslen, Norway had ten chartered cities, Kjöbstedr, ranking as follows, according to a tax levied in 1599 to pay the bridal outfit for one of the princesses. Bergen, 250 Riksdaler, Christiania, 125, Trondheim, 100, Marstrand, 100, Frederikstad, 37 and a half, Tunsberg, 25, Stavanger, 25, Kongelv, 25, Skien, 12 and a half, Odevald or Udevala, 12 and a half. With the loss of Bohuslen in 1660, the number was reduced to seven, as Marstrand, Kongelv, and Udvala were located in that province. But before the close of the century, the number had been increased to eleven, the new cities being Fredrikshald, Kragere, Drammen, and Larvik. Of the more important towns, Moss, Holmestrand, Österiser, Arendal, Molde, Lillefossen, Christiansund, and Tromsø became cities in the 18th century. The population of the cities at this time cannot be determined with any degree of accuracy. J. E. Sars has estimated that in the latter part of the 17th century, Christiania had between 3,000 and 3,500 inhabitants. But Ludwig Daya considers this estimate too low. Ruar Tank holds that the population of Christiania in 1683 was about 4,000, which agrees in the main with the estimate of A. Collett, who thinks that the population of the city in 1654 was about 4,000. The population of Fredrikstad is estimated by Tank to have been 900 in 1683. According to the tax levied in 1599, Bergen would have 8,000 to Christiania's 4,000, and Trondheim and Stavanger would have 3,500 and 800 respectively. Oscar Albus Jonsson estimates that before 1660, Marstrand had 1,400 inhabitants, Kongelv 500, and Udvala less, probably about 400. Skien probably had a similar number. It is clear, however, that the burgher class were rapidly growing in number, not only through the increase of the population of the old cities, but also through the rise of new ones. A danger to the independence of the bunder, greater than any other, was the practice of the wealthy burghers to buy land in the country districts. After they had gained control of the lucrative lumber trade, their next attempt was to get possession of the forests, and when crown lands were sold, they were the heaviest buyers. In the latter part of the 17th century, a number of large private estates, proprietorgods, were created, and the areas of land owned by the burgher class was rapidly increasing. Lawrence Berg has shown that in Brunlelen, they owned 14% of the land in 1661, and 18% in 1703, while the holdings of the bunder did not increase. At this time, not above one-third of the bunder were freeholders, the rest were renters. A large part of the soil was owned by the crown, 
which had gradually acquired possession of the estates of the Catholic Church and of the old noble families who became extinct. The crown finally owned about one-third of all the land in the kingdom, while the rest belonged to the noblemen, officials, burghers, and rich landowners among the bunder. During the wars with Sweden these opulent classes had loaned money to the crown, who were generally short of funds, hit upon the idea of paying their creditors with lands. What remained after these debts were liquidated, they sold in order to replenish their treasury. From 1660 till 1670, crown lands were thus disposed of for the amount of 1,300,000 riksdaler, mostly to rich burghers, officials, and noblemen. A class of rich landowners thus sprang into existence, and the bunder, who were forced to rent lands from them, soon found that they were worse off under these greedy masters than they had been as tenants under the crown. In order to make their investments as profitable as possible, these landlords increased the rents, and introduced methods of oppression resembling those in vogue in Denmark, and the bitterest resentment was awakened among the Norwegian bender, who understood that they were threatened with complete subjugation. Their spirit of resistance was aroused, and according to old custom they brought their complaints directly to the king. Deputations were sent to Copenhagen to ask for redress of grievances, but as the request involved the redemption of the alienated lands, the king neither would nor could grant the relief sought. Finally, Stadtholder Yildenleva, who foresaw that serious troubles might arise, espoused the cause of the bunder, and urged the king to grant them relief by curbing the greed of the landowners. In Norway, he said on a later occasion, the government differs so much from that of other lands that there it consists of the bunder, and is maintained by them. The prosperity of the bunder is the main thing, the root and basis for the preservation of the whole kingdom. A statement pregnant with a fundamental truth, which had been clearly perceived by the stadtholder. So long as Griffenfeld remained in power, Yildenleva's advice remained unheeded, as he was opposed by the powerful chancellor. But after the king assumed more direct control of affairs, he took steps to ensure the Norwegian bunder against oppression by the landlords. In 1684 to 1685, regulations were published fixing the rate of rent to be charged, and limiting the amount of free service to be rendered by the peasants. The farm had to be leased with all its conveniences to the leaseholder for his whole lifetime, the rent had to be stipulated by mutual contract, and fixed prices were established for the products by which the farmer paid his rent. The jurisdiction exercised by Danish landlords over their peasants was not allowed in Norway. Heavy fines were imposed on any landlord who charged excessive rents, or in any way wronged or abused the landholders, and the main provisions of these laws could not be abrogated even by contract. Some features of these laws were so favorable to the leaseholders that they could not be enforced at once, but they served to ensure the renters' fair treatment. Under these conditions, the landowners found it little profitable to own extensive areas, and they sold the greater part of their holdings in smaller portions to the renters, thereby increasing the number of freeholders. The struggle with the landlords had in general a wholesome effect upon the renters, says Professor Jonsson. It roused them from their slumber. Now, for the first time, they understood the importance of owning their own farms, and they saved money so that they could buy land. After 1680, the king again began to sell land, but what he now sold was mostly separate farms, small places, and parts of farms, and the bunder bought the greater share. The laws of 1684 to 1685 were also intended to protect the bunder against extortion and injustice practiced by the royal officials. After the Lensherer had been replaced by Amtmend, who could exercise but slight control over their subordinates, who also ranked as royal officials, abuses of that sort had been increasing. In order to right these wrongs, the laws established fixed rates of charges for clergymen and other officials, and imposed other necessary restrictions. But as the laws were to be enforced by the self-same officials whom they were supposed to govern, it is natural that in too many instances they were allowed to remain inoperative. The bunder were again hard-pressed both by the officials and by the burger class. They were not only reduced to a worse situation socially and economically than in any earlier period, but as the burghers and officials gradually entrenched themselves in a position of power such as no class outside of the old nobility had hitherto enjoyed, but they were also forced into the background politically, 
after absolutism had eliminated all participation of the people in affairs of administration and government. But the Bunder had awakened to the realization of the situation, and a determined struggle began which constantly increased in bitterness. Scattered uprisings grew more frequent, able popular leaders appeared in various districts, and the growing social conflict stirred the people's love of their rights and liberties, not to a momentary enthusiasm, but into a permanent attitude of the mind, which was destined to shape all future national development in Norway. This school of adversity made the Norwegian Bunder vigilant patriots, and their national independence was cradled in these bitter local struggles against oppression and injustice, which were waged with ever-increasing intensity, especially throughout the 18th century. The struggle between the Bunder and the new upper classes was aggravated, also by the fact that the burghers, as well as the officials, consisted largely of foreigners, who came to Norway to seek new opportunities. They felt in no direct touch with the common people, and treated them with an offensive haughtiness, and not infrequently with an insolent arrogance which engendered the most innate class hatred. J. E. Sars says, The Norwegian burgher class, which arose under the union with Denmark, was to a large extent of foreign origin. Danes, and still more frequently Germans and merchants from Schleswig-Holstein, moved to the Norwegian cities, and because of their good connections they were often able to play a leading role. Danish had become the spoken language in the cities after the Reformation, and thereby the burgher class, whether they were foreigners or native-born, became separated from the rest of society by a deep chasm, so that they stood over against the rest of the people as half-foreigners. The same was true, even in a higher degree, of the official class. In the period immediately following the Reformation, the lack of higher schools in Norway and the generally neglected and benumbed intellectual conditions resulted in the frequent appointments of Danes to office in the kingdom. Afterwards, when Norway was better able to shift for herself in this respect, it continued to be a general practice to give the Norwegian offices to Danes, while Norwegians were frequently appointed to office in Denmark. The government had a fixed purpose, which was constantly becoming more clearly defined, of commingling as far as possible the two peoples so that they might learn to feel as one. At every period of the union with Denmark, the Norwegian official class was therefore strongly mixed with Danish elements, especially in the higher and leading circles. Of the Norwegian members of this class, as well as the Danish, it was true that they had studied at the University of Copenhagen, that they had spent their happiest and most important years in the Danish capital, and had often formed friendships there which lasted through their whole lifetime. The higher they rose intellectually, the stronger they must have felt attracted by the memories of their youth spent among friends, both Danes and Norwegians, in, in study and in the intellectual pastime of the clubs, while they must have felt almost as strangers as exiles when they became established at home as officials in the lonely country districts or in a small Norwegian town, where the people's minds were occupied with freight rates and lumber prices. The new classes were nevertheless of great importance to the future development of the Norwegian people. They gradually came to represent the economic strength of the nation, and as they established close relations with the outside world, not only commercially but also intellectually, they were in position to transplant to Norwegian soil new ideas from abroad, elements of higher culture, intellectual interests, and taste for art and elegance which had an elevating and stimulating influence on the otherwise so democratic Norwegian society. After a generation or two, those who were of foreign descent learned to feel as native-born citizens, and were ready to bear their full share in defending the kingdom, and in building its institutions. But the social conditions which have been outlined made them unable to deal justly with the bunder nor were they able to realize what secret strength lay hidden in the ardent love of freedom and the unsubdued will of the common people. The commercial activity was chiefly controlled by three principal cities, Bergen, Trondheim, and Christiania. Bergen especially had developed a considerable commerce and a strong class of merchants, who maintained trade with all western countries of Europe. They even ventured into the Mediterranean Sea in spite of the Barbary pirates, and attempts were made to carry on trade with the West Indies, Greenland, America, and the west coast of Africa. Trondheim retained the right to trade in the four Sjölen, Namdalen, Fosen, Nordmer, and Romsdal, but the trade with Nordland was open to the merchants of both cities. 
Bergen received the trade monopoly and the control of the local administration in Finmarken, but this great power was so abused by the Bergen merchants that after six years of systematic extortion, an Amtmand was again appointed for the province. In the southern towns and cities, the lumber trade was growing rapidly. In the last decade of the 17th century, when England and Holland were carrying on war with France, the commerce of these powers decreased, and the Norwegian trade received an impetus which marks a new epoch in the development of Norwegian's merchant marine. The trade with France increased steadily as the Norwegian articles of export, tar, lumber, masts, iron, and fish, were in great demand. England and Holland sought to stop this trade, but in 1691 the northern kingdoms formed an alliance in defense of neutral trade, and both powers had to abandon their attempts at interference with the trade of neutral nations. Home industry was encouraged through protective tariff or the exclusion of foreign wares, and the high duties placed on goods imported in foreign vessels also favored Norwegian trade. Christiania had a fleet of 23 merchant vessels in 1696. Bergen's merchant fleet rose from 46 ships in 1680 to 146 in 1690, and similar progress was made by other cities and towns. In 1707, the Norwegian merchant marine numbered 568 ships, a remarkable increase from 50 merchant vessels in 1648. Also in the fisheries, considerable progress is noticeable in this period. The catching of ling and halibut on the Storregen banks, about 110 miles from the coast, was begun at this time. The gillnet and other implements for the cod fisheries were invented, and the export of lobster, especially to Holland, was begun. The whale fisheries near the coast of Greenland and Iceland were encouraged, and stations for the manufacture of train oil were built. The commerce with the East Indies, which had long been interrupted, was again revived through the organization of a new East India Company, and a West India Company was also organized. Industry was making slow progress for want of the necessary capital and experience, but some attempts were made which show a growing spirit of enterprise and the influx of new ideas. Jürgen Thor Merlin of Bergen was especially active in originating new industrial enterprises in his home city. In 1684, he was also instrumental in founding the Bergen Chamber of Commerce. He erected rope, salt, soap, and train oil factories in Bergen and neighborhood, canvas and woolen mills, tanneries and cooper shops, powder mills, and nail factories. He managed the trade with Finmarken in Greenland, and carried on commerce with Guinea and the West Indies. These attempts were in complete harmony with the mercantile economic ideas of the times, and he was generally encouraged by the government in the hope that factories might soon be erected in different cities to supply the demand for manufactured articles. But Mullen engaged in two hazardous ventures. Before the end of the century he was financially ruined, and the enterprises which he established soon proved unsuccessful. Some lasting progress was nevertheless made. About 1700, the first oil mill was built in Norway, and about the same time, the first paper mill was also erected. This marks the beginning of the paper industry, which was destined in time to become one of the best-paying branches of Norwegian manufacture. In full accord with the mercantile spirit was also the encouragement of mining, as well as the restrictions placed upon the number of sawmills in the interest of the preservation of the forests. These restrictions would naturally tend to eliminate the small producers. Lumbering became a monopoly controlled by rich dealers and mill owners, who grew to be a class of capitalists. End of chapter 34。Chapter 35 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gierschet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Norwegian Literature in the 17th Century The 17th century, or more correctly the period from 1620 till 1720, was a century of lifeless formalism and unproductive learned pedantry in the Norwegian literature as well as in that of many other countries of Europe. In Germany, the literary and intellectual life which had begun to flourish at the beginning of the century was crushed by the ravages of the Thirty Years' War and poetry became the servant-maid of Latin learning and Protestant theology. German had indeed replaced Latin as the literary language, but Latin learning and classical mythology still constituted the chief contents of most of the poetry written. 
The pedantic metric laws formulated by Martin Opitz had gained an absolute authority, which checked all development of verse and meter, and the poets imitated, as well as they could, the empty bombast of the Italian poet Marino, and the hollow pathos of the Frenchman Ronsard, and the French tragedy fostered in the atmosphere of the court of Louis the Fourteenth. A fine literature of hymns and religious songs was produced by poets like Spee, Scheffler, Gerhardt, Terstegen, Riest, Dach, and others. Religious prose writers like Arnd, Spener, and Scriver wrote works which have exercised a lasting influence upon religious life and thought also in the North. But the secular poetry consisted largely of songs for birthday parties, weddings, funerals, or in congratulation of princes and persons of wealth and quality, whose favor was sought through the most servile flattery. At the same time, the poet considered it essential to make a boastful display of his own learning through frequent classic allusions and use of mythological elements, and phrases and expressions borrowed from classic authors. The drama was represented by traveling companies of entertainers who adopted to their own use selections from Italian, French, Spanish, Dutch, English, and Latin writers. In the North, the German literature exercised a great influence, and in Sweden especially, Martin Opitz was accepted as the great pattern and authority. In Norway, local conditions did not favor a systematic adherence to foreign patterns, but German influence made itself felt both directly and indirectly, and the literary taste and spirit of the age gained full control. In 1664, 16 German comedians came to Bergen and acted almost daily near the Custom House, and the students of the cathedral school played heathen histories in the new church. During Lent, mysteries and miracle plays were also presented in the churches. But the German literary influence was principally exerted indirectly through Denmark, where the Norwegian students received their higher school training at the University of Copenhagen, and where German intellectual culture had made a profound impression, especially after the introduction of the Reformation. We find accordingly also in Norwegian literature of this period the customary varieties of poetic productions, didactic poems, lamentations, religious poems, songs for various occasions, and rhymed descriptions of different parts of the kingdom, much of it almost wholly devoid of poetic merit. By contemporaries, this kind of poetry must have been received with favor, possibly even with generous praise, but the interest which it awakened was transient, and a literary historian has aptly characterized it as the forgotten literature, as most of it has long since been relegated to oblivion. Few really gifted poets graced literature at this time. Most of those who devoted themselves to poetic production were mere rhymers, who might weave their couplets deftly enough into light verses for a festive occasion, or who, with infinite patience, tortured their muse in the vain effort to produce a great epic on a subject which could better be dealt with in a prose treatise. But in most of these efforts we discover the author's erroneous idea that poetry is the art of making rhyme according to an acknowledged system of metric rules. But the forgotten literature of the 17th century represents the first faltering steps in modern poesy, aside from the popular ballads and folk tales, and it is not without its interest and value to the modern student who would understand the intellectual culture and social life of this period. The first poet of this period, and in a sense the originator of this class of poetry in Norway, was characteristically enough a Dane, Anders Christensen of Rebo, 1587-1637 a gifted and dashing young scholar, a favorite of Christian IV, who had been made Bishop of Trondheim, and according to J. H. Schlegel, deserves to be compared with his contemporary Opitz. Arebo could not at the outset have been influenced by Opitz, as his Kong David's Psalter, a paraphrase of the Psalms of David, was completed in 1623, a year before the Buch von der Deutschen Poetry was published. But Rödam says that it is clear enough that Opitz's useful effort to purify his countrymen's taste and their poetic style has exerted a beneficial influence upon him towards the close of his career. The socially inclined bishop with the poetic temperament mixed with unrestrained mirth in the frolicsome merrymakings which in those days were the chief features of weddings and social gatherings. He was guilty of no moral wrongdoing, but his powerful enemies Tagge thought Royal Lensmand of Trondheim, and Peter Loritzen, the city Fogad, found an opportunity to accuse him of conduct unbecoming a bishop, 
and he was dismissed from his high office, 1622. After a few years, he became clergyman in Vordingborg in Denmark, where he died in 1637, 50 years of age. The disgrace and sorrow which had thus darkened Rebo's life brought his poetic gifts to full maturity. He completed his paraphrase of the Psalms of David in 1623, and after 1629 he was persuaded to undertake a translation of Guillaume Barat's epic poem La Première Septemane. Arebo did not translate the poem, but gave a free elaboration of its theme and thoughts in his Hexameron, a poem about the creation in Alexandrian verse which became very popular and continued to be held in high esteem even in the following century. The poem was not published till 24 years after the author's death, but it gained for him a great reputation, especially among younger contemporaries. Through Arebo's works, especially his paraphrase of the Psalms, which was first published, a great stimulus was given to poetry. He found many imitators in Denmark, and in Norway numerous versifiers appeared. Mikkel Morgensen, 1690-1654, clergyman at Nairo in Namdalen, wrote a lamentation over a storm which caused great loss of lives and property along the sea coast, and poems of that type continued to grow in number. Hans Mortensen Machius, engraver and clergyman at Yulster, has left an engraving of the Trondheim Cathedral, to which he has added a poem lamenting the ruin of the great church. Klaus Hansen Gantius, or Gas, clergyman at Ulfstein in Sundmer, wrote a lamentation about a great avalanche, and Dorothea Engelbrecht's daughter of Bergen wrote poems about the great fire in that city. Samuel Buga, 1605-1663, and Roland Knudsen, city foged in Kragru, wrote didactic poems, and religious songs were written, especially by Samuel Olson Brun, wrote a lamentation about a great avalanche, and Dorothea Engelbrecht's daughter of Bergen wrote poems about the great fire in that city. Samuel Buga, 1605-1663, and Roland Knudsen, city foged in Krageru, wrote didactic poems, and religious songs were written, especially by Samuel Olson Brun and Dorothea Engelbrecht's daughter. 1635 to 1760. By contemporaries, Dorothea was lauded in the most extravagant terms. She was called the Tenth Muse, the Wonder of the North, etc. But her productions are mostly dull and trivial rhymes expressing a fervent religious feeling, but lacking the qualities of great art. Only a few songs, or rather fragments of songs, in which she has succeeded in striking deep and true chords of religious sentiment, still continued to be numbered among the cherished Lutheran hymns. Dorothea Engelbrecht's daughter was the daughter of a Bergen clergyman. At the age of seventeen she married her father's successor, Ambrosius Hardenbeck, with whom she became the mother of nine children. But she experienced many sorrows, as she survived her husband and all her children. She died at Bergen in 1716, eighty-one years of age. The barren monotony of the 17th century as to literary life is nevertheless relieved by one distinguished name, Peter Das, the first truly great poet in modern Norwegian literature. His father, Peter Dundas, fled from Scotland to Norway during the religious persecutions in the time of Charles I, and settled in Bergen, where he became a merchant. After his marriage to Marin Falk, a daughter of the fogged Peter Falk in Helgeland, he moved to his father-in-law in, in Nordhiro, where his son Peter Das was born in 1647. Peter attended the Latin school at Bergen, and in 1665 he entered the University of Copenhagen. His father died, and as his mother was left with five children in straitened circumstances, he could continue his studies only two years, whereupon he received holy orders, and after serving for sixteen years as curate, he was appointed rector of the church of Alstehaug in Nordland in 1689. His whole life work, both as rector and poet, is inseparably connected with this part of the country. He was a born leader, a man of unique talents, who through his powerful personality and amiable traits of character, became not only the favorite poet, but the personified ideal of the people of Nordland. He was a dignified and earnest rector, strong in faith, firm in convictions, unbending in authority, and exercised a powerful influence as spiritual advisor and moral teacher. 
He was also an eminently capable man in all practical affairs, to whom the people could always turn for advice. The impression became general among his parishioners that he could control even the powers of evil, and numerous tales were told of his struggles with the devil, in which he was always victorious. The custom still prevalent among the Nordland fishermen of fastening pieces of black cloth to their sails as a token that they mourn the loss of Peter Das, shows to what extent he had become the hero of the common people. As rector of the largest parish in Norway, an extensive region which at present embraces eight parishes with over 30,000 inhabitants, he had many assistants and was in fact a real chieftain. But in this large district, where all travel had to be done by boat among the shoals and breakers of a storm-swept seacoast, he had to lead a life full of hardships and hazards, which taxed his strength and courage to the utmost. And he refers to it ironically by saying that the clergymen of Nordland do not dance on violets and roses. He was always of good cheer, social and full of sparkling humor but the constant struggles with the angry sea he describes in many places with touching pathos and powerful realism. He shows how the fishermen sail through the roaring breakers until their boats are upset, the usually unsuccessful attempts to ride the upturned boat to safety, how the people gather on the shore where the empty boats have stranded and count the knives which their dying fathers, husbands, and brothers have plunged into the upturned boat to learn how many have found a grave on the stormy deep. So clearly and truthfully are the social conditions, the environment, life, and character of the people of Nordland reflected in the poetry of Peter Das, that it becomes true of him in a very special sense that he who wishes to understand the poet must know the land which fostered him. But the converse is no less true, that he who wishes to become acquainted with Nordland and its people as they were in the 17th century must study Peter Das. His pastoral duties and the religious instruction of his parishioners were always his chief care, and he wrote several collections of religious songs in order to give the Christian doctrines a pleasing and striking form. The most popular of these works are his Catechismus Sange, i.e. Luther's Catechism turned into songs, which have remained the cherished reading of the common people. But his principal work, and the ones on which his reputation as a poet chiefly rests, is the Nordland's Trumpet which retains its place among the classic productions in Norwegian literature. Although it is a description of Nordland and its people which pictures with the minuteness of a geography the nature and the climate, the economic and social conditions of the people, it is written with a taste and skill which makes it a true work of art. It is a book more popular than any other secular work in our literature, writes A. E. Erikson, and Just Bing says that the people's life and work has fascinated Peter Das, and his description of nature turns into a picturing of the life of the people. It would be futile to attempt to distinguish between nature and the people in his works, as he has viewed them together, not apart. Yes, it is when nature bears a direct relation to human life that it becomes interesting, according to his opinion, and their point of contact is, so to speak, the basis of operation in his nature description. At the point where nature begins to influence the lives and deeds of man, Peter Das dwells upon natural phenomena, and the reader gets the full impression of the great might of nature, its activity and power. At this point, also, the reader's imagination forms a clear picture. It is not the description of nature itself which makes us shudder, however strong expressions the author might use, but when we hear how the storm has caused death and sorrow in many families, when we see that all human power, as compared with the storm, is a mere nullity which is swept away when we see men's vain efforts to save their lives, how they strive convulsively to gain the bottom of the upturned boat, to cling fast to it, and that the waves nevertheless carry them away, when we see corpses and wreckage drifting in the sea, the picture becomes powerful. We feel the great might of the elements. We see them overwhelm men irresistibly, destroying the happiness of one generation after the other. In other words, the description of nature becomes impressive when we see the power of nature pictured in its effect upon the inhabitants of the country. Some of Peter Das's minor poems have become favorite folk songs, as Norsk Dalavisa and Jefte Lufta. Of other poets who flourished towards the end of the period may be mentioned especially Povel Yule, 
an eccentric person of real poetic talent, who wrote at Lixeligd Liv and Godbonde o Hans Jerning, and Ole Kanstrup, who became known as the writer of humorous verses for various festive occasions. His most typical poem is a song written in the Norwegian dialect about a wedding. This song was later imitated very successfully by Nils Heberg in the very popular ditty Bonneni Brillapsgarden, written in 1734. Norse history, literature, and runic inscriptions were diligently studied by the Danish scholar Ole Wormius, who in 1643 published his Monumenta Danica, a large work on the runic inscriptions. In his study of Old Norse literature, he was ably assisted by Bishop Brynjolf Svensson of Skalholt and the learned Icelander Arngrim Jonsson, the restorer of Icelandic literature. In Sweden, Olaf Verelius, 1618-1682, and Olaf Rudbeck, the author of Atlantica S. Mannheim Jefeti Sedes et Petria, were emphasizing with one-sided enthusiasm the importance of the Scandinavian countries in history. This revival of interest in northern studies led to the creation of a new historical school in the north, whose most prominent members were the Icelanders Arne Magnusson, the originator of the great collection of Icelandic manuscripts which bears his name, and Thormod Torfeus, the most distinguished name in the prose literature of this period. In 1662, Torfeus was sent by Frederick III to Iceland to collect manuscripts, a work in which he was very successful. In 1682, he was made royal historiographer, and in 1711, he published his large and in many respects important work, Historia Rerum Norwegicarum, a history of Norway from the earliest times till 1387. The Dane Arnoldus de Fina also undertook to write a history of Norway in Latin, but left the work unfinished. Of great value to modern scholars are the historical typographical writings and shorter annals of this period, works which were left unpublished at the time, but which of late years have been edited and published in the interest of historical research. Edvard Edvardsson, conrector of the Bergen Latin School, wrote an elaborate history and description of the city of Bergen. Melchior Augustinusson wrote Annals of Trondheim and Trendelagen, 1670-1705, and Hans Lilienskjöld, 1703, wrote a large and still unpublished work, Speculum Boreala, an historical geographical description of Finmarken. Gert Henriksen Miltzau is the author of several local personal historical works dealing with Bergen's Stift, but most of his writings have been lost. And Diederik Brinch in Nordland, published in 1683, Descriptio Lacophode Norwegia. Hans Nobles, in Beretning till Kongen um Verholdene, e 1716. Oxsteker um Finmarken, 1667, by Frederick Short, and Johann Wilhelm Klüvers, Beretning um den Norske Herz in Faldi Sverga, 1719, may be classified as public documents. An extensive religious prose literature was also produced, consisting chiefly of sermons and devotional books. Among the common people, the folk poesy continued to flourish, and throughout this dull period it maintained an untutored literary life, and fostered the true instinct for poetic art, which formed a healthful contrast to the pedantic rules and lifeless learning of the age. As true poesy in this period is chiefly to be sought in the folk literature of the common people, so art was still found mainly as handicrafts among the bunder, who from very early ages had been skilled woodcarvers, goldsmiths, etc. Fine embroidery, and especially the weaving of fine tapestry, which had been the pride and pastime of ladies of rank in early ages, was at this time, and still continues to be, a highly developed art in Norway. The carving of wood and ivory was brought to a state of perfection which has never been excelled in the north. Even country lads, using no other tools than their knife, were able to produce real pieces of art, which are still preserved as treasures in the art museums. The most noted name in this field is that of Magnus Berg of Gudbrandsdal, 1666 to 1739, of whose wonderful carvings in ivory 38 pieces are still preserved in Rosenborg Palace in Copenhagen. Nearly every district had its own adepts in the various arts and handicrafts, 
who wrought with rare genius such works of beauty and imagination that many a trained artist would find difficulty in imitating them. End of chapter 35「Chapter thirty six of History of the Norwegian People, Volume Two by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Education and the Church. Norway had no university, but secondary or Latin schools were found in nearly all the principal cities in the kingdom. The main stress was laid on the study of Latin, which the pupils should learn to read, write, and speak, but Greek was also read, and in the highest class, Hebrew logic, metaphysics, and rhetoric were studied. Much time was devoted to devotional exercises and singing, but mathematics and history were almost wholly neglected, and until 1668 no schoolbook existed in the mother tongue, and no attention was paid to it. The discipline was very severe. Corporal punishment was often inflicted, and fines were imposed on the scholars for various offenses. This bred a rude and insolent spirit in the pupils, and the school became the scene of constant jarrings between scholar and schoolmaster, who regarded each other as hostile forces. Ludwig Holberg says with the characteristic exaggeration of the humorist, Every schoolmaster was at that time a sovereign, and the pupils lived in profound awe. Their lacerated backs, their swollen foreheads, their bruised cheeks proclaimed that every school was like a Lacedaemonian gymnasium. At the head of the school stood the rector, who was assisted by the conrector. According to royal decree of March 17, 1675, no one could become rector or instructor unless he had received the degree of baccalaureus artium. It has already been stated that one-fourth of the tithes, the bondelut, was used for the support of poor students, but at a meeting in Skien, 1575, of the nobles, bishops, logmand, and the leading bunder, it was decided that a spand of grain should be paid for each manswerk, for the maintenance of the school, while the bondelut should be kept by the bunder for the support of the poor. This was ratified by royal decree of 1578, but the bunder were often unwilling to pay the school tax, and it could not always be collected. The Reformation brought no marked improvement in primary education, as the reformers both in Norway and Denmark were chiefly concerned with the education of ministers for the Lutheran Church. No public schools were organized, and the education of the common people was so far neglected that not above one-tenth could read and write. Some provision was nevertheless made for the religious instruction of the people. Bishop Palladius of Zeeland says in his Visitatsbog, The congregation has two servants one especially for the older, and the other for the younger church. As the clergyman teaches and instructs the old, so the sexton should teach the young. When he has rung the church bell for the first time on Sunday, then he shall strike the bell fifteen or sixteen times as a signal to the children. The young people shall come to church and seat themselves on the first benches, and the sexton shall stand in the midst of them and instruct them with pleasure and kindness according to a sexton's book published in Copenhagen, and he shall also teach them religious songs. But to those who do not dwell in a church village, the sexton shall come at least once a month, when the sun shines brightly, and the children can be out of doors. He shall encourage the parents to send their children to the sexton, but if they will not come, they shall then be forced with the whip to do so. This system of religious teaching, which was the same both in Norway and Denmark, must be regarded as the first attempt at systematic public instruction, the germ of the common schools. As an aid to ministers and sextons in instructing the children, Bishop Palladius published a translation of Luther's Catechism, 1538, to which he added in 1542, Brevis Expositio Catechismi Pro Parochius Norwegiae, a work which was translated into Danish in 1546. But as the majority of the people could not read, and as they had difficulty in understanding the Danish language, they could not derive much direct benefit even from books of this kind. The great disadvantage of the prevailing illiteracy was keenly felt, especially by the clergy, and in the preliminary drafts of the church ordinance issued by Christian IV, the desire was expressed that the people in the larger towns should keep a school teacher, that they should build a schoolhouse, and that the more well-to-do citizens should make donations for this purpose. It is clear that there was a growing demand for popular education, and that some attempts were made to provide for the instruction of the common people 
but because of frequent wars and oppressive taxes, slight progress was made in the 17th century. Through the introduction of absolutism, changes had also to be made in the laws and ritual of the church. In 1685, a new ritual was published, which was introduced in Norway in 1688, and about the same time, the Danish-Norwegian church also received a new hymn book, published by the great psalmist Thomas Kingo, Bishop of Fian. In Catholic times, and even after the introduction of the Reformation, the old Latin hymns were sung in the churches, but Hans Thomason's Danske Psalmebog of 1569 had gradually come into general use, and so many additions had been made to it that it was deemed necessary to get a new hymn book. Thomas Kingo was commissioned by the king to edit one. The first part of Kingo's hymn book appeared in 1689, but the book was not authorized for general use till in 1699. The bishops and many other ecclesiastics were men of learning and high character, who wrote collections of eloquent sermons, devotional books, hymns, and religious songs, and who labored earnestly to improve the religious and intellectual life of the people. But the church as a whole was nonetheless in a rather deplorable state. Everything was for sale, says Andreas Fea. In Denmark, not only the churches were sold to the highest bidder, but even the right to appoint clergymen for the parishes in which they were located. In Norway, the king had at his free disposal the revenues of the church, which were often used for military purposes. The income of the church was farmed out, or granted in part, as donations. Christian V granted, among other things, the richest states of the provosty of Tunsberg to Peter Griffenfeld, and after his downfall, to U. F. Gildenlove, together with the right to make all ecclesiastical appointments in the counties of Jarlsberg and Larvik. At times one was granted the tithes of a church, another its fees or its estates. The public church service was looked down upon, and this, together with the ridiculous passion for rank, led to private communion, to marriages and baptisms at home among the finer classes, who imitated French language, manners, and customs, while the attention of the common people was especially directed to the exercising of the devil, to witchcraft, and other superstition. The period was one of general moral laxity and lack of religious spirit, and among the common people drunkenness and coarse manners were prevalent. Bishop Jürgen Eriksson of Stavanger says in his first sermon of Ione Prophetes Skjona Historia, What vices and offenses against God Almighty are to be found among the lower classes, the common people know well enough how to complain of, for there are very few married folks who live together in peace and good understanding. Parents and older people give the children poor training, and rather set them a bad example in everything which is contrary to God's holy commandments. Children and servants will not be governed by anyone, but resent all chastisement and rebuke. Among the people, cursing and swearing, immorality, theft, cheating, falsehood and slander, and other such evils prevail. For they are so wicked and perverse that we see among all classes sin and vice prevail in the highest degree and most damnable form so that we must complain with the holy Polycarpus. O Lord, why didst thou suffer us to live in such pitiful and miserable times? Though this is a piece of pulpit oratory, other evidence shows that it can be taken more literally than is usually the case with religious complaints about the wickedness of mankind. Even the clergymen were often rude and violent, and not seldom intemperate and immoral. In the year 1594, four rectors in Christian sons Stieft alone were dismissed for grave offenses of that kind. The 17th century was the age of orthodoxy. The Lutheran Church laid great emphasis on the purity of doctrine, and its teachings were adhered to by all classes with the firmest faith and conviction. But the spiritual life of the people was not deeply affected by the cold formalism and lifeless reiteration of dogmas into which the church service had degenerated. Bishop A. Christian Bang says, As people believed without skepticism, they also observed diligently all religious ceremonies. They had time and patience to listen to a sermon which lasted for five hours, but the faith and the religious exercises, which in a manner were sincerely enough meant, were able to exert but slight influence. The people of those times were all dualists to a greater or lesser degree. They were divided into two personalities, the pious and the licentious, and they seemed to live happily in this dualism without being aware of its inconsistency. 
They were equally orthodox, equally pious, even if they were at times cavilling and quarreling, and given to fighting and drunkenness, to barbaric rudeness and moral licentiousness, which to say the least was half pagan. But the church itself was largely responsible for these conditions. Bishop Bong continues, As a people is, so are their priests, says the prophet. In the age of orthodoxy, the clergy were in every way imbued with the spirit of the times, the character of the age. The sermons which they delivered can as a rule not be rated very high. They were often earnest in chastising the people for their sins and vices, but these legal philippics frequently degenerated into pure invective, not to mention the instances when the preacher would thunder the anathemas of his wrath upon the audience, and wish that the devil himself might take them all. On the whole, the sermon in the age of orthodoxy was unpractical, uncultured, pedantic, and long drawn out. The Christian truth which it undoubtedly contained was drowned in the circumlocutions, introductions, and subdivisions, the examples and learned quotations which belonged to the style of preaching in that age. The views of religion, society, and government were largely that of the Old Testament, and the Bible was therefore regarded as one of the chief codes of law. People were sentenced to death, not only according to the civil laws, but also according to the Deuteronomy, and there were also sought and found in the Deuteronomy the rules for waging war in a manner pleasing to God. That this type of preaching and Christian introduction should fail to produce a true spiritual regeneration is not strange, especially as the ministers themselves were often addicted to drunkenness and immorality. On March 27, 1629, an ordinance regarding the office of the church and its authority over the impenitent, together with some conditions of the clergy, was published. The complaint is made that the preaching of the gospel, the royal ordinances, and the sharpened threats and punishments had been of small avail, and that wickedness has so daily increased that the people in the clear evangelical light kindled in these countries led a more reckless, offensive, and godless life a great number with the idea that the true service of God consists in the exterior church service, the use of the sacraments, singing, praying, etc. Various remedies are prescribed by the ordinance. The rectors were to choose some of the best members of the congregation as assistants, medhjelpera, and in the country districts the lensmand and provost should appoint two of the best men as kirkeverger to assist the rector in his duties. Those who swore and cursed should be put in the pillory, and the ministers should preach according to the church ordinance, so that their sermons did not become too long and tiresome. Baptisms and marriages should be solemnized in the churches, and not in the private homes. This was a well-meant effort to remedy the evils in church and society, but there is no evidence that the conditions were improving in the 17th century. Government regulations or other coercive measures have not the power to impart new life or to create new ideals. The forces which are to regenerate society and lift it to a higher intellectual and moral level must have a higher source, and the Norwegian people were destined to wait another century before the great spiritual awakening came, which made faith a matter of the heart, and turned Christianity into a new spiritual and social force. End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frederick IV, The Great Northern War When Christian V died, August 25, 1699, his son Frederick, who was 28 years of age, ascended the throne as Frederick IV. The prince had taken little or no part in public affairs, and his education had been much neglected. A. Huyer says that King Christian V was persuaded by his ministers, Gabel, Knuth, and others, who had not much opportunity to study in their youth, that a prince did not need to be educated, that it only tended to obscure his natural ability if his brain was filled with too much learning. But these arguments only served to conceal the thought that they and their families would be more indispensable to the future sovereign if he remained ignorant and without understanding of his royal duties. Frederick's greatest fault, however, was not his scant education or lack of literary interests, but his frivolity and disgracefully immoral life. In 1695 he married Louise of Mecklenburg, 
but his open cohabitation with various mistresses proved that he was devoid of moral feeling, a lascivious wanton who wholly ignored the laws, which if broken by his subjects would bring upon the offender the severest punishment. The most noteworthy of his mistresses was Anna Sophia Reventlow, daughter of Count Reventlow, the king's chancellor. The king had met the young countess at a masquerade, and though her mother tried to prevent it, he enticed her from her home and she became formally wedded to the king's left hand, while his queen still lived the marriage service being read by a conrector who was liberally rewarded for his pliable conscience. In a similar way, he had been wedded to Helen Virick, who died not long after the marriage. This form of illegal polygamy could give the union neither legality nor sanctity, but this gave the king no concern, as he considered himself elevated above all laws. His queen, Louise, died in 1721, and he was formally wedded to Anna Reventlow on the day after the funeral. The reports of these events, following so closely upon each other, caused a great scandal. One day the funeral of the good Queen Louise and the king's profound grief were described in eloquent terms. The next day the king's marriage and his great joy was heralded in glowing colors. His brother Charles and his sister Hedevig were so offended that they left the court, and a permanent estrangement resulted between the king and his son and successor, Christian. King Frederick IV was of a weak and sickly appearance. He was not very gifted, and he possessed no graces which could serve to distinguish him, but his goodness and great kindness of heart won for him the love of the common people. In his duties as king he was energetic, diligent, and conscientious, though somewhat stubborn and narrow-minded. Frederick IV belonged to those kings who, while void of any higher intellectual range, can view many relations soundly and ably, and he also had a marked interest for administrative matters, especially if they pertained to financial and military affairs. He wished to become personally acquainted with conditions in his realms, and he was actively engaged in introducing needed reforms. The not very great honor seems to be due him of being regarded as one of the best kings of the House of Oldenburg. In Norway, Frederick's accession to the throne led to the retirement of Stadtholder Yildaneva, who, because of advancing age, was no longer as energetic or mindful of official duties as formerly. He resigned from his office and retired to Hamburg, where he spent the closing years of his life. No new Stadtholder was appointed. But Frederick Gobel, who was made vice stadtholder was placed in temporary charge, and G. V. Vettel was made commander-in-chief of the Norwegian army. The first half of the 18th century was a period of almost constant warfare, in which nearly all nations of Europe took part. The great struggle of England, Holland, and Germany against France was being waged for the Spanish succession and the maintenance of the principle of balance of power and in Eastern Europe, Sweden fought the Great Northern War against Russia, Poland, and Denmark-Norway for the preservation of her prestige as a great power. It is not strange that in so critical a period the chief features of the reign of Frederick IV should be those of war and diplomacy rather than of administration. Ever since the wars with Sweden in the 16th century, when the princes of the part of Schleswig called Gotthorp gained full autonomy, a hostile feeling existed between these princes and the kings of Denmark-Norway. This hostility was intensified by the support which Sweden always gave the dukes of Gotthorp. From Sweden's German provinces, armies might easily be sent against Denmark, and past experience had shown that Gotthorp would serve as an open door through which they could enter. Christian V had tried to establish Danish overlordship over Gotthorp in 1675, but he was forced to acknowledge the full autonomy of the dukedom in the Treaty of Lund, 1679, after the war with Sweden. The desire of Denmark to gain control of Gottorp seems a rather excusable ambition, especially when we view it in the light of European politics of that age. It was not only in perfect accord with the general policy of land grabbing, so universally practiced in the 18th century, but it would increase the king's revenues, and greatly lessen the chances of an attack on the southern border of the kingdom. If a favorable opportunity should present itself, the temptation to renew the attempt against the duchy would be very strong, and such an opportunity seemed to have come when the 17-year-old Charles Twelfth, 
who was considered to be a gay and incompetent youth, ascended the throne of Sweden in 1697. The relations between Gottorp and Denmark-Norway again became strained, and Sweden showed as active a sympathy with the duke as ever. In 1698, Christian V formed an alliance with August II of Poland and Saxony, and in 1699 with Tsar Peter of Russia against Sweden. No special cause of war existed, and no valid reason for an attack on Sweden at this moment could be given, but such considerations did not weigh much with 18th century monarchs. They found the moment opportune, and the negotiations were carried on with the greatest secrecy, in order that Sweden might be surprised and overwhelmed by an unexpected attack. If the plot proved successful, Poland should receive Livonia and other provinces which Sweden had seized. Russia hoped to get some Baltic seaports, and Frederick IV would subjugate Gottorp, and probably recover some of the provinces lost in the late wars. At the beginning of the year 1700, a Danish army of 18,000 men was concentrated at Rendsburg in Holstein. The Norwegian army was also mobilized, and four regiments were sent to Denmark, partly to reinforce the Danish army, and partly to render service on the fleet. When spring came, a Saxon army invaded Livonia, and the Great Northern War, destined to continue for over twenty years, had begun. The Danes took the forts of Hosum and Stoppelholm, but failed to take the fortress of Tuningen, and when an army of Swedes and Lunebergers arrived, they had to raise the siege and withdraw. But the war now took a rather unexpected turn. As both England and Holland were greatly concerned about maintaining peace in the north, they viewed with alarm and resentment this unwarranted attack on Gottorp, and sent a large fleet of 39 ships under the English Admiral Rooks to the Baltic. This fleet joined the Swedish fleet, numbering 38 ships, and a naval force thus suddenly appeared with which the Danish-Norwegian fleet was unable to cope. Seeland and Copenhagen were almost wholly unprotected, and Charles XII seized the opportunity to land a force of 10,000 men in the neighborhood of Copenhagen. But before he could begin the bombardment of the city, Frederick IV, who had already begun peace negotiations, succeeded in concluding the peace of Traventhal in Schleswig, August 18, 1700. He agreed to pay the Duke of Gottorp an indemnity of 260,000 Riksdaler, and to acknowledge his independence. To these terms Charles XII had to accede, and the war between Sweden and Denmark-Norway was terminated without much loss or gain to either side. The administration in Norway had been severely criticized by Commissioner of War Hans Rosenkreutz in a report to the king, and later by Vice Stadtholder Gable, who pointed out that the administration of Norwegian affairs was wholly dictated by the regard for the interests of Denmark and a few royal officials, whereas it ought to be conducted in such a way that it could subserve the best interests both of the king and the realm. King Frederick realized that some change ought to be made in the Norwegian administrative system, and in 1704 a commission was created in Christiania called Slotsloven på Akershus, consisting of one military and four civil members, who should assist the vice stadtholder and in general perform the duties which the stadtholder had hitherto had. The military member was a German officer, Trichler, and three of the civil members were Norwegians, who might be supposed to have more direct knowledge of Norwegian affairs. But Slotsloven showed little competence or interest. They were satisfied with adhering to the old system, and no improvement could be noticed either in the military or civil service. The same year King Frederick also visited Norway, where he was received with great honors. On the souvenir coins struck in honor of his visit, he caused the following motto to be inscribed. Mod traskab taprhed ofrad de giverera al verden kan blant norske klipperlera. This was perhaps done in acknowledgment of the efficient service which the Norwegians had rendered in past wars, but possibly also to stimulate their warlike spirit, so that military service should be more willingly rendered when the gates of war should again swing open, or when the king should deem it profitable to sell more mercenaries to fight in the bloody wars raging on the continent. In 1701, when England, Holland, and the German Empire began the great struggle against France, known as the War of the Spanish Succession, both sides sought the support of Denmark-Norway. Frederick IV avoided any active participation in the war, but he favored the opponents of France. 
In return for a yearly subsidy and the promise of aid in case of need, he hired 20,000 mercenaries to the English king, about 6,000 of whom were Norwegians. This system of sacrificing the young men of the kingdoms on foreign battlefields for no worthier purpose than to secure a few million crowns for the royal treasury was quite universally practiced at that time, and had been resorted to also by Christian V. Molesworth says that the Danes sent 7,000 soldiers to England, which are yet in his majesty's pay. These were losses far exceeding those caused by the emigration to Holland and England, but none raised a voice to bemoan it as a calamity worse than the Black Death, or to proclaim it the cause of the decline of Norwegian agriculture. We cannot but feel the truth of Moldsworth's rather bitter words. At present, soldiers are grown to be as sellable ware as sheep and oxen, and are as little concerned when sold. For provided the officers be rendered content by the purchaser, in having liberty to plunder the laborious and honest country people in their marches, and a fat winter quarter, with a permission to defraud their own men of their pay. The common soldier goes with no more sense than a beast to the slaughter, having no such sentiment as love of honor, country, religion, liberty, or anything more than fear of being hanged for a deserter. Even during the intervals of peace, the nation's best blood was being shed on distant battlefields, and these poor mercenaries could not even feel that they were giving their lives for their country. After the peace of Traventhal, Charles XII, the Swedish lion, turned against Russia and Poland, and fought a series of brilliant campaigns which dazzled Europe. After he had crushed the Russians at Narva, he marched into Poland, drove out August II, and placed Stanislaus Leszczynski on the throne. He then entered Saxony, and forced August II to conclude a humiliating peace at Altranstedt. In 1707 he again turned against Russia with an army of 14,000 men, probably the best drilled and officered army in Europe at that time. The situation became critical, and both Tsar Peter and August II implored Frederick IV to come to their aid. Frederick was still hostile to Sweden, and he continued to quarrel with Gottorp, but he would not risk a new war with Charles XII until the situation should be more favorable. He made instead a pleasure trip to Italy, which was prolonged till 1709, when he returned by way of Saxony. He met King August II, and an alliance was now concluded between the two kings. August II should again receive the throne of Poland, and Frederick IV should seek to recover the provinces which Sweden had taken from Denmark-Norway. While hard-pressed by the Swedish armies, Tsar Peter of Russia had offered Frederick IV the sum of 300,000 Riksdaler and a yearly subsidy of 100,000 if he would come to his aid. But Frederick, who hoped to get still more, did not accept the offer. Now the situation was wholly changed. On July 8, 1709, Charles XII was defeated at Poltava, and his army was destroyed. Russia replaced Sweden as the leading power in the north, and the Tsar withdrew his offer. Frederick, who realized that he had lost his opportunity, nevertheless entered into an alliance with him on the best terms obtainable, and began war with Sweden in November of the same year by sending an army of 15,000 men under Count Raventlau in Toscana. The Norwegian army was also mobilized and received orders to support the Danes by invading the Swedish border districts. 7,000 men were concentrated at Frederikstad, but after Gildenlove's retirement, the Norwegian army had been so woefully neglected that it was in no condition to render active service. Not only were soldiery, cavalry, and commissariat in a deplorable state, but all efficient leadership had disappeared through the mischievous practice of appointing to the higher military offices in Norway old men who were incapable of active military service, and considered their appointment only as a sinecure. In the Swedish wars at the time of Sehestad and Gildenova, the Norwegians had distinguished themselves, but this time they had to take the field without proper arms, equipments, or leaders. The vice stadtholder Viba was a sickly man over seventy years of age. H. E. Tritzler, who was appointed commander-in-chief, was utterly incompetent, and General Schultz, who commanded the forces in northern Norway, was an aged man over seventy years old. The campaign became a ludicrous example of hesitation and procrastination. All opportunities were wasted, and nothing was accomplished. So wholly incompetent were the commanders that the Norwegian troops spent all their time in camp, 
and could not even hold in check any of the Swedish forces who, under the able general Magnus Stenbock, advanced against the Danes in Skåne. In the Battle of Helsingborg, February 28, 1710, the Danes suffered a crushing defeat, losing 5,000 men dead and wounded, and 2,600 who were made prisoners of war. Skåne was speedily evacuated by the remnant of the Danish army, which retreated across the Sound to Seeland. Even after this defeat, Frederick IV would have sent a new army into Sweden, but he was prevented by the Swedish fleet. Not many important naval engagements occurred in this war, but on October the 4th, 1710, an undecisive naval battle was fought in Kyoga Bay, which was made memorable by the death of the Norwegian naval hero Ivar Huitfeldt, who anchored his burning ship, Donnebrog, so as not to endanger the rest of the fleet, and continued to fight until the vessel was destroyed by the explosion of its powder magazines. The attempt of seizing Skåne was not renewed, and Frederick was prevented by various circumstances from taking further active part in the war till 1712. The utter incompetence of the Norwegian administration, which had been one of the contributory causes of the disastrous defeat at Helsingborg, had been brought to the king's attention in various ways. H. C. Plotten, whom he sent to Norway to examine conditions, wrote, There is not the proper energy and vivacity in the administration, nor the subordination which there ought to be, for though there is much talking and arguing, very little is done. The king, therefore, appointed a new stadtholder, U. F. V. Löwendahl, an able and experienced general, son of the former stadtholder Ulrich Frederick Yildenlöwe. Löwendahl soon brought new order and energy into the Norwegian administration, and persuaded the king to send more warships to Norway for the protection of the Norwegian coast and commerce. In 1711, he was instructed to make an attack on Sweden for the purpose of holding in check the Swedish forces, and of preventing reinforcements from being sent to Pomerania, where the Allies intended to make their next attack on Charles the Twelfth. These instructions he carried out successfully by leading an army of 7,000 men into Bohuslän, which was occupied by a strong Swedish force under Burenskjöld. No battles of importance were fought, but the object of the expedition was nonetheless attained. In popularity as well as ability, Löwendahl resembled his noted father, but he did not remain long in Norway. Already in 1712 he was recalled to Denmark, and he soon returned to Poland, where he became King August II's minister and Lord High Steward. After the Battle of Poltava, Charles XII sought to fight his adversaries with the assistance of the Turks, and Magnus Stenbach attempted to come to his aid with an army of 17,000 men. But the transportation of such an army across the sea and through territory occupied by the enemy was connected with insurmountable obstacles. At Gadebush in Mecklenburg, he defeated the Danes, but large armies of Saxons and Russians blocked his way. Turning west, he burned Altona and entered Holstein, but mild weather made the roads impassable, and he retired to the fortress of Tuningen, which was opened to him by the Duke of Gottorp. On May 16, 1713, he was forced to surrender with his whole army, and after four years of close confinement, the general died in a Danish prison, 1717. Stenbock's defeat and capture exhausted Sweden's last strength, and made further resistance impossible. Charles XII was a prisoner in Turkey, and after the situation became so critical that the estates threatened to conclude peace if the king did not return, Charles left Turkey and reached Stralsund in November 1714. He hoped to defend Pomerania against his enemies, but Frederick IV formed an alliance with George I of England Hanover, and Frederick William of Prussia, and while the Danish-Norwegian fleet made it impossible to send reinforcements across the Baltic, a Danish-Prussian army besieged the city, which was forced to capitulate, December 23, 1715. End of chapter 37《Chapter 38 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Charles Twelfth in Norway Two days before Stralsund capitulated, King Charles Twelfth boarded a Swedish man-of-war and set sail for Sweden. He succeeded in eluding the Danish-Norwegian fleet and landed at Trelleborg at daybreak on Christmas Eve, 1715. The homecoming was not a joyful one. 
The condition of the kingdom was deplorable in the extreme, and the people desired peace at any cost. But King Charles had not yet abandoned hopes of success, and refused to listen to any proposals of that kind. Through prescriptions, forced loans, and other coercive methods, he succeeded also this time in raising the required forces. The attack was to be directed against Frederick IV, against whom he felt a special resentment. Had the winter been cold enough, he would have crossed the Sound on the ice and invaded Sealand, but this plan had to be abandoned because of mild weather, and he decided to seize Norway, which he hoped to take by a swift and energetic attack. After the departure of Lovendal, the Norwegian administration, directed by Slotsloven and the new vice stadtholder Frederick Krag, had relapsed into its old inactivity and incompetence. General Hausmann, the commander-in-chief of the army, and the military member of Slutsloven, who had proved himself both able and conscientious, and had brought the army into a fairly high state of efficiency, was dismissed shortly before the war broke out, because the government feared lest his warlike spirit should lead him to act with too much haste. The country was ill-prepared for war, though the military burdens, as well as the size of the army, were continually augmented until they passed all reasonable limits. Footnote. At the beginning of Frederick's reign, the Norwegian army numbered 10,000 men. In 1727, it was increased to 18,000, and through new enlistments, and especially by adding a force of reserves of 9,300, it was raised to 30,000 by 1742. The length of the required term of military service was increased from three to ten years, so that many remained in the army from 16 to 20 years. J. E. Sars says that scarcely a government in Europe drew so heavily on the people's strength for military purposes. And footnote. The treasury was empty, and the army, which numbered 24,000 men, of whom 4,000 had been sent to Germany, lacked clothes, medicine, tents, and provisions. The officers were to a large extent foreigners, often without military experience, and devoid of interest for the country's welfare. The new commander-in-chief, Lutzow, was a German by birth, but he had married a Norwegian lady and had settled permanently in the kingdom. He was upright and competent, but extremely cautious and not very energetic. When the report was received that Charles XII might attack Norway, some efforts were made to mobilize the Norwegian army, but there was a conspicuous lack of promptness and energy. Lutzow and his assistants, as well as Slutsloven, felt convinced that Charles would not begin a new campaign in the winter, and nothing of importance was done to safeguard the country against invasion. But Charles XII was used to take advantage of situations of that kind. His army of invasion, consisting of 12,000 men, was ready to march at any moment, and in the beginning of March he started from Vermland with a corps of 3,000 men, infantry, and cavalry. It was his aim to march straightway upon Christiania. General Carl Gustav Merner, governor of Bohus, was ordered to advance to his support with a force of 4,000 men, and General Aschenberg was instructed to operate against Frederickshald and Frederiksten with a third division. On the night before the 9th of March, 1716, the burning farder on the mountaintops suddenly announced that the enemy had entered the country. Charles XII had crossed the border with a force of 1,000 men, and as he found all strategic points unguarded and the road open, he hastened forward with a cavalry troop of 600 men to Herland Parsonage. The Norwegian troops stationed there under Lieutenant Colonel Brueggemann and Colonel Kruse were quartered on different farms in the neighborhood. Brueggemann was surprised and captured with 82 men without being able to make resistance, but Kruse, who had collected 200 men, attacked the Swedes, and a bloody battle ensued, in which King Charles's favorite, General Poniatowski, and his brother-in-law, Prince Frederick of Hessen, were severely wounded, and Charles himself barely escaped being captured. But the tide of battle soon turned. Crusa was wounded and captured, and his small band was scattered. He was treated with the greatest courtesy by the chivalric Swedish king. His bravery was admired by all, but he had acted in too precipitous a haste. Had he waited a few hours and collected all his forces, which numbered 700 to 800 men, he might have won an important victory, and King Charles might have been made prisoner. Crusa was tried by a court-martial and sentenced to pay a fine, but Frederick IV afforded him a full pardon. King Charles's unexpected approach caused the greatest consternation in Norway, 
where the members of Slotsloven had neglected to take proper steps even for protecting Christiania. King Charles was now only thirty-five miles away, but cold and stormy weather prevented him from pursuing his march for some days. This delay enabled the government to collect an army of about 7,000 men in the city, but when King Charles had effected a junction with Murner, who was advancing from Bohus, General Lutzow and other members of Slutsloven considered it prudent not to risk a battle. A garrison of 3,000 men was placed in the fortress of Akersus. Lutzow evacuated Christiania and retired to Gelbeck, in the neighborhood of Drammen, and the Swedes occupied the city without resistance, March 21, 1716. So far, Charles had been successful. Christiania had been taken, and he had found ample stores of provisions and good quarters for his soldiers during the inclement season of early spring. But serious obstacles were soon thrown in his way. For want of artillery, he could not besiege Akersu's castle, which trained its guns upon the city, and killed many of his men by firing along the streets. The people were everywhere hostile, a circumstance which soon made all his operations difficult. Foraging parties had to fight with the bunder, and the smaller, isolated detachments were often attacked and destroyed. A force of over 400 men which he had left at Moss in charge of the commissariat was annihilated by Henrik Jürgen Huitfeldt, and large quantities of ammunition were taken, though the greater part of the stores had already been removed. In the latter part of March, a cavalry force of 600 men under Axel Leuven was dispatched by King Charles into Hockadal, Hadeland, and Ringerike, to burn stores, and also to destroy the rich silver mines at Kongsberg. They were everywhere opposed by the Bunder, who felled trees across the roads, and offered what resistance they could without fighting any pitched battle, and they were so delayed that they did not reach Norderhof Parsonage till ten o'clock in the evening, March 28th. Here they were surprised by the Norwegians under Utken. Colonel Leuven and a large number of his men were taken prisoners, and the rest of the force was scattered. A fairly well-founded tradition relates how the parson's wife, the brave Anna Colbjorn's daughter, entertained the Swedish officers while word was sent to the Norwegians to hasten to Norderhof. Through these and similar mishaps, King Charles's position soon became critical. General Aschenberg had retreated across the border, his line of communication had been broken, and the Norwegians destroyed roads and bridges. The Norwegian forces were constantly increased, and when the regiments which had been sent to Germany returned, and Danish reinforcements had been received, the commanders resolved to block King Charles's line of retreat, and to isolate him in the district between Christiania and the Gloman River. An attempt which Charles made to turn the flank of the Norwegian army failed, and Moss was taken by Vincent Buda and Henrik Jürgen Huitfeldt. Falkenberg, the Swedish commander, was mortally wounded, and the garrison of 800 men were killed, captured, or scattered. Charles now found the situation so critical that he suddenly left Christiania in the night of April 29th, and marched across the Gloman River to Frederiksald. The townspeople of that city made a determined resistance under the leadership of the brothers Peter and Hans Kolbjörnsen, half-brothers of Anna Kolbjörn's daughter, but King Charles seized the city and hoped to capture the citadel, the fortress of Frederiksten. On the night of July 3rd he sought to take it by storm, but the citizens fired the town, so that the enemy could find no shelter, and the attack was repulsed, King Charles losing 500 men and many of his best officers. He now decided to lay siege to the fortress, as soon as his fleet of transports should arrive with the necessary siege guns and war material, but this hope was shattered by the Norwegian naval hero, Peter Tordenskjold. This remarkable man, the son of John Wessel, a sea captain and later innkeeper and alderman in Trondheim, who was born in 1690, and was at this time about 26 years of age. In his boyhood he was placed in school, but he loved adventure in the sea more than books, and several episodes from his school days reveal the temper of the future sea fighter. One day a larger boy had given him a beating, but Peter Wessel vowed that he would have his revenge. The next day he returned to the combat with his hair cut close and his head greased, and this time he worsted his opponent. When Frederick IV visited Norway in 1704, the restless youth found an opportunity to follow his retinue to Denmark, where he hoped to become a cadet. Failing in this, he hired out as a sailor, and later as mate on a ship going to the East Indies. On his return to Denmark, the war with Sweden had begun, 
and he became officer on the fleet, with the rank of lieutenant. A little later he was sent to Norway with dispatches to Baron Lovendal, who liked the young officer so well that he made him captain of a small privateer, an opportunity which enabled Wessel to develop his talents unhampered by superiors. He rendered such valuable service that Lovendal soon placed him in command of a new ship of some size, Lovendal's galley of eighteen guns, and on his first cruise he captured a Swedish ship of nine guns, which was also placed under his command under the new name of Norske Vauben. He was soon ordered to rejoin the Danish fleet under Admiral Gildenleve, and he distinguished himself to such a degree that he won the admiral's lifelong friendship and the special favor of the king. Again he was allowed to return to the coast of Norway to fight the enemy. His remarkable exploits, his distinguished service in the regular fleet, the number of prizes which he captured cannot be dwelt upon in detail, but the king so admired his rare talents that in spite of powerful opponents and jealous rivals who sought to harm the young officer, he raised him to the nobility with the name of Tordenskjold, February 24, 1716, before he had reached the age of twenty-six years. In the month of June of that year, Tordenskjold submitted to the king and the admiralty a plan for the defense of Frederiksald and for an attack on the Swedish coast squadron, which was bringing supplies to Charles the Twelfth. The plan was accepted, and the king ordered a small squadron to be placed under Tordenskjold's command for its execution. On July 2nd he weighed anchor, and sailed for the Swedish coast with seven small vessels, including his flagship, the Fide Ern, which he had captured from the Swedes, and a small frigate, Vindhunden, commanded by his chief companion in arms, Lieutenant Captain Grip. When he approached the coast of Bohuslen, he learned from some fishermen that the whole Swedish squadron of over forty sail under Rear Admiral Strömstjerne lay anchored in the harbor of Dinekilen, about twenty miles from Frederiksald. This was the fleet transporting siege guns and supplies to Charles the Twelfth, on which the outcome of the Swedish king's attack on Frederikshald and Frederiksten at this moment depended. But could Tordenskjold with seven small vessels attack so formidable a fleet, anchored in a harbor where the narrow entrance was well defended both by infantry and shore batteries? It was a daring adventure of the kind which always tempted Tordenskjold. At daybreak, July 8th, he set sail for Dinekilen, and had almost passed the narrow entrance, which is about three miles long, before the signal of his approach reached the Swedish fleet. But before he could enter the inner harbor, he was met with a brisk fire from the fleet, and also from the battery of six twelve-pound guns planted on an island in such a way that its fire could rake the entire mouth of the harbor. Tordenskjold did not return the fire till he could place his vessels as close as possible to those of the enemy. The real combat then began, and the ships were soon enveloped in a thick smoke of gunpowder which made all maneuvers difficult. After the incessant roar of cannons had continued for about three hours, the fire from the Swedish fleet began to weaken, and when Captain Tunder at about one o'clock captured the battery on the island, Tordenskjold closed in on the enemy, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, after a battle lasting seven hours, he was master of the harbor. The Swedes ran their ships aground and fled, leaving only a few men on each vessel to set it on fire or to blow up its powder magazines. But the situation was still critical, as Swedish troops and artillery had been stationed along the narrow entrance channel, which is only 160 to 180 paces wide. Also, the capture of the ships, even after they had been abandoned, could be accomplished only with the greatest difficulty, as most of them had been mined or set on fire. But the work was undertaken by Tordenskjold's men with the most resolute daring. Nine war vessels and five transports with ammunition and supplies were towed out of the harbor. The others had been sunk, beached, or crippled. The proud squadron had been destroyed, and with it disappeared King Charles's hope of taking Frederiksald. Upon receiving the discouraging news, he withdrew from Norway. His campaign had failed, not because of any great ability shown by General Litzau and Schlothloven, who had distinguished themselves chiefly by their inactivity, but because a nation had risen against him to fight for their country and their homes. End of chapter 38「Chapter 39 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Charles II's Second Invasion of Norway 
The unsuccessful Norwegian campaign and the losses it entailed would in themselves have been sufficient at this moment to create a critical situation in Sweden, but new dangers now threatened to overwhelm the kingdom with general ruin. Before King Charles retreated from Norway, he had received the news that Vismar, his last German possession, had fallen into the hands of his enemies. Finland and the Swedish Baltic provinces were in the hands of Tsar Peter the Great, and both Russia and Denmark were ready to invade Sweden with large armies. Charles's available forces did not exceed 20,000 men, of whom many had endured the greatest privations, and his country seemed to have exhausted its last strength in a hopeless and uneven struggle. But neither dangers nor misfortunes could make the king yield to peace proposals. His mind was of that strange kind which under the pressure of ill fortune becomes more rigidly fixed in its resolves even to a point of eccentricity. Victory, which in his early career had accompanied him on many a battlefield, continued in his hours of adversity to buoy him up as a hope, but it had long since changed into a mad delusion which goaded him onward to his tragic end. With incredible energy, which was only equaled by the harshness of his methods, he succeeded in a short time in raising an army of 60,000 men, of which 48,000 should be used in an attack on Norway. In order to secure well-protected depots for supplies, he fortified Strömstad, which together with Marstrand and Gothenburg would constitute a line of communications easily defended. Neither the Danish government nor the higher military authorities in Norway understood the significance of this step but the alert Peter Tordenskjold saw it and tried to frustrate the plan. On May 14, 1717, he made an attack on Gothenburg, and July 19 on Strömstad, but at both places he was repulsed, though the attacks had been well planned. The situation now seemed more hopeful for Charles XII. As Tsar Peter had ceased to cooperate with Frederick IV, there was no immediate danger of an attack from Russia. He could turn his whole army against Denmark-Norway, and a second invasion of Norway was begun in the fall of 1718. An army under General Armfeldt was sent into Trendelagen with instructions to seize Trondhjem, and the main army of invasion under the king's own command advanced a little later toward Frederiksjald. The city was invested, Fort Gildenov fell December 6th after a bloody struggle, and trenches were dug towards the main fortress. But on December 11th, while watching the progress of this work, the king was hit by a bullet from the fortress and instantly killed. The grief which filled the hearts of his brave soldiers and companions when the news of his tragic death passed from mouth to mouth was accompanied by a sigh of relief and a feeling of satisfaction that the fearful drama of war perchance was over, and that thoughts of home and peace might again be entertained. The words attributed to the Frenchman Maigret, who was with the king when he fell, seem expressive of a general sentiment. La pièce est finie. The body was brought back to Stockholm and buried in the Riederholm church. In 1860, a fine monument was erected by the Swedish army at the place where he fell. In northern Norway, General Armfeldt had advanced against Trondhjem, which was held by Vincenz Buda, who commanded an army of 6,900 men. His march had been slow, as he had been opposed at every turn by the people, as well as by the Norwegian military forces. Provisions could be secured only with great difficulty. The Swedish soldiers were dissatisfied to a point of mutiny, and the long northern winter was at hand. He reached Trondhjem and laid siege to the city, but sickness decimated his ranks, and reduced the efficiency of his forces to such a degree that instead of risking an attack on the fortifications, he felt compelled to withdraw into Verdalen where he could await reinforcements and supplies. King Charles gave the brave general a sharp reprimand and ordered him to take the city immediately, but when he again advanced, the garrison had been reinforced, and four warships had anchored in the harbor. Armfelt isolated Trondhjem by cutting off all communications with the inland districts, but supplies could reach the city from the sea, and General Buddha sent out light detachments which constantly harassed the enemy. The final assault had to be postponed from time to time, and sickness reduced Armfeldt's available forces to 4,000 men, who were compelled to camp in the open, in want of clothes, food, and proper shelter. The besieged city also suffered severely, and of the garrison alone 1,500 are said to have died. 
When Armfeld received the news of the death of Charles XII during the last days of December, he immediately began his retreat across the mountains of Sweden. But severe storms and cold weather made his passage across the pathless mountains in the middle of the winter resemble Napoleon's retreat from Moscow. His sick and hungry soldiers dropped from cold and exhaustion, and a large part of his force perished on the way. Emmehusen, who led a detachment of Norwegian ski runners in pursuit of the enemy, says, I am unable to describe the destruction of the Swedish army as I saw it. On the whole mountain no wood was to be found, and when the last companies arrived there a storm began which lasted three days. It was a sad and fearful sight. The soldiers lay dead in groups of thirty, forty, fifty or more, in full uniform, with their knapsacks on their backs, some with their guns in their hands. Others lay dead by the wayside with food in their hands and even in the mouth. The cavalrymen stood on their heads in the snowdrifts as they had been thrown from their horses. Some had broken the stalks of their muskets to build a fire. No, I cannot describe it. The farther we came up the mountains, the more dead men and horses we saw. Only a few, either of the cavalry or the infantry, could have gotten across the mountains, and those who did must be hurt, of what rank soever they may be, for the weather and the cold were too penetrating. With the retreat of the Swedish armies from Norway, military operations ceased for a time, as neither Norway nor Denmark were prepared to follow up the discomfiture of the enemy with an aggressive movement. In Sweden, the fall of Charles XII led to important changes. That Sweden's dream of empire had vanished had to be admitted, and the sentiment of the whole nation was united in a desire to obtain peace on any acceptable terms whatsoever. The absolute power of the sovereign was abolished, and King Charles's younger sister, Ulrika Eleonora, was placed on the throne with very limited power. Not through the recognized right of inheritance, but by election, the guidance of state affairs being entrusted chiefly to the Riksdag, or estates of the realm, in which the nobility exercised marked preponderance. The allies which had hitherto fought against Sweden were no longer on friendly terms. England's jealousy of Russia's growing power had developed into open hostility, a circumstance which enabled Sweden to conclude peace with England by ceding Bremen and Verden, November 20, 1719. Peace was also made with Prussia, which received the larger part of Swedish Pomerania, Usedom, Volen, Dam, and Golnau, by paying Sweden two million crowns. But no such concessions were offered King Frederick IV of Denmark-Norway, who was instead asked to make concessions to Sweden, a rather strange demand under the circumstances. The war was continued, and Frederick now planned a new invasion of Sweden to be undertaken from Norway, where he collected an army of 34,000 men. In June, he came to Norway accompanied by the crown prince, and in July 1719, he led his army into Bohuslän. When the king had established his headquarters at Strömstad, Tordenskjöld succeeded, through a brilliantly executed attack, in capturing Marstrand with its citadel Karlsten. Securing entrance to the fortress disguised as a vendor of fish, he found opportunity to examine the fortifications and to determine the strength of the garrison. The attack was as skillfully carried out as it was daringly planned. On June 23rd, he seized the five batteries defending the harbor, captured the city, and destroyed the Swedish squadron of warships stationed under its guns. Four warships and one merchant vessel were taken, and the remaining vessels were sunk in the harbor. The citadel of Carlston could not be taken by assault, but by a ruse, Tordenskjöld prevailed on the commandant to surrender the stronghold. King Frederick was so pleased that he made Tordenskjöld vice-admiral. The capture of Marstrand was the only important event of the campaign. Frederick IV had become politically isolated through the breaking up of the coalition against Sweden, but as England exerted her influence to bring about peace, both powers finally yielded to her solicitations and a treaty of peace was signed at Fredericksburg, July 3, 1720. Sweden was to pay 600,000 riksdaler, and Denmark-Norway was to evacuate the Swedish possessions of Rügen, Pomerania, Wismar, and Marstrand. Frederick IV returned the possessions of the Duke of Gottorp in Schleswig, and united these with the duchy, and Sweden promised never again to aid the duke against Denmark. The peace treaty with Russia was signed at Nystad, 1721. Russia received Ingermanland, 
Estonia, Livonia, Ösel, and southeastern Karelin and Viborglen in Finland. Sweden had lost her position as a great power. Her warrior king, who made her final struggle for supremacy so dramatic, had met his death in a foreign country in the darkest hour of national misfortune. But Peter Tordenskjold, his great antagonist, was also snatched away in the noonday of life, in the height of his glory. At the age of thirty he fell in a duel in Hamburg, four months after peace had been concluded at Fredericksburg. Throughout the war the Norwegians had distinguished themselves both on sea and land. The attack on their country had been repulsed at every point, and not a foot of territory had been lost, but economically the kingdom had suffered a noticeable decline. The great military burdens, together with heavy taxes, exhausted the energy as well as the means which should have been employed in industry and trade. The flourishing export trade which had been developed before the war, though not destroyed, was greatly reduced, and all business was crippled, as all available means were employed for military purposes. The city of Frederikshall had been burned. Trøndelagen and the districts of southeastern Norway, the most productive sections of the country, had been harried by hostile armies until the people were reduced to beggary. Still, these hardships were borne with patience and fortitude, as the war had developed into a national struggle. The invasion of the country by large armies made a deep impression, and an intense patriotism was engendered, as the people felt the war to be their own cause. For the first time in centuries the nation had been stirred to heroic efforts, and great leaders showed the way to victory and national honor. Norway had received a new national hero, Tordenskjold, who, like another Olaf Tryggvason, had come from the unknown, dazzled with his brilliant achievements, and died young. Deeds of valor and heroic sacrifices, like the burning of Fredrikshald, which made those days memorable, have continued to live in song and story till the present. If Norway lost in national well-being, she gained in national regeneration. Time and again the Norwegians had been compelled to fight battles and to suffer losses for the sole interest of their partner in the Union. But the Great Northern War taught them the lesson of patriotism, which became the starting point of a new national development. End of chapter 39。Chapter 40 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Closing Years of the Reign of Frederick IV. Social and Economic Conditions. The Great Northern War closed an epoch in the history of the Scandinavian kingdoms. Sweden had succeeded Denmark as the leading power in the north, but her preponderance, which had lasted since the Thirty Years' War, was now destroyed, and an equilibrium had been established, which would be the best guarantee for the maintenance of peace. Both Sweden and Denmark had been reduced to their natural boundaries, and their old rivalry for supremacy would have to be abandoned. Russia had become a powerful and dangerous neighbor to the east, and as conditions had so changed that they could no longer hope to play a prominent part in European affairs, an opportunity would be given for the development of the pursuits of peace. When the dream of empire had vanished, and the paths to martial glory had been closed, the people's energy and talents could be devoted to the improvement of economic and social conditions, and the creation of the high intellectual culture which was destined to shed a more benign luster upon the three sister kingdoms. Frederick IV was in no respect a great ruler. He was very suspicious and entertained an almost superstitious fear of the nobility, but he lacked the ability to free himself from the influence of intriguing officials and court favorites. The Norwegian Bunder, however, enjoyed the king's special goodwill. They had won his heart by their bravery and fidelity in the war with Sweden, and he was always inclined to favor them, and to take their part against the grasping and unjust officials. After the war with Sweden, some changes were made in the Norwegian administration. Slossloven Paul Akershus, which had proven inefficient, was abolished, and Ditlev Viba was appointed to succeed Baron Krag as stadtholder. Viba was a man of ability and fine character, but as he was inclined to favor the common people when he found that they suffered injustice, he was opposed by the corrupt bureaucracy, and especially by the rather unscrupulous bishop Dijkman of Christiania. 
The bishop succeeded for a while in ingratiating himself with the king by arousing his suspicion against Viba, and a commission was appointed to examine conditions among the royal officials in Norway. Viba was shown to be wholly innocent, but corruption was revealed on every hand. Malversation and the taking of bribes had become a common practice among the underpaid royal officials, who could urge in their defense that their salaries were too small to afford them an honest living. Among those who were guilty of these corrupt practices was Bishop Dykeman himself, who seldom refused a bribe. The king sought to remedy these defects by increasing the salaries of many officials, and by restricting the sale of public offices which had hitherto been so common. The king had placed Dykeman at the head of a commission to prepare a new tax register for Norway, a work which involved the listing and valuation of all real estate in the kingdom. It was an important undertaking, but as it was done with little care, the work when completed suffered from many serious defects, and it was not accepted. It is nevertheless important as a document throwing light on the conditions of agriculture in Norway at that time. During the last ten years of his reign, King Frederick devoted special attention to the revenues of the kingdom, and the paying of the national debt, which had been increasing during the long war. The war indemnity of 600,000 riksdaler paid by Sweden, and the acquisition of the Gator provinces in Schleswig, had been a welcome aid, but as the king succeeded in reducing the debt by several million riksdaler, besides maintaining a large standing army, he found that the revenues were too small in spite of the very heavy taxes and the sale of property belonging to the crown was again resorted to. In Norway the remaining crown lands were sold in smaller parcels, and as the purchasers usually were the renters and tillers of the lands, the class of freeholding bunder was increased by these sales. The king's chief care, however, was to replenish his treasury. The care for the well-being of the individual citizen seemed to be purely accidental. Not only were the crown lands sold, but also the church lands and the churches themselves. With the introduction of the Reformation, the state assumed control of all church property, the idea being that the state should administer it for the benefit of the church. But the kings soon swept the incomes from the church lands into their own coffers. The absolute kings regarded themselves even as the owners of the churches, and when the sale of crown lands was resumed, Frederick IV sold the churches with their lands and revenues to the highest bidder. In all, 620 churches were sold, some to the congregations, but the greater number were bought by private individuals who wished to get possession of the lands and incomes belonging to the churches. The understanding was that the purchasers should spend a part of the revenue in keeping the churches in repair, but as the kings themselves had been remiss in the performance of this duty, it could scarcely be expected that the individual purchasers should be more conscientious, and the churches were most deplorably neglected. A great change was nevertheless taking place in religious life and thought. Pietism, which had been developed in Germany by pious and able men like Johann Arndt and Christian Schriever, was finally promulgated as a regenerated system of Christian faith by Philip Jakob Spener and August Hermann Franke. It demanded that Christianity should not consist only in orthodox Christian faith, but that faith should express itself as a living force in human life and conduct a truth which, together with the strong appeals to the heart and the feelings, and the often undue emphasis laid on the sentimental side of religious life, made pietism appear as a violent reaction against the dead formalism of orthodoxy. The time for such a reaction had come, and pietism swept through the north as a spiritual tidal wave which culminated in the reign of King Frederick's successor, Christian VI. The first important manifestations of the change are noticeable in King Frederick's reign, in a tendency among many of the ablest men to emphasize especially the ethical side of Christianity. Even the king himself inclined towards pietism during his later years, though his lax morals conformed little to the cardinal principles of the new teaching. Pietism awakened a new religious life, which soon manifested itself in a very earnest and successful missionary activity. The two great missionaries, whose work was of special importance, were Hans Egede, who carried Christianity to the Eskimos in Greenland, and Thomas V. Weston, who began missionary work among the Finns in northern Norway. Egede was born on the Lofoten Islands in northern Norway, January 31, 1686. He became a clergyman in these islands, but very early he became enthusiastically interested in a plan to reestablish commercial relations with Greenland and to become a missionary in the old Norse colonies, 
which he thought still existed there. In 1721 he finally succeeded in obtaining from people in Bergen the necessary aid to fit out an expedition. On May 3rd he set sail for Greenland, and landed two months later on the island of Imeriksok, where he founded the colony of Gotthab. The Council of Missions had appointed him a missionary, and the Greenland Company of Bergen had made him manager of the commerce with Greenland, but neither the government nor anyone else understood the importance of his undertaking, and he received but little assistance. Aided by his faithful wife, Gertrude Rosk, Egida labored for fifteen years among the Eskimos under the greatest privations and difficulties. His own words may be placed as a motto over the self-sacrificing life-work of this devoted couple. God's honor alone, and the enlightenment of the ignorant people, has been, is, and shall ever be my sole aim, yes, my heart's constant desire until my death. His hope of finding the old Norse colonists was not realized. He discovered the ruins of their homes and churches, but not a white man was found in the island. But his work was crowned with success both religiously and commercially, and led to the recolonization of Greenland. The Greenland Company was dissolved in 1727, but the king had become interested in the undertaking, and sent other missionaries to Greenland to assist Egida. When his wife died in 1735, Egida left his son Paul Egida in charge of the mission and returned to Denmark. He was created bishop and devoted his remaining years to the writing of several works about Greenland. Hans Egida was an adherent of orthodoxy, but his contemporary, Thomas V. Weston, born in Trondheim in 1682, was strongly influenced by pietism. In 1709, Weston was appointed rector of V.A. Church in Romsdal, and found opportunity to cooperate with several other pietist ministers of that district. This little fraternity, known as Svistjernen, constituted a sort of collegium pietatis. They met to discuss ways and means for improving the people's moral and religious life. They distributed hymn books and collections of sermons among their parishioners, and urged the government to sell Bibles and catechisms so cheap that the people could afford to buy them, an appeal which led to the reduction of the price of Bibles from ten to one Riksdaler. They pictured the ignorance and moral depravity of the people in the very darkest colors, and urged that schoolmasters should be employed, at least one in each parish. Thomas V. Weston writes as follows. The common people are for the most part so little versed in Christian knowledge that they do not even know who Christ is. Many do not believe in the immortality of the soul or the resurrection of the body, while others who are educated are usually given to pride, drunkenness, covetousness, hardness of heart, disregard of God's word, cursing, and breaking of the Sabbath. All this is the kingdom of the devil. Therefore we demand, and Christ through us, that for the sake of the first named, catechizing in schools be everywhere instituted, and that, for the sake of the others, church discipline be revived in its old apostolic vigor, that for the sake of both, priests be appointed who are filled with the Spirit of God, and can set their flock a good example. The demand raised by the pietists for better popular education bore no immediate fruit, but their suggestion and agitation brought the matter to the attention of the government in such a way that steps were soon taken to improve conditions. In 1716, Thomas V. Weston began his missionary work among the Finns, Laps. From 1716 till 1722, he made three trips to Finmarken to bring the gospel to these nomads. The efforts which had hitherto been made to Christianize them had been of small importance, and they were yet almost wholly heathen. Thomas V. Weston urged strongly that missionary work among them should be done in their own language, and he succeeded in organizing a seminarium laponicum in connection with the Trondheim Latin School, where missionaries might be properly educated. When he died in 1727, no one was found who at once could continue his work, but he had opened a new field for missionary activity, and had laid foundations for successful work in the future. In his old age, Frederick IV was wholly converted to pietism, which in his gloomy mind developed into religious pessimism, and a fanatic solicitude for the spiritual welfare of his subjects. He felt that the state ought to take more drastic measures to make people pious and moral, and in 1730 he issued his notorious Sabbath ordinance, which virtually destroyed every vestige of religious freedom. Fines were imposed for not attending church, and those who failed to pay the fines should be pilloried. For which purpose pillories shall be provided by the church owners for all churches where none such are found, says the ordinance. This is the beginning of the reign of fanaticism, 
and the violent interference with people's private life in the interest of religion which characterizes the age of pietism. King Frederick IV died October 12, 1730, at Odense, and was succeeded by his son, Christian VI. End of chapter 40「Chapter 41 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian the Sixth, The Age of Pietism Prince Christian was thirty-one years of age when he ascended the throne of Denmark-Norway. He had been reared according to the strict precepts of pietism, and was morally better trained and also better educated than his father. He was of a retiring disposition, pious and moral, and as his queen, the German princess Sophia Magdalena of Kumbach Bayreuth, shared his views and tastes, they led a felicitous married life. Both physically and intellectually, Christian VI was undersized, thin and small of frame, with a shrill and piping voice. He became easily excited and blushed and stuttered in company, but towards his companions and subordinates he showed his authority even to harshness and pedantry. He was, on the whole, better qualified to enter a monastery than to ascend a throne. He had not traveled, he knew little about military affairs, and still less about finances, and as he had assumed an almost hostile attitude to his father, because of his moral laxity, and especially because of his marriage to Anna Sophia Reventlo, he reversed as far as possible the policy hitherto pursued, even to the extent of discarding its good features. A number of discontented nobles and men of rank who had gathered about the crown prince during his father's reign were now appointed to the highest offices, and became prominent as the king's chief advisers. Baron Ivar Rosencrantz was made chancellor, though without special title, since the office had been abolished. Christian Ludwig Plessen was placed at the head of the exchequer, Paul Leuvenern became secretary of war and navy, and Count Christian Ronsau was appointed stadtholder in Norway. King Frederick's widowed queen, Anna Sophia Reventlo, and all his adherents were made to feel the king's displeasure. Bishop Dijkman of Christiania was dismissed from his office, and a Norwegian, Peter Herschlep, was appointed as his successor. Anna Sophia Reventlo was given a pension, but had to retire from court to her private estate, Klausholm. Christian V and Frederick IV had developed a sort of cabinet system of government, and the colleges created by the ordinance issued by Frederick III, November 4, 1660, had been reduced to mere administrative bureaus. Christian VI revived the old system and raised the colleges to their former importance. In administrative affairs, he seldom deviated from their recommendations, though in his relation to his advisers he maintained an independence which seems out of proportion to his limited talents. Men of real ability he could not tolerate. Many of those whom he had himself appointed to high offices had to withdraw, and even Christian Ronsau, stadtholder of Norway, a generous and highly cultured nobleman, who had become very popular because of his affability and sense of justice, was soon retired on a pension, and the office of stadtholder was abolished. In 1733, King Christian and his queen, accompanied by a large retinue, made a journey through Norway, and the people received the royal pair with great enthusiasm. In the cities, triumphal arches were erected, songs were written to their honor, and everything possible was done to express the profound veneration and loyalty accorded royal personages in those times. The journey across the mountains was made with wagons, but as the roads were still very poor, the progress was slow and difficult. To the people along the route, the entertaining of such a large retinue became a heavy burden, and though the king was highly pleased with his successful and only visit to Norway, the people remembered him as the ruler who took their property without paying for it, and whose visit had only brought them labor and loss. Christian VI evidently meant to rule well. He began his reign by reducing the taxes, but as he knew nothing about economy, he spent with lavish hands the surplus in the treasury which his father had created, and when the money was spent, he was again forced to increase the taxes. His reign was a period of unbroken peace, but the diplomatic relations with foreign nations became a strange medley of weakness, vacillation, and ambitions unrealized, as the king was unable to formulate a clearly defined foreign policy, or to adhere with firmness to a position once taken. His advisers often disagreed, 
some preferring an alliance with England, others with France, and no one seemed to possess the ability or authority to act with energy at the critical moment. In order to safeguard the Gatorp provinces in Schleswig, which had lately been acquired, King Christian formed an alliance with Russia, and signed the Pragmatic Sanction, promulgated by Emperor Charles VI of Austria in favor of his daughter Maria Theresa. Thereby he won the favor of both these powers, who had hitherto favored Gatorp, but an attempt to secure an alliance with Sweden failed. Between France and England a very hostile feeling was developing, which finally culminated in the War of the Austrian Succession, and the struggle between the two rival powers for supremacy in India and America. In 1734 an alliance with England was concluded for three years, but some of the king's advisers favored France, and labored to secure a closer friendship with that power. This made matters complicated, as both powers had guaranteed to Denmark the possession of the Gotthard provinces, and had a claim to the Danish king's friendship and gratitude. But though the relations of the two western powers were delicate, it was of less vital importance than the question which developed in connection with a new struggle between Sweden and Russia. After Tsar Peter's death, the Russian fleet had been neglected, and rival candidates for the throne were maintaining a struggle which paralyzed the arm of the government. In Sweden, the patriotic war party, Haterna, the Hats, had gained the power, and they found the moment opportune for a war with Russia, in which some of the lost provinces might be recovered. In 1741, General Levenhaupt was sent into Finland with an army, and war against Russia was declared. Elizabeth, the daughter of Peter the Great, who was plotting to wrest the throne from the child Tsar, Ivan VI, solicited the aid of the Swedes, and Levenhaupt crossed the Russian border. But before he reached St. Petersburg, Elizabeth had been made Empress of Russia, and she immediately ordered him to withdraw from Russian territory. Instead of acting with energy, the Swedish general concluded an armistice and retreated to Finland, and the opportunity for obtaining any concessions was lost. After a campaign in which they suffered many losses, the Swedes were forced to withdraw even from Finland, which was overrun by the Russians. Under these circumstances, the Swedes had turned to Denmark-Norway for aid, and suggestions were made which filled Christian VI with high hopes. His son, Crown Prince Frederick, might be chosen king of Sweden to succeed Ulrika Eleonora, who died in 1741, and Denmark, Norway, and Sweden might again be united. After the expiration of the treaty with England, 1742, King Christian had concluded a treaty with France, and received from that kingdom 400,000 Riksdaler as a yearly subsidy. He raised the Danish-Norwegian army to war footing, and held the fleet ready for immediate service to cooperate with Sweden in case Frederick should be chosen king. The Swedish peasants were enthusiastically in favor of the Danish-Norwegian crown prince, but Russia supported Adolf Frederick of Holstein Gottorp, and promised to return nearly all of Finland to Sweden if he were elected. When the Riksdag assembled at Stockholm, the Dalkerlian peasants marched in force to the city to secure the election of Prince Frederick of Denmark-Norway but they were dispersed by the military forces of the city, and Adolf Frederick of holstein Gottorp was chosen king of Sweden, July 3, 1743. Christian VI now demanded that Adolf Frederick should formally relinquish all claims to the Gottorp provinces which had been given to Denmark, but even this simple plan of safeguarding his kingdom against undue encroachment of united Sweden and Gottorp he was persuaded to abandon. His diplomacy had failed at every point, his numerous alliances proved to be harmless stage thunder accompanying a political farce, and his enemies had restored the relations existing between Gottorp and Denmark prior to the Great Northern War. But if King Christian was no statesman, financier, or warrior, he had at least the satisfaction of knowing that he excelled in piety. Frederick the Great had remarked that as Frederick IV attempted to conquer Sweden, Christian VI sought to conquer heaven. In his father's time, pietism had been gaining a foothold in the north, and during the early years of the reign of Christian VI it waged a final contest with orthodoxy, which resulted in a complete triumph for pietism, owing largely to the support of the king, who was an adherent of the new movement. Queen Sophia Magdalena was of a pious and melancholy disposition, and as the king himself became devotedly absorbed in religious matters, the gaiety of the court circles soon gave way to the grave and joyless austerity of pietism which forced all social and religious life into stern forms and somber colors. 
The king considered it to be his special mission to drive all his subjects into the sackcloth and ashes of repentance, that as many as possible might escape eternal perdition. And he instituted a vigorous campaign against all forms of amusements which were considered sinful. According to the views of the pietists, nearly all public pastimes were regarded as worldly pleasures. Dancing, smoking, comedies, and operas were categorically condemned, and even laughter was regarded as sinful. August Hermann Franke says, All laughter is not forbidden, for it happens indeed that even the most pious may so heartily rejoice, not over worldly, but over heavenly things, that his lips may show evidence of his mental delight in a faint laughter. But it easily becomes sinful, and paves the way for great distraction of the mind, which soon discovers that it has become too unthoughtful when it again wishes to meekly turn to God. According to these principles, Christmas parties were wholly interdicted, amusements on Sundays and holidays were prohibited, and the playing of comedies on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays was forbidden. It is true, as Edward Holm points out, that the king did not forbid comedies, dances, and masquerades except on the days mentioned, but it is very doubtful if we can infer from this that the people could dance as much as they pleased on the remaining five days of the week. The king created a church college, Kirche Inspections Collegiate, which possessed most extensive powers in matters of church discipline, and the bishops and clergy labored hard to suppress all such amusements. Finally, in 1938, the king issued an order that no comedians, funambulists, jugglers, or operators of games of hazard must henceforth appear in Denmark or Norway to show their plays or exercises. The king's attitude to the players of comedies may also be seen from his letter to J.S. Schulen, dated August 30th, 1735, in which he says, In Glückstadt there are said to be some comedians who pull money out of people's pockets. It would be well if the magistrate were instructed to get rid of them, for nothing good comes of it. In 1735 the king published a new Sabbath ordinance very similar to the one issued by Frederick IV in 1730. Persons who without valid reason remained absent from public worship were fined, and if they were bunder, they should be put in the pillory. That this attempt to teach people Christian piety and good morals by means of the pillory and the police force would breed deceit and hypocrisy is quite natural. Conversation and conduct assumed of a sudden a religious tone, which in too many instances only seemed to hide moral corruption and intellectual dishonesty. Pietism had come as a violent reaction against the moral laxity of the age of orthodoxy, and such a movement usually passes the bounds of fairness and good policy. It is like a fever which reacts against the disease and saves life, but destroys tissue and reduces the vitality. Orthodoxy has failed to lay proper stress on the moral side of Christian life, and moral corruption and rude manners had flourished to an almost intolerable degree. To cure this evil, pietism raised moral life into a prominence which made a deep impression on the age, and greatly elevated its moral tone, but it arrested the growth of dramatic art, destroyed many of the finer features of intellectual and social life, and robbed society of the spirit of optimism and the sense of beauty. It cannot be denied, however, that viewed against the background of what preceded it, pietism represents progress along many lines. It was the first religious revival which the Norwegian people had ever experienced, and through the emphasis which it laid on piety and moral conduct, it chastened the people's moral feelings, and taught them gentleness, temperance, and a higher regard for things spiritual. It gave also a new impetus for intellectual development through a keen interest for popular education. If the people were to become truly pious, they would have to read the scriptures and learn the chief Christian doctrines. The religious instruction which the people had hitherto received had been so meager that few understood even the cardinal Christian teachings, and among the common people it was regarded as a wonder if a person could read. In 1736, confirmation was introduced by law both in Denmark and Norway. In Akershus Stift, it had been introduced in 1734 by Bishop Peter Hersleb. The young communicants were now required to formally renew their baptismal vow before their first communion after being catechized in church in presence of the congregation, to prove that they possessed the required Christian knowledge. About the same time, the important religious textbook, Bishop Eric Pontopidens, Sonhed til Gudfrigtiget, an explanation to Luther's catechism arranged in questions and answers, was introduced. 
As the children were expected to commit these answers to memory, they would have to learn to read, and steps were taken to provide the necessary instruction. By the ordinance of January 23, 1739, about the country schools in Norway, the government attempted to establish a system of public schools and to enforce compulsory attendance of all school children between 7 and 12 years of age. Instructions should be given from 6 to 7 hours daily, at least during 3 months of each year. The school books should be Luther's Catechism, Pontopidon's Explanation, the Bible, and the Hymn Book. The bishops and stiftsamt men were instructed to appoint teachers, and the people were encouraged to build schoolhouses. If no schoolhouse could be provided, the school was to be kept in private houses by itinerant teachers. If this law had been enforced, it would have marked a great advance in popular education, but the people did not understand the value of the reform, and offered such resistance that the government had to substitute a new ordinance in 1741, which made it optional for the congregation to provide instruction for the children. Opposition and indifference had retarded progress, but the bishops and priests could bring great pressure to bear on the people, as they could refuse to confirm the children who did not possess the required knowledge. The resistance was gradually broken, and several public schools were organized before the close of the reign of Christian VI. End of chapter 41《Chapter 42 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mercantilism and the Commercial Stagnation With regard to the economic conditions in Denmark-Norway in the time of Frederick IV and Christian VI, we may observe the futile attempts to increase the wealth and revenues of the realms by enforcing the arbitrary principles of mercantilism by means of despotic royal power. The government assumed the initiative and direction of industrial enterprises, sought to encourage their growth by various artificial stimuli, and exhibited an actively and paternal solicitude which resembled wisdom and generosity, but which was so selfish and narrow that it produced stagnation where it sought to foster new life and activity. Companies organized to trade with the West Indies, Guinea, Morocco, and other distant lands were granted monopolies and other special privileges but at the same time a system of protective tariff, export duties, and the exclusion of various foreign goods subverted the most fundamental laws of trade. Importation of grain to Norway from any other country than Denmark was forbidden, though the supply was often inadequate, the quality poor, and the prices exorbitant. This restriction was especially damaging to Norway's commerce with England, as Norwegian lumber and fish had been exported to England in exchange for grain. The carrying trade was obstructed by the English navigation laws and the mercantile system of political economy everywhere adhered to. Prices on lumber and fish fell, and Norwegian commerce suffered a serious decline. The commercial companies proved to be of comparatively little importance, as the few individuals constituting them used their monopoly chiefly to plunder the colonies with whom they were trading. The Iceland company paid 8,000 riks dollar, and later 16,000 riks dollar for their privileges, and they used their opportunity to fleece the Icelanders. The Asiatic Company carried on trade in India and China, the West India Guinea Company with Africa and the West Indies. The trade with Greenland was granted to a single man, Jakob Severin, who founded the colonies of Christianshab, Jakobshaven, and Fredrikshab. The small and precarious trade carried on by these Danish companies at the ends of the earth could in no way compensate for the general decline in Norwegian commerce. In 1736, the merchant fleet of Bergen was scarcely one-third of what it had been in 1700, and even the carrying of Norwegian articles of export to foreign markets was largely in the hands of the Dutch and English. The efforts of the government, in harmony with the mercantilistic ideas of the times, to encourage manufacture by protective tariff, monopolies, and the subsidizing of various industries failed to produce the results desired. Several minor factories were started, but the depressed economic conditions and the lack of capital and enterprise rendered the attempt to produce a new industrial development an almost fruitless experiment. In Denmark, the peasants were more severely oppressed, especially in the reign of Christian VI, than in any previous period. Frederick IV had abolished serfdom in 1702, 
but this very praiseworthy reform was rendered nugatory by the revival of the old system of compulsory military service, which made it possible for the landed proprietors to virtually enslave the peasants under the pretext of furnishing the required number of men for the army. Christian the Sixth re-established villainage in all Denmark and increased the burdens of military service to such an extent that Regals called the 900 Danish manorial estates plantations with white Negro slaves. No peasant between 14 and 40 years of age was allowed to leave the estate to which he belonged, and the proprietor could even inflict the most severe corporal punishment upon him at will. The lash was in constant activity, says Sars. The system of beating the peasants was so well established that it was practiced even on the estates of humane and kindly disposed proprietors as something necessary which could not be otherwise. It was regarded as a matter of course that the proprietors had the right to inflict corporal punishment on the peasants. Cudgeling was even the least. He could cause them to be thrown into the dungeon. He could put them into the pillory. He could place them in the Spanish cloak or compel them to ride the wooden horse. In short, the greater number of Danish peasants were reduced to the condition of slaves. With good reason, the same author calls the reign of Christian VI one of the worst which Denmark ever had. The freeholding Norwegian bunder could not be subjugated to such oppression. It has already been shown that the number of freeholders had been greatly increased in Norway through the sale of crown lands, and the kings had even shown them special favor, though the old feuds continued to be waged between the bunder and the royal officials. The economic well-being of the bunder would probably not have been impaired, but in 1740 and 1742 crop failures produced a famine which was also accompanied by serious epidemic diseases, so that in the latter year the number of deaths exceeded the births by 16,000. These calamities, together with a serious decline of commerce, made the period one of general depression. End of chapter 42 Chapter 43 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2 by Knut Gershit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Development of Modern Danish-Norwegian Literature, The Age of Ludwig Holberg The Reformation had been accompanied by no spiritual awakening in Norway, and the Renaissance had reached the North only as a faint swell caused by the great revival which it had produced in Southern Europe. No new intellectual life had been kindled in the Scandinavian countries, and the literature still slumbered in its old dusty folds. In the universities and the secondary schools, the learning was chiefly limited to Latin grammar and disputations, a lifeless pedantry from which no new impulses could come, and the same unprogressive stolidity and vain love of display which characterized learning might be observed in all higher social classes. Every imagined preeminence was displayed with arrogant self-conceit. Jealous rivalries, love of empty titles, narrow-mindedness, snobbishness, and a crude imitation of everything foreign and bon ton had become distinct features of the intellectual life of the age. Especially in Denmark, where society had become most thoroughly stratified into distinct classes. The native Danish culture was held in slight esteem, and the mother tongue was so far neglected that persons of quality seldom used it, except when talking to their servants. Robert Molesworth, who speaks from personal observation, says, The king, great men, gentry, and many burghers make use of the high Dutch in their ordinary discourse, and French to strangers. I have heard several in high employment boast that they could not speak Danish. It was the time of Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth, the era of affectation and long wigs. In literature, Peter Das had, indeed, relieved the general dullness, but with this exception scarcely a note of true poesy found its way into the lifeless pages of the verse-makers. Few or no books are written, says Molesworth, in speaking of Denmark. Not so much as a song or a tune was made during three years that I stayed there. In this age of dullness and affectation, Holberg appeared to found in Denmark-Norway not only a new literature, but a new intellectual life. Parallel with the religious awakening which found its expression in the Reformation and the revival of literature, learning, and art in the Renaissance, 
a new astronomy and natural science had been developed, which demanded freedom of thought and respect for human reason as the ultimate authority in scientific investigation. These new movements were parts of the same general progress of the human mind, but as they advanced along diverging paths, scientific thought not only sought to free itself from religious control, but it soon became hostile to revealed religion, and challenged its genuineness and authority. This school of thought, generally known as deism, because it postulated the existence of God, originated in England, and is traceable in its inception to the philosophical writings of Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, though its most prominent representatives were John Locke, 1632-1704, and David Hume, 1711-1776. From England, deism was brought to France, where Voltaire and Rousseau became its chief representatives. It had directed its attack especially against the dominion of the church in the field of scientific investigation, but a similar revolt against religious authority also took place in other fields. Throughout the Middle Ages, philosophy had been regarded as the handmaid of theology, and jurisprudence had been dominated by the principles of the Old Testament and the canon law. The emancipation of these branches of learning marks an important step in the victorious progress of scientific thought. In Holland and Germany, Hugo Grotius, 1583-1645, Pufendorf, 1632-1694, and Thomasius, 1655-1728, developed a new system of jurisprudence, the Naturrecht, based on reason and man's innate sense of justice. And Christian Wolff, 1679-1754, elaborated the critical thought of the age into a rationalistic view of life in his philosophic system based on the work of Leibniz. The ground had thus been well prepared, and the influence of English deism, both directly from England and indirectly through France, soon made itself strongly felt. This system of critical scientific thought and rationalism in religion and ethics, which dominated intellectual life in the latter half of the 18th century, is probably best known by the German name of Aufklärung. Its influence extended to every field of intellectual activity, and expressed itself as clearly in literature and statescraft as in science and philosophy. Frederick the Great applied its principles in his Aufgeklärte Despotismus, according to which he ruled as a benevolent despot. Lessing, the founder of modern German literature and intellectual life, became one of its chief representatives, but passed beyond it in spirituality and broadness of view. In America, Benjamin Franklin became its most noted representative, and no one has expressed the common-sense utilitarian view of the Aufklärung in a more popular way than America's statesman philosopher. In the North, Ludwig Holberg, 1684-1754, became the pioneer in this field of thought. He was a native of Bergen, and received his early school training in his hometown. In 1702, he was sent to the University of Copenhagen, where he completed the required course, and after spending two years at the University of Oxford, and traveling for some time on the continent, he returned to Copenhagen, where he spent five years in writing a number of historical works, through which he introduced into historical writing the rationalistic thoughts of Grotius, Pufendorf, and Thomasius, whom he declares to be his constant pattern. The most important of these works are Introduction til de Europeeski Rigors Historia and Introduction til Natrins og Folkretens Kunskab Udragen af de fornemste juristers, besinderlig groti, Pufendorf og Thomasi Skrifter. In 1714, he was appointed titular professor without salary. Again, he spent almost two years abroad studying, especially in Paris, and finally in 1717 he was made regular professor of metaphysics, a branch which he especially hated because of the pedantry of Latin disputations and learning but it was the only vacancy, and he accepted the position. There he stands, says Georg Brandes, the poor professor of metaphysics against his will and teaches to make a living things in which he does not believe, and with which he can associate no thought, and the black-gowned students in front of him write down the wisdom and commit it to memory, while round about in the lecture rooms the learned corps with profound gravity defends, demonstrates, concludes, and proves the errant nothing. Is not the situation ironical, Mephistophelian, or tragicomic?
Holberg was a keen observer, a deep and critical thinker, and a dramatic talent of the first rank. On his mind, the burlesque of the situation was not lost. He, the representative of the most advanced scientific thought, who had returned from the greatest centers of learning with rich stores of the best knowledge of the age, was not allowed to teach his students anything worth knowing, because the learned circles loved the shadow rather than the substance of knowledge. And was not all society blinded by pedantry and conceit? Did he not meet it on every street corner? Did not snobbishness and pretense make themselves broad in every thoroughfare? He knew but too well the intellectual pride, the mental dullness, the bigotry, the snobbishness and conceit which masqueraded as civic virtue on every hand. Is it a wonder, continues Georg Brandes, if irony becomes the predominant mood of this soul, if a smile, a suppressed smile, curls these lips? Or is it not quite natural that the new professor gets a peculiar impression of this temple of learning, and the land of which it is the intellectual center, yea, of the whole world? It is comical, this world which he now sees. The great master of comedy has seen the foibles and inconsistencies of the age. It stirs his poetic talents and launches him upon his career as a poet. From this time forth he enters upon his life work with as high a purpose as any other reformer, though he undertakes his task with no fervent enthusiasm, but rather with a fixed purpose founded on reflection. The pedantry, the conceit, the social foibles must perish. Mental sobriety, love of truth, and true esteem of the real value rather than the outward appearance of things must be substituted. This is a lesson which the whole people must learn before the professor can mount his cathedra and teach his students anything worthwhile. With superb humor, he began to show the people the comedy of their own lives. If ever a poet held the mirror up to nature, it was Holberg, and human foibles have never been delineated by a more clever pen. He wrote the burlesque epic, Peter Pars, showing the humorous inconsistence of the pretended greatness and the real ability and achievements of his countrymen. It aroused a storm of indignation, but the king was amused by the poem and refused to imprison the author to appease the wrath of the angry citizens. But though the poem created a veritable sensation, Holberg knew that it would be read by few, and he chose the comedy as the more popular and suitable vehicle for his thoughts. Before Holberg's time, no dramatic literature and no real theater existed in Denmark. The old-school comedy had gone out of use, and at court only light operas and French tragedies were performed. In 1721, King Frederick IV dismissed a company of players, two of whom, Montague and Capion, received permission to build theaters. Montague hit upon the idea of building a Danish theater, hoping that this would be more popular and bring a larger income and in 1722 the first Danish theater was opened, an event which proved to be of more than ordinary importance, as it marks the beginning of dramatic literature and art in Denmark-Norway. During the first year, Holberg gave the new theater his five first comedies which were all performed, and before the end of the following year he wrote ten more. In six years, 1722 to 1728, he wrote no less than twenty-eight plays, the masterpieces which have made his name immortal. But the theater yielded small returns, the owners labored under great financial difficulties, and when Christian the Sixth ascended the throne and pietism gained full control, it had to close its doors. It was reopened in 1748, and Holberg wrote his last five comedies. What he might have written in the interval under favorable circumstances may be inferred from his productivity during the years when the theater was operated. But even during that period, he was not inactive. He wrote Nils Klim, a satire on European society in the strain of Gulliver's travels, a church history till the time of the Reformation, and a history of Denmark in two volumes. His work in this field marks the beginning of a new epoch in history writing in the North, but Holberg was not a great historian. He describes events and social conditions without prejudice, in a clear and lively narrative, but he did not devote himself to historic research. He fails to judge each age by his own standards, and establishes the standards of his own time and his own good judgment as the criterion according to which he estimates the value of past institutions and events. He was a dramatist and reformer of the first rank. 
he gave the intellectual life of the North the first great impulse which it had received since the Viking Age, destroyed the old idols of pedantry and conceit, founded modern Scandinavian literature and dramatic art, and launched his people upon a new era of intellectual progress. He began by being a lonely stranger who was against all and all against him, who was unlike all his surroundings, and who differed from them in all respects, but he ended as the master whom all followed and to whom all submitted. What he consigned to forgetfulness was forgotten, and the new which he introduced became the foundation on which Danish-Norwegian intellectual life had been building. J. E. Sars The events of the late war with Sweden, in which the Norwegians had successfully resisted the attacks of Charles the Twelfth, and the fact that Norway could produce men like Ludwig Holberg and Peter Tordenskjold, proved a great stimulus to the national self-consciousness and helped to kindle a new patriotism. Throughout the Union period, Danish influence had dominated all higher culture in Norway. Now the tide had turned, and Norway was giving to Denmark new vigor and in intellectual life. After centuries of dormant inactivity, the Norwegian people were regaining their national and intellectual strength. It was the beginning of a new awakening. End of chapter 43Chapter 44 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 2, by Knut Gjurset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frederick V. When Christian VI died, August 6, 1746, his son, who was 24 years of age, ascended the throne as Frederick V. The prince had been educated by foreign teachers who had not only neglected to interest him in the language of his own people but had even sought to prevent him from learning it an effort in which they had not succeeded frederick had learned to speak danish and he even regarded that language as his native tongue to the chagrin of his german mother who considered it too common also in other respects the labors of his teachers had borne little fruit the pietistic gloom and rigor which surrounded the prince from childhood made him averse to all restraint and when he could escape the watchful eyes of his parents and teachers he abandoned himself to licentious pleasures in company with profligate courtiers who visited low dives and taught him even from youth to lead a life of debauchery in seventeen forty three he was married to louise the daughter of george the second of england a very charming princess but even then he was unable to abandon his vicious habits though the marriage does not seem to have been an unhappy one both king frederick and queen louise were very popular as they surrounded themselves with the danish court and mingled freely with the people the restrictions which had been placed on public amusements were removed the theatres were reopened the people were allowed to return to their old merry ways and the court circles were again made bright by balls and soirees a welcome change from the joyless gloom of the preceding reign the relations to go thorpe which had again become a political question of importance in his father's reign caused the young king some anxiety especially since the successors to the thrones of russia and sweden were both princes of the house of go thorpe it became his first care to bring about a final settlement of this question and to trade oldenburg and delmenhorst for the go thorpe part of holstein so that the southern boundary of the kingdom could become properly rounded out after prolonged negotiations this was accomplished by the treaty of seventeen fifty in which the heir to the throne of sweden adolf frederick of gotorp renounced for himself and his heirs all claims to the island of Fermern and the part of schleswig which had belonged to his family the gotorp part of holstein should be ceded to denmark in return for oldenburg and delmenhorst and two hundred thousand rix dollar if karl peter ulrich successor to the russian throne should die without heirs 
this treaty practically eliminated the troublesome gold torp question from politics and made it possible to maintain friendly relations with sweden the boundary dispute between norway and sweden was also settled norway retained kato kaino and karas yok in thin marken and a commission was established to survey and mark the boundary line throughout its entire length the people had hoped that their liberal-minded and popular king would institute many needed reforms but his suavity of manners was associated with moral weakness and mental ineptitude rather than with originality of thought his irregular life sapped his physical strength and enveloped his mind in the intoxication of sensual pleasures he gradually became unfit for systematic work and the direction of state affairs devolved upon his ministers in seventeen fifty one johann hartwig ernst bernstorff became minister of foreign affairs a position for which he was eminently qualified he was a man of great ability and high character and though only thirty-nine years of age he was an experienced diplomat in the administration of domestic affairs he sought to realize the liberal and benevolent ideas of the auf Klarung to a moderate degree and in his foreign policy he was an avowed friend of peace war he said if begun without valid reason yea without necessity is one of the most deplorable steps which a human being can take during the naval war between france and england in seventeen fifty five caused by the rivalries of these powers in india and america and during the seven years war seventeen fifty six to seventeen sixty three which prussia and england were pitted against austria russia france and sweden bernstoff maintained the neutrality of denmark norway though with great difficulty thirteen thousand five hundred twenty men of the norwegian army were stationed in holland for the defence of the duchies of schleswig holstein and an alliance of neutrality was concluded with sweden according to which the two powers agreed to keep a joint fleet in the north sea to protect their commerce while the baltic sea was to be closed to the war vessels both of england and france this alliance however proved of little value as sweden in seventeen fifty seven joined austria russia and france in their war against frederick the great the protection of commerce against english privateers proved a most difficult task as england regarded nearly all products exported from the neutral kingdoms as contraband of war and the government was loath to resort to drastic measures for fear of becoming involved in the war but with remarkable tact and prudence bernstorff succeeded in saving denmark norway from being drawn into the vortex of the great struggle the new ideas of the Rung began to exert their influence on the more progressive minds and the charm of discovering that there was something besides war and diplomacy which was worth while turned the attention of many to the pursuits of peace bernstorff devoted special attention to the development of trade manufactures arts sciences and agriculture treaties were concluded with turkey and the barbary states which enabled denmark norway to develop an extensive carrying trade in the mediterranean sea and the trade with the west indies began to flourish when the monopoly of the west india company was annulled in seventeen fifty three only seven vessels were engaged in the commerce with these islands but in seventeen sixty six the number had been increased to thirty eight the neutrality maintained during the seven years war contributed greatly to the growth of danish norwegian commerce and the east india company developed a flourishing trade during the war in order to develop manufacture foreign artisans and skilled laborers were employed monopolies and special privileges were granted and the importation of manufactured articles was greatly restricted in these measures the ideas of mercantilism are still clearly noticeable but more attention was also paid to agriculture than hitherto as the ideas of the french physiocrats were gaining ground this new economic doctrine which was tinged with the ideas of rousseau and other french political philosophers who maintained that government exists for the good of the governed that freedom and equality are man's birthright and that a return to nature was necessary if man wished to find true happiness gave the agricultural classes a hitherto unknown importance new sociological ideas were being developed which were destined to produce great changes hitherto these ideas had been scouted as dangerous theories if they had not been regarded as idle dreams but already in the reign of frederick v they were beginning to exert a distinct influence 
in seventeen fifty seven king frederick appointed a commission to examine the conditions of husbandry and to submit recommendations for the encouragement and improvement of agriculture the king's mother queen sophia magdalena abolished villainage on her estate of hirschholm burstoff followed her example and before the close of the reign the liberation of the peasants and denmark had been adopted as the future programme of the government in norway the national awakening created new activity and shaped new demands in many fields in seventeen sixty the first scientific society in norway det trond jemski bedenskab selskab was founded in trondheim by the three distinguished scholars peter frederick Sloom, a dane by birth who had settled in trondheim and the two native-born norwegians gerhard skirning and johann erst gunnerus the historical writings of Sum, especially his history of denmark from the earliest times till fourteen hundred reveals a new scholarly spirit in history writing a love for scientific inquiry which comes to view even more plainly in Schoening's norgus rigus history in three volumes from the earliest times till nine fifty five Schoening has written his work from a norwegian point of view and has advanced a theory of the earliest migrations into norway which was elaborated seventy years later by r kaiser and p a munch the founders of the norwegian historical school a theory which has served as the general basis for the views of norwegian scholars as to the origin and early antiquity of the norwegian people gunnerus was a theologian and became bishop of trondheim but he distinguished himself also in philosophy and mathematics it is noteworthy that this society of scholars devoted much attention to the discussion of agriculture and that several treatises on this subject appeared in the society's journal the stimulus imparted by this new organization to the interest for higher intellectual culture was accompanied also by an active agitation for the founding of a norwegian university some wrote seventeen sixty one in trondhjemski sam linger a periodical published by him in trondhjem in no land in europe are the conditions for the development and spread of the sciences more unfavorable than here since we have not even a university and in seventeen sixty eight bishop gunnerus said in the an address before the society there is no want in norway of patriotic thoughts or of the desire courage and high spirit to do useful and praiseworthy things even at the cost of personal loss but there is lack of effectual encouragement and necessary guidance and direction in many ways we have four cathedral schools but there is in the whole kingdom no public library and no university the journey to copenhagen is long and expensive the greater number of students are moreover poor and howsoever many rich foundations there be at the said university for the benefit of such students all cannot be supported there this is the reason why so many norwegians of this class who on account of the public examinations have been at the university two or three times have scarcely remained longer than a few months this can indeed be called to visit but not to study at the university and every one will understand what great harm this is to the cultivation and development of higher learning in norway in seventeen seventy one soon published an anonymous pamphlet in which he indulges in bitter invective against the danish government for failing to make provision for higher education in norway it seems to me he says that the danes from mean-spirited jealousy and unfounded fear seek to perpetuate ignorance in this country there is no academy no university no public library the norwegians who wish to study must go to denmark several pamphlets appeared urging the founding of a norwegian university and owe gerlof meyer subjected the question to a more systematic examination in two treatises published in seventeen seventy one he argued that though the two kingdoms were so firmly united that they could never be separated yet the question of a university was a matter of national concern to the norwegian people the agitation for a university was becoming somewhat of a national cause but the danish government failed to grant the demand during the following reign the liberal struency favoured the plan but when he was overthrown the government again became reactionary and the matter was dropped the strict censorship of the press which was still maintained in spite of the king's otherwise liberal views also stood in the way of carrying through important measures of reforms two newspapers had been founded in norway norske intelligenssedler which began to appear in may seventeen sixty three and after 
fra addressa conturit e bergen first published in seventeen sixty five but neither paper ventured to speak a word in behalf of national issues or to criticise the course pursued by the government the press had not yet become a factor in political life if the people wished to express their opinion on public measures they still had to avail themselves of more drastic means such as the riots caused by the new tax levy of seventeen sixty two the armed neutrality which had been maintained during the seven years war had cost large sums which together with the support given to manufacture in the form of loans and subsidies as well as the great extravagance of the court had placed the government in great financial difficulty in order to pay the interest and term payments on large loans a new tax of eight skilling was imposed on every person twelve years of age in norway this caused the greatest ill-will and serious disturbances occurred in bergen a force of burnder which was estimated at two thousand attacked the residence of the stift Sentimand, insulted and ill-treated him and forced him to refund them the tax which had been collected in stravanger and christiansen in romsdal and many other places serious riots occurred as the burnder who suffered because of high prices and hard times caused by the war refused to pay the extra tax no very noteworthy changes had been effected during this reign but bernstorff's policy and administration and diplomacy had been liberal-minded as well as prudent and he had given the awakening national feeling an opportunity to grow without exploiting it in the interest of a radical liberalism king frederick v paid a brief visit to norway shortly after his accession to the throne but instead of studying the needs and customs of the kingdom he spent the time in gambling and making merry with his courtiers any higher conception of his duties to his realm and his subjects he never seemed to have entertained he died in seventeen sixty six forty three years of age End of chapter forty four chapter forty five of history of the norwegian people volume two by knut kuriorset this librivox recording is in the public domain christian the seventh and queen carolina matilda the struensi period when king frederick's son and successor christian the seventh ascended the throne amid the plaudits of the populace the truckling seekers of royal favours pronounced the most extravagant panegyrics upon the virtues of the prince whom they declared to be wiser than augustus and better than trajan but thoughtful men who knew the young king shook their heads and mused upon what the future might bring they knew that he was a moral degenerate that his mild appearance and frail physique hid the most unbridled passions that his weak mind might even be wrecked by excess and leave him a mental imbecile if not a helpless maniac christian had not had the good fortune to enjoy proper care in his childhood his mother queen louise died december nineteenth seventeen fifty one before he was three years of age and julianne marie who became king frederick's second queen half a year later does not seem to have had much affection for the motherless child the king was as unfit to watch over his son's early training as he was to govern his kingdoms and the education of the prince was entrusted to count Reventlo, an honest and upright but rude and brutal man the little prince was forced to go to church twice every sunday and to recite at home the contents of the sermons which he had heard if he failed to satisfy the stern count he received a thorough flogging the philosophy of wolf and the deism of matthews tyndall were the subjects which his teachers tried to force into his child mind by diligent application of the rod in three hours he was left without proper care to associate with corrupt courtiers who led him into a life of moral degradation which he learned to hide with falsehoods and deceit the sudden change from a helpless pupil under the dominion of tyrannous masters to an absolute monarch to whom all showed the most obsequious homage did not inspire the seventeen-year-old prince with any feeling of responsibility but only made him feel that the hour of freedom had come at last when he could throw restraints to the winds and plunge into wild pleasures without being obliged to hide his waywardness by clever lies 
to his physician wallert he declared shortly after his accession to the throne that he would rage for two years and rage he did like no other king that ever wore the royal purple in denmark in seventeen sixty six he married princess carolina matilda of england daughter of frederick prince of wales the eldest son of george the second but this political marriage of the seventeen-year-old king to a princess who was only fifteen years old and whom he had never before seen did not in any way improve his wayward private life the society which was found assembled inside the palace walls of christiansburg says his biographer blangstrup endeavoured to the best of their ability to, be, to become a copy of the world whose fame spread from versailles over all europe one meets here the same kind of characters and thoughtless persons the same forms of culture the same frivolous social tone the same moral laxity and this circle of richly attired lords and ladies of the court who move about with the graceful steps of the dance accost one another with flattery and compliments and an affected french esprit despising thoroughly the language and culture of their own country seek to live also according to the rules of convenience and to imitate their model in feelings and ideas as well as in costumes and demeanour it was especially necessary to make marriage the object of ridicule and wanton remarks one cannot read memoirs or accounts of court life of those times without meeting cynical expressions which show how little marriage was esteemed in all higher society love and fidelity in married life was regarded as narrow-mindedness and foolish prejudice christian the seventh had acquired this view of life in the court circles where he had been reared and he openly confessed that he regarded marriage as a burden in company with the mischief-loving and dissolute nobles who became his friends he roamed about in disguise at night visiting low dives breaking windows throwing furniture into the streets fighting with the police and revelling in disorder like the rudest vagabond the capital was horrified but christian smiled in complacent glee over every new escapade like a wayward child his education though apparently thorough and profound was of the most superficial and useless sort he had learned nothing about statesmanship military affairs or finances nor of the conditions of the kingdoms which he was to govern his ministers instead of aiding him to become acquainted with the work of the administration preferred to keep matters in their own hands and bernstorff continued to conduct the affairs of government until he was overthrown by the intriguing strew n c in seventeen seventy as absolute monarch king christian was the personification of sovereignty in whose name every act of government was performed but he exercised no direct influence either on diplomacy or domestic administration in life and thought as well as in manners and appearance he was more like a french coxcomb than a real king the young queen who had been brought to this corrupt court at so tender an age and had been married to a young voluptuary for whom she could entertain no other feeling than aversion and disgust felt lonesome and unhappy after the birth of crown prince frederick january twenty ninth seventeen sixty eight the king treated her with studied disrespect and even dismissed her duenna and first lady-in-waiting lady plesson who attempted to guide the young queen and sought to shield her from the corrupting influences of the court the unhappy relation between the royal pair developed into an open hatred and the ennui and feeling of unhappiness were undermining the queen's health in the spring of seventeen sixty nine when she became really ill the king finally advised her to consult his physician strew and see at first she refused to see the doctor as she feared that he was like the rest of the king's companions and favourites but she finally consented to an interview struensi a german by birth was thirty-two years of age a man of fine learning and appearance who knew the art of being agreeable his culture intelligence and sympathy made a most favourable impression on the queen his visits were repeated and she soon found in his company and conversation the understanding which she had so ardently longed for he brought about a reconciliation between her and the king a help for which she was very grateful she learned to regard him as her true friend and the friendship soon ripened into passionate love the king was rapidly sinking into mental imbecility and struensi who had gained a full control over him was in position to seize the reins which were dropping from his enervated hands on september fifteenth seventeen seventy bernstorff was dismissed from office at the instigation of struensi who now assumed full control of the government together with his two friends rantzau ascherberg and ennevold brunt the king's special favourite and companion count conrad hoke 
was banished from the court a number of the highest officials were dismissed friends of the usurper were appointed to the most important positions and brant was placed in hoke's former position as the king's companion with the duty of arranging all festivities and amusements at court the ge im ek council was abolished the colleges lost their importance in a government by cabinet orders that his orders issued by struensee and signed by the king was substituted in seventeen seventy one struensee persuaded the king to appoint him cabinet minister a position which virtually made him regent with unlimited power he now superseded king christian as ruler and he had already superseded him in the affections of queen matilda that he was her paramour was no longer a secret but the imbecile king who was as incapable of jealousy as he was of love seems to have been well satisfied personal ambition was undoubtedly the chief motive in struensee's daring usurpation of royal power but it is quite clear that he hoped to justify his course in the eyes of the world by doing great things for the realms over which he exercised dominion he was an adherent of the Alf clarung and as soon as he assumed control of the government he introduced a series of reforms embodying liberal and progressive ideas the press was granted complete liberty patriotic and able men were appointed to public office the number of empty titles was restricted and many useless offices and pensions were abolished greater economy was practised at court so that the public expenditures should not exceed the income a stricter control was exercised over public officials and struensi was an avowed friend of religious toleration to us these and similar reforms seem very praiseworthy and necessary but as they were introduced into a society which was as yet unable to understand their value they proved to be in many cases worse than useless productive of nothing but grief and harm to their author Reverdale seems to state it correctly when he says of struensee's activity as a reformer that his aims were high and noble but his methods were often ill-chosen and his worst fault was that he believed that people can be reformed by ordinances it is evident that struensee had launched his reforms without duly considering his chances of success the old bureaucracy was offended by the stricter control of officials the cutting down of pensions and the abolishing of old and useless offices the idlers at court by the introduction of a system of stricter economy and fewer titles the clergy by struensee's religious toleration while the common classes steeped in superstition and illiteracy were none the wiser and probably none the happier because of the attempted reforms the dissatisfied were those who could speak those who shaped public opinion and they took advantage of the freedom of the press to publish lampoons against struensee and to stir up public sentiment against him by giving publication to insipid gossip and malignant falsehoods until he found it necessary to restrict again the freedom of the press the norwegians had remained rather indifferent to struensee's attempts at reforms especially since he had wounded their feelings by dismissing the popular stadtholder jacob benson but they had formulated certain specific demands which seemed to have been favourably regarded by the cabinet minister and after he had remained in power long enough there is reason to believe that they would have been granted to the agitation for a university they added a demand for a separate commercial college for norway and the privilege to found a norwegian bank with a capital of five hundred thousand rigs dollar an institution which must have been sorely needed when we consider the volume of norwegian commerce they also demanded the abolition of the extra tax which had been levied in seventeen sixty two without the people's consent and the revocation of the laws prohibiting the importation of grain to norway from any country but denmark struensee favoured the plan of establishing a norwegian bank but as the directors of the danish norwegian bank in copenhagen opposed it he dropped the matter the laws restricting grain import were not revoked but by special order free importation of grain was allowed for a limited period none of the requested reforms was carried through it this time but they had been formulated as a distinct demand and we cannot fail to see in them an effort to separate norwegian internal affairs from direct danish control struensee's measures of reform revealed clearly the weakness and short-sightedness characteristic of the Alfklarung as social progress was not to originate in the intelligence and patriotism of the people at large but was to be brought about artificially by ordinances issued by an enlightened and benevolent despot no regard was had for the conditions of the society which these reforms were intended to benefit and the sympathy and national spirit of the people were not enlisted in their support struensee was wholly unnational 
he despised danish and used german exclusively like many other despotic reformers of that age he failed to realize that a people's social and intellectual progress must spring from their own national life that the incorporating of new ideas as a living force in the old social organism can be accomplished only by the slow progress of moral and intellectual growth largely because of his misconception of the true nature of reform he failed to carry through even the most moderate and useful measures but his work was not wholly in vain he had brought the liberal views of the Aufklärung from the realm of speculation into the more practical one of statescraft and social reform and had thereby given valuable aid to the progress of liberal political ideas that struensi would be able to exercise permanently his usurped power could not be expected even if he had been a man of far greater prestige and more influential connections but as a mere foreign adventurer he could receive no support from the upper classes who aside from the king exercised all power in the realm he lacked moreover many of the qualities which make men truly great and his lack of prudence and real courage hastened his downfall he had won to his side one important person the young queen who prompted by love hazarded all for his sake but others who might have been won were repelled by his arrogance or offended by his recklessness the moral tone of the court was not improved by struency and he took no care to conceal his relation to the queen emboldened by her affections for the usurper and the spirit of the circles in which she moved she abandoned her former modest ways and indulged in imprudent frolic which gave great offence and became the topic of damaging gossip she appeared in public in male attire she rode her horse a califourchon and played other gay pranks which were little in keeping with the dignity of a queen struency who was now guiding both her destiny and his own ought to have been her mentor as the preservation of her good name should have been a matter of great concern to him if for no higher motive than the promotion of his own selfish aims but instead of wisely restraining her who would gladly have yielded to any suggestion from him we are forced to believe that he was responsible for her conduct that it conformed to his peculiar ideas of liberty and his utter disregard for all institutions ideas and conventionalities which did not represent his own views in the treatment of the king he showed the same lack of foresight and true nobleness though all his great powers were still delegated to him by the king he even encouraged brant to ill-treat the imbecile and helpless monarch these things were soon noised abroad and became effective weapons in the hands of his enemies the rumours that the king was being ill-treated and that the royal family was being disgraced by struency created a storm of ill-will which emboldened his opponents a plot was formed to overthrow him the leader of which was his own faithless friend Ransau, who was aided by owe herg guldberg and queen julianne marie in the early morning of january seventeenth seventeen seventy two after a ball at the court the conspirators gained entrance to the palace and placed struency brant and the queen under arrest the success of the plot was hailed with general delight and the only thought of the leaders was to punish the offenders as severely as possible struency and brant were condemned to death and executed after a trial which was declared by many to be a travesty on justice it is true that the charge of crimen Lysi majestatis could be but lamely maintained against Truency since the king himself had placed him in power and the cabinet minister had performed every official act by order of the king it is also true that gulberg one of the conspirators should not have been made one of the judges at the trial the king might indeed have good reason to feel offended at the prisoners but he had made no complaint though he was finally prevailed upon to sign their death warrants the vindictive character of the prosecution and the barbaric punishment inflicted shows that the conspirators were bent on destroying their opponents rather than securing even-handed justice queen carolina matilda was placed in kronborg castle where she was allowed to communicate only with persons selected for her company her marriage to christian the seventh was annulled by the court a decree which was not only harsh but impolitic and unwise if she had erred she was still infinitely better than her worthless husband who was long since unfit to marry again she had come to the danish court while very young she was given in marriage to a worthless rake she was surrounded from the outset by the evil influences of an immoral court and had fallen into the snares of an artful seducer who in the hours of trouble had won her confidence as a friend and adviser her misfortunes should have 
palliated many of her mistakes but the obdurate judges who could spell wisdom only from the dull letters of the law rendered a decision which could not garnish the corrupt danish court with a virtue which it did not possess but only served to offend her brother king george the third and to awaken among the english people a hostility to denmark norway which may have been responsible for many later unhappy events her divorce and imprisonment were regarded in england as a violation of english national honour and a storm of indignation was aroused a letter in the public advertiser demanded that a fleet should be immediately dispatched to copenhagen to frighten queen matilda's enemies and junius the anonymous author of the famous letters of junius plied his eloquent pen in violent criticism of the northern vandals and the shameless remissness of lord north who according to the writer failed to take energetic measures for her protection it had been the plan of the conspirators to keep the queen in a mild imprisonment at aylborg but when the english government protested they decided to turn her over to the english authorities her dowry of eighty thousand pounds should be refunded her she should retain the title of queen but she had to part with her children who were regarded as members of the danish royal family two english frigates were sent to copenhagen to carry her from denmark on may thirtieth seventeen seventy three queen caroline and matilda sailed away from the land which had witnessed her misfortunes but which still harboured the treasures of her heart she was carried to sell in her brother king george's hanoverian possessions where she was to reside in that city she died may tenth seventeen seventy five twenty four years of age thus ended this drama of which he had been the heroine says professor wittich history could have numbered this high-minded and lovable woman among the worthiest of princesses if destiny had not linked her to so miserable a prince without consulting her heart but even in her delinquencies she rose to a self-denial and a nobility of soul which make her tower high above her surroundings and especially above the man who betrayed her End of chapter forty five chapter forty six of history of the norwegian people volume two by knut gudurset this librivox recording is in the public domain prince frederick and owe herg gulberg a period of reaction after the overthrow of stru and C, prince frederick a half-brother of christian the seventh the son of queen julianne marie became regent but the leading spirit in the government was owe herg gulberg one of the conspirators he was a man of small ability a pedant and reactionary who was carried into power on the crest of the wave of loyalty to the king and opposition to reform which culminated in the palace revolution of january seventeenth seventeen seventy two like every pedant he had a system and it happened to be very acceptable to those who had now gained control and sought to undo every reform which had been introduced by his fallen predecessor he considered the progressive and liberal ideas of the age as idle vagaries and regarded education of the common classes as harmful and dangerous humanity he said can bear only a certain amount of knowledge and each class must therefore have its proper share more than that intoxicates the peasant children he continues acquire knowledge of christianity and their duties they become acquainted with the bible they learn to write and if they must do so to figure a little other knowledge they do not need neither is it profitable for them i shudder for everything else which these flatulent times have taught and with which they would spoil everything he did not openly proclaim the maxim that the subjects exist for the sake of the king but this is the standpoint from which he generally reasoned says sars on the whole his theory of statesmanship was of the most antiquated sort and it is true as his son observes that he was a product of the spirit of sixteen sixty the first concern of the new government was to bring everything back into the old conditions the geheim council was re-established and the step taken by struency to abolish serfdom and to limit the amount of free service to be rendered by the peasants was annulled and the aristocracy were again allowed to lord it over the peasants according to old usage 
a strict censorship of the press was re-established and at court the old abuses and extravagance were reintroduced with the granting of titles pensions offices gifts and gratuities to truckling seekers of royal favours the old mercantile protective system which struency had sought to abolish was again adopted monopolies and special favours were freely employed to encourage various private undertakings and large sums were expended to aid useless commercial and industrial enterprises and the old mercantile spirit the reaction was thorough in its work enthusiastic in its efforts to stop every wheel of progress and to turn the clock of the ages back to the good old days when liberal ideas had not yet disturbed those who possessed all privileges and power but even this reactionary government granted one important reform as struency was a german and the german language was always used at court the overthrow of the foreigner was regarded as a sort of national victory and the use of danish which had been so forcibly brought to the people's attention through the comedies of holberg was now urged as a patriotic demand soon wrote to the king let us again hear our own dear language in your commands you are a dane and i know that you can speak danish let the foreign language be a sign of the vile traitor who was too indolent to learn our language too scoffing to show us so great a condescension on february three seventeen seventy two the german words of command in the army were abolished by royal order and by an order of february thirteenth of the same year it was ordained that danish should be the official language of the realm another important measure sustaining the awakening national spirit was the ordinance of january fifteenth seventeen seventy six in Ferd threaten by which it was decreed that only native-born citizens and those who could be counted equal to them should be appointed to office or to positions of honour in the kingdom but while the government aided and encouraged the national spirit in denmark it pursued the very opposite policy in norway where the national awakening was manifesting itself in many ways when p f soon wrote a brief history of denmark norway and holstein guldberg himself examined the manuscript and cancelled or changed every passage in which the author referred to the equality of norway and denmark returning the mutilated work with the remarks that no norwegian exists we are all citizens of the kingdom of denmark do not write for the despicable christiania raisonneurs such insolent disregard for a people's sentiments and honour can only awaken resentment and strengthen their national feeling in norway guldberg became generally hated his name is enrolled in the index to samlinger till det norske folksprog og history with the remark that he was a learned and narrow-minded statesman the former epithet is probably accorded him from courtesy that the truth of the latter may appear with better grace while guldberg was the leading spirit in the government a p bernstorff a nephew of the older bernstorff was placed in charge of foreign affairs besides the ill-will which had been created in england by the imprisonment of queen matilda the attitude of sweden was also causing alarm king gustavus the third who succeeded his father frederick adolph on the throne of that kingdom february twelfth seventeen seventy one made the royal power almost absolute by a successful coup d'etat august nineteen seventy seventeen seventy two and although he hastened to assure the neighbouring powers that he desired to maintain peace and friendly relations it soon became evident that he planned to gain possession of norway the norwegian army and defences had been neglected since seventeen sixty three and the danish government was well aware that dissatisfaction was widespread in the sister kingdom general huth was accordingly dispatched to norway to take charge of the military preparations of prince karl of hessen who was married to king christian's sister louise was made commander-in-chief of the norwegian army with the understanding that he should reside in christiania where he should maintain a court in order to stimulate the loyalty of the norwegian people the hated extra tax of seventeen sixty two was also abolished to gain their good will active war preparations were now carried on both in norway and sweden in seventeen seventy three denmark norway formed an alliance with russia for joint operations against sweden but empress catherine the second was at that time at war with turkey and no aggressive step could be taken until this war was ended the peace was not interrupted and friendly relations were again established when the northern kingdoms had to defend their rights as neutrals in the great Great naval war precipitated by the american revolution seventeen seventy five to seventeen eighty three 
as soon as the war with america began english privateers seized neutral merchant vessels and brought them to english ports on the charge that they were carrying contraband of war as no rules had yet been established as to what should be considered contraband of war this threatened to destroy neutral commerce especially after france became the ally of the american colonies and the english privateers extended their operations to all parts of the world sweden and holland as well as denmark norway protested against this infringement on the rights of neutrals and the principle that a free ship makes a free cargo was advanced with so much greater force because the english themselves had maintained it against the barbary states it was also urged that a port should be considered blockaded only when all traffic with it was cut off by warships actually present and that all neutrals should be treated alike fearing that an alliance between england russia and denmark norway might be brought about by the negotiations carried on relative to these points sweden proposed a defensive alliance between the three northern kingdoms in defence of their trade but bernstorff who feared that this might lead to war with england did not favour this plan in seventeen eighty catherine the second acting upon the advice of her minister pennon issued a declaration that she would organize a league of all the neutral states for the support of the following points ships of neutrals shall have the right to enter ports and harbors of the nations at war a free ship should make free cargo excepting articles which should be regarded as contraband of war and these should be defined according to the existing treaties no port should be regarded as blockaded unless the blockade was made effective by warships actually present and the decision as to whether a neutral ship had been rightfully seized should be based on these principles these were the same points which bernstorff had already urged and sweden holland denmark norway prussia portugal the two sicilies and even the german emperor joined russia in the proposed league but bernstorff nevertheless signed the treaty with reluctance as he knew that the coalition was directed against england five days before denmark norway entered the league he concluded with england a special treaty in which more favourable rules were made relative to contraband of war but this step offended catherine the second and he was forced to retire from office england did not venture to resist this powerful league of neutrals and the principles which they had laid down were respected throughout the war but they were not accepted as a recognised part of international law the great naval war had none the less produced for the neutral nations quite extraordinary commercial advantages in spite of the losses and impediments due to the operations of privateers the norwegian merchant marine nearly doubled its tonnage during the war and while the total export in seventeen seventy three was estimated at one million three hundred and seventy thousand four hundred and ninety two rigs dollar it amounted in seventeen eighty two to two million eighty four thousand nine hundred and thirteen rigs dollar but the flourishing time times due to this sudden increase of traffic could not last as the return of peace in normal conditions was sure to produce a serious reaction End of chapter forty six chapter forty seven of history of the norwegian people volume two by Knut Gjørset this librivox recording is in the public domain crown prince frederick and a p bernstorff increasing unrest in norway c h r j lothus war with sweden seventeen eighty eight when bernstorff resigned the reactionary government conducted by prince frederick owe guldberg and queen julianne marie became more pedantic than ever and forfeited the respect of all thinking people the support of those who enjoyed the benefits of such a regime created a feeling of security among those in power but a desire for a change was rapidly growing even though the strict press censorship prevented any expression of the spreading feeling of discontent in order to retain their power they delayed the confirmation of crown prince frederick and planned to keep him under the control of the council which consisted of their own partisans but the day came april fourteenth seventeen eighty four when the crown prince being sixteen years old should take his seat in the council as soon as the king was seated the prince read a paper in which he asked him to abolish the council and to appoint as his advisers a p bernstorff rosencrantz Huth and stamp 
amid the violent protests of prince frederick the regent the king was persuaded to sign the document the old regime was overthrown by this well-planned coup de theatre and the greatest excitement prevailed in the palace but the english government as well as a majority of the people of denmark probably felt a secret satisfaction that queen caroline matilda's son had driven from power those who had imprisoned and banished his mother crown prince frederick who now became regent was inexperienced not very gifted and but indifferently educated but he loved fairness and justice and his choice of ministers shows that he favoured progressive and liberal ideas the leadership in the new government naturally devolved on the experienced statesman a p bernstorff assisted by his able associates e schimmel mon c d reven low and christian kolbjornsen he inaugurated an era of reform which may be characterized as a period of social reconstruction though the changes were made with due caution and moderation even as to the theory of government bernstorff entertained very liberal views maintaining that the will of the people should be the king's law a principle which if carried out would make the king the servant of the people instead of the virtual owner of the state but this could be done only by creating a national legislature where the will of the people could be expressed by their chosen representatives and such a reform he probably never thought of or even desired in his work as reformer he was still the benevolent despot whose phrases about the will of the people only indicate his wish to improve their social condition with regard to industry and commerce bernstorff abandoned the old mercantile system and abolished monopolies and special privileges the freedom of the press was re-established and censorship of literature was done away with in his most important reforms which aimed at the emancipation of the danish peasants he was ably assisted by the very competent and liberal-minded christian kolbjornsen this gifted statesman was a norwegian by birth a relative of the kolbjornsen brothers of frederick skald who won fame in the great northern war he had come to denmark in his early youth and became intensely devoted to the doctrines of the rights of man and the liberal ideas of the age liberty he said is nature's first and most glorious gift to the noblest of her creatures no feeling is more deeply imprinted in human nature than the love of liberty it is natural that these ideas should make him a friend of the oppressed danish peasants and when he was made secretary of a commission of sixteen members appointed in seventeen eighty six to examine the whole relation between landlords and peasants he became their ablest spokesman as a result of the recommendation of this commission serfdom was abolished in denmark and the amount of free service to be rendered by the peasants was limited and defined by ordinances issued june twenty seventeen eighty eight and june twenty four seventeen ninety one these reforms which freed the almost enslaved peasants had a tendency to alter social conditions fundamentally they represent the first important step in a new social and economic development in denmark in norway no serfdom had existed and as the bernder enjoyed great social and economic independence there was no need of the kind of reforms instituted in denmark but the struggle which had always been waged between the people and the greedy danish officials grew more intense as the national spirit developed and liberal ideas were disseminated the norwegians had at all times been very loyal to the king whom they fondly regarded as their king but they had also been very intolerant of oppression at the hands of royal officials who were often guilty of extortionate and unlawful practices excessive taxes imposed against the will of the people and harmful trade monopolies which increased the prices on the necessities of life added fuel to the smouldering discontent and when the burnder gathered about their hearthstones they had many grievances to complain of and many a violent clash with the officials to narrate but these clashes never assumed the dimension of a revolt they were isolated occurrences produced by local conditions violent resistance to oppression but no national uprising aiming at independence for even the leaders lacked the scope of vision to conceive such a plan among the many tragic episodes in this more intense than dramatic struggle was a movement in nadens a m t in southern norway in seventeen eighty six and seventeen eighty seven led by c h r j lothus 
the people in that mountain district felt grievously oppressed by the heavy taxes and the rapacity of the officials as well as by the laws governing the importation of grain which had increased the prices on that commodity a commission appointed to examine into the causes of the almost incessant complaints gave a very gloomy picture of the situation a report in which the popular foged whiteman also concurred states we unite our prayer with that of the foged and recommend the people to your majesty's favor as long as they could they willingly paid but inability is no crime the commission also found that the royal officials had oppressed and wronged the people by extortionate charges and two judges so very were removed from office a sufficient proof that the complaints were well founded with the return of peace after the american revolution norwegian commerce decreased hard times followed and the large numbers of unemployed in the coast districts helped to swell the general discontent the oppressed people soon found a leader and spokesman in c h r j lothus a bond in moland among his neighbors he was highly respected and well known for his energy and intelligence but also for the tenacity with which he defended his legal rights lothus would go to denmark and complain to crown prince frederick of the government officials in his district but although bernstorff had said that the people's will should be the king's law the ordinance of sixteen eighty five forbidding the norwegian bender to petition the king on the penalty of a loss of liberty and property and the royal edict of seventeen forty four which threatened any norwegian who came to denmark with a complaint or petition not signed by the entmond with imprisonment in the citadel still threatened with destruction any one who ventured to bring the people's will to the attention of the government in copenhagen but the norwegians had confidence in the king's good will for it had often happened that he had heard their complaints and had granted them relief without paying attention to the unjust laws in seventeen eighty five the people of telemarken and other districts sent three representatives to copenhagen to petition the king for redress of grievances and the following year hans kolstadt was sent on a similar mission the government did not punish them the tall men in uniform who served as the king's bodyguard were their countrymen the norwegian people's courage and love of liberty had inspired respect in denmark they were allowed to return home and the government instructed the fogids in norway that they should be guided in their charges by the tax lists and the rules of regulating fees in seventeen eighty six lothus went to denmark with a written complaint bearing three hundred and twenty nine signatures the crown prince received him in audience and after having heard the complaint told him that more conclusive proof would be required lothus returned home and had a meeting with those who had resigned the complaint and received from them a certificate of the genuineness of the signatures and of his own appointment as a special delegate to the king with these documents he returned to copenhagen but he met the same objection as before the crown prince however gave him his word of honour that if he could furnish adequate proof the matter would be investigated lothus returned home and acting as a self-constituted tribune of the people he assembled meeting of the bender in his own home and travelled about from place to place to collect evidence and to secure new signatures this activity was considered by the authorities of the districts to be rebellious and steps were taken to arrest him but as he was aided by the bender he was able to elude the officers and to continue to hold secret meetings with the people at the meeting with the aunt mond the bender demanded that lothus should not be arrested and that he should receive a passport to go as their representative to copenhagen a request which was finally granted in october lothus started for copenhagen with the signed document in company with thirty men who should act as witnesses but the entmond notified the government about what had happened and said that lothus had organized a very dangerous uprising the government immediately issued orders to the entmond to arrest lothus and place him in the fortress of christian sen and the chief of police of copenhagen was instructed to seize him and his band if he had already arrived in the city in the meantime lothus and his thirty companions marched along the swedish coast towards helsingborg where they would cross the sound to denmark when they arrived in that city they learned of the orders issued for their arrest lothus sent a number of his men to denmark to secure a safe conduct but before their return he decided to start homeward with a few followers as soon as he arrived in Neddenis, the antman 
made strenuous efforts to arrest him but through the people's aid lothus always evaded his pursuers the bender gathered in large numbers to defend him but no acts of violence were committed and there is no evidence that they had any rebellious intentions in the meantime lothus companions who had been sent to copenhagen had secured a safe conduct for their leader and a royal commission was appointed to investigate the troubles in nedenis this commission assembled in christianzen and loftus together with a large number of bender met and submitted their complaints supported by most damaging evidence against the accused the commission found the charges to be true they found the people to be peaceful and loyal and they did not get the impression that loftus was a dangerous character but judge smith and captain hammer together with a lawyer salveson formed a secret plot to arrest loftus who wandered about in the neighbourhood and sometimes returned to his own home for a short visit watching their opportunity they fell upon him with a band of armed men bound him and threw him into a boat in a raging storm they escaped from the angry bender who pursued them and succeeded in carrying their prisoner to christiania where he was imprisoned in the fortress of akershus five years he spent in this dungeon before the court finally decreed that he should remain in prison for life probably as unjust a decision as a judicial tribunal ever rendered an appeal was made to the superior court and that tribunal after deliberating seven years upon the final verdict sustained the decree of the lower court two years after the defendant had breathed his last in his prison cell at arcosus the unjust officials who were the cause of the deplorable affair escaped with light punishment two of the worst offenders the judges smith and bernsdorf had to pay a fine together with the expenses of the trial the diocesan prefect adler was removed from office and pensioned the rest escaped all punishment those who had arrested loftus were liberally rewarded such a miscarriage of justice is explainable when we bear in mind that the government officials of whatever title constituted a bureaucracy consolidated by intermarriage friendship and common interests into a distinct social class the extortion and corruption of which some might be accused were perchance practised in a greater or less degree by all and when an offender was made to answer in a court consisting of his own friends and colleagues the procedure was usually a hollow mockery when the bender were goaded to open resistance the officials used their power with vindictive harshness to terrorize them and keep them at bay hence the deep-rooted hatred and the intense struggle between the two classes which never ceased until the norwegian bureaucracy had disappeared the disturbance in which loftus had become the central figure made a deep impression in norway it was a local affair like many a similar episode but it occurred at a time when the national spirit was awakening when the atmosphere of despotic europe was surcharged with ideas which struck at the very root of the old regime and when destiny had brought the hour of national freedom closer to the norwegian people than they supposed it took place even with the dawn of the great national daybreak some light of which was later reflected upon it the episode ended in a groan of pain but it stirred the people's spirit and taught them to understand the value of independence the political situation might have given it an even greater significance if the moment had been opportune we have observed that the desire for national autonomy in educational and business affairs had grown strong in norway that liberal ideas were spreading among the upper classes and that the bender were growing more restive than ever under the irksome burdens placed upon them by the bureaucracy gustavus the third of sweden had long entertained the hope that he might be able to profit by these circumstances and some day gain possession of norway he had for many years carried on a secret agitation in the eastern districts of the kingdom but at the time of the mentioned episode he was inactive had the lothusian movement happened fourteen years earlier or four years later says overland there might have been danger for the danish norwegian state gustavus the third watched events in norway very closely and even appointed a consul general in christiania to act as a secret diplomatic agent for the purpose of strengthening the pro-swedish sentiment but a visit of crown prince frederick in seventeen eighty eight and the removal of the restrictions on the importation of grain by the ordinance of january sixth of that year tended to satisfy the always loyal norwegians though their demand for a bank and a university had not been granted king gustavus the third was now planning to attack russia in the hope of regaining southern finland as catherine the second was engaged in a war with the turks 
denmark norway had formed an alliance with russia in seventeen seventy three but without being able to secure the neutrality of his near neighbour gustavus invaded finland and laid siege to nyslot and Fredericham the russian troops had been withdrawn from the northern provinces and even st petersburg had been left without a garrison but no attack could be made on the capital after the swedish fleet had failed to gain a decisive victory over the russians at hogland july seventeenth this undecisive battle and the tiresome siege of frederickshand caused great dissatisfaction in the swedish army the higher officers organized a mutiny and gustavus was forced to give up the campaign he returned to sweden punished the offenders and by a new coup d'etat he gained even more absolute power than before by the treaty of alliance denmark norway had engaged to assist russia in case of war but it was now recognized that any increase in the power of that steadily growing empire would be prejudicial to the safety of the whole north bernstorff was aware of this and granted grudgingly the least assistance possible under the terms of the treaty a norwegian army of twelve thousand men under prince karl of hessen was sent into bohuslen to make a diversion on the swedish border crown prince frederick who had become enthusiastic over the opportunity of participating in a war accompanied the army after a minor engagement at kvistrum bro where a swedish detachment was captured prince karl intended to seize Gothenburg, but as england and prussia threatened to intervene the norwegian army was withdrawn from swedish territory and peace was restored in november seventeen eighty eight the struggle between sweden and russia was renewed in seventeen eighty nine but although gustavus won a great and naval victory in the svensk sund july nine and ten seventeen ninety where he captured thirty ships and six thousand men he was unable to pursue his advantage and the outcome of the war was doubtful the events of the french revolution had also made a deep impression on the imaginative king he hastened to conclude the peace of verella on the basis of status quo and proposed an alliance with russia against the revolution gustavus the third was bitterly offended at the danish government because of the aid which it had given to russia and when peace was restored he renewed his agitation in norway through his favourite armfelt and his secret agent manderfelt who was stationed in copenhagen he entered into negotiations with a few norwegians who desired independence of denmark karsten tank and three others met the swedish agents march eleventh seventeen ninety but their meeting which was repeated later at karlstad produced no definite result armfeldt said of tank that he was a man whose head was full of political sophisms and enthusiastic ideas of liberty and king gustavus suspected undoubtedly with a good reason that what the norwegians desired was not union with sweden but independence and a republican government the ideas of the french revolution had found adherents also among the norwegians who desired separation from denmark not for the purpose of joining another foreign kingdom equally despotic but in order to establish republican freedoms according to their own ideas why then should he support them when he had made it his special aim to combat the french revolution in seventeen ninety two king gustavus was shot down by an assassin and all swedish agitation in norway ceased End of chapter 47The separatistic tendencies and growing national spirit in Norway, of which distinct manifestations have been observed especially in connection with the agitation for a university, comes even more clearly to view in the literature of the later half of the eighteenth century. Ludwig Holberg, who by his reformatory activity and great genius became the founder of modern Danish-Norwegian literature, had introduced the new thought and liberal ideas of the Aufklarung and had brought intellectual life in the north under the influence of french and english thought in his day the new movement was still in its beginning but in the field of history philosophy and politics a school of young writers such as j s sneedorf and p f sum followed the paths which he had discovered and became the disciples of the great french writers especially of montesquieu 
so sudden was the change that holbrook in his old age grew somewhat alarmed over the movement which he had started and began to revise some of his earlier expressions regarding the placidity and moderation of his countrymen sars points out that in one of his epistles holberg refers to an earlier description of the danes as a people who do not easily go to extremes but generally walk in the middle of the road a description which was considered true at the time as the danish people actually possessed such a trait but if the work should again be published says the author we would have to add a footnote stating that in the last twenty or thirty years they have changed characters so completely that they are no longer recognizable that the leaven had begun to work became manifest in the growing unrest and increased intellectual activity and as it produced a new era of development it also brought to light a difference in temper and character in the peoples of the two kingdoms which would soon bring about a dissolution of the literary partnership which had hitherto existed holberg who was a norwegian by birth that but had done his great life work in denmark had pointed out this difference with characteristic keenness of observation the danes he thinks have a strange modesty and are inclined to follow the middle path while the norwegians are haughty and like the english inclined to go to extremes that the free unfolding of the native traits and tendencies of each people should produce an ever-increasing divergence between them is quite natural holberg's cosmopolitan interests and broad scope of vision made him look upon danish norwegian literature as a possession common to both peoples in which a slight difference in national spirit could be left out of account but these irreconcilable traits of national character soon entered into the new development as a most important factor the trend of literary progress was soon to be determined by two distinct kinds of foreign influence which divided the writers into two camps as they associated themselves with one or the other of the two prevailing tendencies in seventeen fifty one the german poet klopstock was invited to copenhagen where he stayed for twenty years and became the centre of a large circle of german and danish admirers many sought to imitate his bombastic odes and his declamatory pathos such homage was paid him by his enthusiastic adherents that he exercised the influence of a literary monarch his most important disciple was the gifted poet johannes ewald who became the chief exponent of german influence in denmark ewald and his followers organized de danske literatur sixkab and this circle of young poets sought to give the views of their leader full currency in danish literature but while the german influence gained preponderance among the danish poets the norwegians continued to look to england and france for their models the first english novelists and especially the fervid and imaginative description of nature in the seasons of james thompson had kindled an enthusiastic love of nature which in germany norway and elsewhere created a new literary taste even rousseau had gathered ideas from this source and his slogan return to nature was in perfect accord with the views of the english poets in norway christian bronman tulin wrote a long descriptive poem madigan in the strain of thompson's seasons measured by modern standard it is a production of no exceptional merit but in the midst of the insipidity and dullness of the literature of that day it was hailed with enthusiasm as a literary event of the first magnitude tulin who represented the english french influence as truly as ewald represented the german had hoisted the standard about which the norwegian poets were to rally in opposition to ewald and his party in copenhagen the norwegians organized in seventeen seventy two dead norske selskab a literary club which numbered among its members johan nordahl brun niels krog brendel claus fasting johan harman wessel klaus freeman and his brother peter freeman jens sedlitz jonas rhyme and others even the names of the two societies which had suddenly appeared as rivals show that national spirit no less than literary taste tended to bring about a gradual separation of danes and norwegians in the field of literature and the poetry written in the two clubs was soon to dispel all doubt on this point 
ewald chose for many of his productions national themes as in the drama rolf craig and pointed the way to danish heroic tradition and early history the norwegians lauded in patriotic songs of the freedom and grandeur of their country johann nordahlbrunn the most ardent patriot said in a song to norway the motherland of heroes that the norwegians would some day awaken and break all chains and fetters these fetters could only be the union with denmark but it is possible that extravagant expressions of this sort were little more than rhetorical flourishes the norwegians prided themselves no less on their loyalty to the king than on their love for their fatherland whose ancient glory they had just begun to discover but an era of storm and stress had come when great feelings were expressed in vehement language while the ideas had not yet clarified themselves into definite principles a higher intellectual life had been kindled a new patriotism had been awakened among the higher classes who possessed learning and ability enough to speak for the whole nation who could view the life of their people in its historic aspect they knew that norway had been great in the past and felt sure that its vigour would return that it would rise again from dependency to new national greatness the thought was inspiring intoxicating their patriotic songs grew as vehement as their enthusiasm was intense they had no specific aim no definite plan but they felt their own worth and knew that their countrymen if given a fair opportunity would attain a position no less honourable than that which they had occupied of old this conviction found support not only in memories of the past but in the conditions of their own age were not the norwegians a free people throughout the whole union period as compared with the danes and were they not lauded for their courage and their irrepressible love of liberty had they not shown that they possessed both vigour and talent the members of det norska selska had not forgotten that torden skjold adelaer and wheatfelt were norwegians that ludwig holberg the greatest genius of his age in the north was their countryman that in the danish capital their own club embraced with the single exception of ewald the best poetic talent in the realm there was the incomparable satirist vessel the rare epigrammatist fasting the fine lyric poet klaus freeman the noted johann nordahlbrunn and many others who added lustre to the literature of this period as they were fully conscious of these things there was from the start a ring of victory yea often a boastfulness in their lines they might write dramas according to french models as did brettel and brunn and they might like fasting use their keen wit in epigrams or in biting satire like vessel who destroyed the french dramatic influence in danish norwegian literature by his incomparable parody kaya lied uden stromper these things were of importance in literature but their songs to liberty in norway their poems about the norwegian people about mountain scenery and country life in their own native land touched the hearts of their countrymen in a different way they gave the people the opportunity for the first time to sing out in bold triumphant tones their love of liberty and fatherland the verses lived in their lives and traced deep sentiments on their hearts it was the first lesson in true patriotism though often offensively bombastic and faulty enough when measured by the highest literary standards these songs were of greater importance than the more sumptuous literary efforts of the age besides the patriotic songs a new kind of popular poems began to appear written in the strain of the folk songs many of brune's best productions and several collections of songs by claus freeman belong to this kind of popular lyrical poesy especially noteworthy is also the collection of poems gudbrand's dalska Wieser by edward storm these poems are written in the norwegian vernacular and describe home love and nature with fervent sentiment and great accuracy of local colouring the author also wrote many popular ballads of which the best known is sinclair's vice many songs written by these poets are so truly national both in spirit and contents that they have continued to live among the people as real folk songs of such may be mentioned brunes bor yeg pa det why he yelled for norga gamper's fertiland klaus freeman's aunt of the leader den fiskermont sa knitter yeg tread edward storms as ha yort kiva gerurist schoolde marke gernast snedneyogen brana and many others 
though linked to denmark with every tie of loyalty the new school of poets had become ardent norwegian patriots they had rediscovered the true fountains of song and had expressed with beauty and truthfulness the inmost thoughts and feelings of their people relative to home nature and fatherland in denmark they had exercised so predominant an influence upon literary life and had developed in their poetry so distinct a national spirit that as l dietrichson says it must have been evident to all at the end of the period that a nation not a province spoke through the norwegian poets the growing national sentiment received support also in the norwegian press which began to develop in this period the first norwegian paper of any importance was the christiania intelligent Sedler founded in seventeen sixty three the paper was a weekly but prior to eighteen fourteen it took no definite stand in political matters in eighteen o five it began to appear twice weekly and in eighteen thirty it became a daily trond jemske samlinger of philatelitis a literary and scientific periodical published in trondjem by p f shum was founded in seventeen sixty seven and in seventeen seventy five hans storm and Sernmer began to publish till kuskuren pa landed a periodical which was printed in copenhagen in bergen a number of periodicals were founded but they were generally short-lived and of little real importance a publication of high merit was claus fasting's provincial blade published in bergen from seventeen seventy eight to seventeen eighty one in eighteen o eight the poet jonas rhind became clergyman in bergen and together with christian magnus felsen and hermann foss he began the publication of den norska till skewer end of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of history of the norwegian people volume two by knut Gjurset this librivox recording is in the public domain revolution and despotism denmark norway's foreign policy seventeen ninety two to eighteen fourteen the liberal ideas which had broken through the crust of eighteenth-century despotism had created a feeling of unrest which was rapidly spreading over all europe serious attention had been paid to the conditions of the common classes who were yet drudging under feudalistic oppression and a desire had been awakened for greater freedom and better social conditions the neglected and enslaved masses had begun to feel that the hour of liberation was approaching and poets and thinkers were dreaming of the millennium which would be ushered in when liberty and justice should regenerate the world the charm of the new ideas regarding liberty and equality of social regeneration and the rights of man the self-evident truths regarding the injustice and iniquity of oppression and corrupt social institutions so eloquently and fearlessly proclaimed had for a moment touched all hearts as if a new revelation had suddenly burst upon the age even the despots themselves had become benefactors of the people the french revolution brought this feeling to a climax grey-haired scholars became enthusiastic and those who possessed learning and foresight enough to interpret the meaning and possible results of political events hailed it as the coming of that new era of which poets had dreamed and sages prophesied but the crowned heads and the privileged classes who were entrenched in power suddenly grew alarmed when they realized that the first sacrifice demanded for the attainment of this new social felicity would be their own privileges and despotic power to them the revolution was a rude shock which awakened them from their dreams the cherub of liberty had suddenly changed into the demon of rebellion they forgot their quarrels and hastened to unite to arrest the spread of so dangerous a movement revolution became the terror of the age and every liberal idea yea every useful reform was soon classified as revolt against established authority no one felt more alarmed than gustavus the third of sweden he hastened to terminate his war with russia and on october nineteenth seventeen ninety one he concluded a treaty with the russian empress catherine the second for joint operation against the french revolution his untimely death prevented him from carrying out his plans and catherine the second was rather indifferent as she was still occupied with the war with turkey but austria and prussia had also formed an alliance to oppose the revolution and on april twenty seventeen ninety two king louis the sixteenth was persuaded to begin war against these powers 
the two allies tried to prevail on the lesser powers to join them in a general coalition against france and denmark norway was also invited but bernstorff declined as he held that every nation ought to have a right to determine for itself its form of government and that foreign powers had no right to interfere with the internal affairs of france an invitation extended by catherine the second of russia was also declined the fate of poland convinced bernstorff that the great powers would not hesitate to swallow up the smaller states at the first opportunity and he saw that their only safety lay in neutrality in the great struggle which had begun but to remain neutral became difficult enough especially after england and holland joined the enemies of france after the execution of louis the sixteenth commerce was exposed to the greatest dangers and slight regard was paid by the belligerent powers even to the limited rights which neutrals were supposed to have catherine the second of russia who had maintained that the flag protected the ship and its cargo that the blockade of a port in order to be respected must be made effective who in seventeen eighty had organized the great coalition for the protection of the rights of neutrals now boldly announced that she had discarded these principles that the neutrals would be given the choice of discontinuing all trade with france or of joining the coalition against that country france was to be starved into submission it was a piece of perfidy characteristic of that age of dishonest diplomacy and disregard of pledges and treaties in order to enforce her demand catherine sent a fleet of thirty war vessels to denmark and announced both in stockholm and copenhagen that this fleet would cruise in the north sea and seize all ships sailing under the french flag that the ships of neutrals sailing to french ports would be searched and turned back england took a similar stand but bernstorff could not be intimidated he told both england and russia that their demands would not be complied with and danish norwegian ships continued to sail the russians did not molest them in spite of the threats which had been made but the english continued their old practice of sending out privateers to prey upon neutral commerce after the death of gustavus the third the relations between sweden and denmark became more friendly duke karl of surdermanland king gustavus brother who became regent during the minority of the crown prince was less gifted but more careful than his brother and as he was anxious to maintain the neutrality of sweden a treaty of alliance was concluded between sweden and denmark norway in seventeen ninety four they agreed to make the baltic sea neutral waters and to place a joint fleet in the north sea for the protection of their commerce but the treaty should not include the german provinces of the two powers as these could not be kept neutral the relations with england grew very strained as the english continued to annoy the allied northern kingdoms with all sorts of unreasonable demands among others that proof should be given that the cargoes carried by their ships were their own property that french privateers should be excluded from norwegian harbours etc the english ambassador to denmark norway Hales, was also a very impudent and disagreeable gentleman but the presence of the joint fleet of the neutrals had a tranquillizing effect and as the english became gradually more reasonable a hostile collision was averted the results obtained through bernstorff's wise policy of neutrality and alliance with sweden and the evident danger to weaker states as illustrated by the fate of poland changed the hatred and mistrust between the northern kingdoms into a feeling of friendship the idea that the three sister nations should draw closer together and long been growing and eloquent political leaders advocated a distinct scandinavian policy which should secure the permanent co-operation of the three kingdoms for their own protection in an address before the scandinavian club nordiska forenning in london january twenty eighth seventeen ninety two the danish historian f sneeddorf said in speaking of the political situation in the north you will notice that russia has gained control of the commerce of the black sea and it is no imagined danger if you fear the same in the baltic when germany and russia he continued join hands across the baltic sea it will be too late for us in the north to unite there will then be nothing left for us but to die or to hide among the mountains even as our fathers hid behind their shields and to disappear as states but what power can be dangerous to a united scandinavia our mountains our islands our united fleets our severe climate our love of liberty of our fatherland and our kings will make it impossible for any power on earth to deprive us of our independence similar thoughts were expressed by many others notably by the danish statesman owe herg gulberg the norwegian poet zedlitz and the swedish poet franzen in seventeen ninety six det skandemanovska 
literate selska was organized to foster a closer literary fellowship in the north but it numbered only forty members and although it continued to exist till eighteen forty it was never popular and did not exercise any important influence this pan scandinavian movement had emanated chiefly from denmark the swedes remained rather indifferent and among the military officers and the higher classes the old jealousy and ill-feeling had not wholly disappeared even the relations between the two governments were not as cordial as might have been expected since the swedish regent seemed unable to avoid political indiscretions by which he irritated both catherine the second and england the most serious of these was the recognition of the french republic in seventeen ninety five a step which greatly increased the gravity of the situation for the neutrals the first coalition against france was broken up that same year and prussia and spain withdrew but england austria and sardinia still continued the struggle and catherine the second of russia declared her willingness to join them under these circumstances it was as necessary as ever for the northern nations to cooperate in the defence of their neutrality catherine the second sought to force them apart she attempted to persuade denmark norway to join the coalition and made very tempting offers but bernstorff declined though the situation was growing more difficult than ever in seventeen ninety six he recognized the french republic but this proved to be of no advantage as the french also began to send out privateers to prey upon neutral commerce the right of search claimed by the english and the slight regard for the precarious rights of neutrals made the situation almost unbearable but bernstorff who regarded war as the greatest calamity which could befall a nation clung tenaciously to his policy of peace the foreign policy of sweden which was now conducted by the minister of state ruder home continued to be vacillating he abandoned the policy of gustavus the third and sought an alliance with france when this failed he attempted to win the friendship of russia by the marriage of the crown prince to alexandra a granddaughter of catherine the second but the match failed because of a disagreement regarding the right of the future queen to worship according to the greek faith in november seventeen ninety six the swedish crown prince became of age and ascended the throne as gustavus gustavus the fourth catherine the second died the same month and no further attempt was made to establish closer relations between the two nations in seventeen ninety seven the great statesman bernstorff died an irreparable loss for denmark norway in those critical times the crown prince appointed as his successor his son christian bernstorff an able and humane man who lacked his father's experience as a statesman by his remarkable italian campaign napoleon bonaparte forced austria to conclude peace at campo formio seventeen ninety seven but england continued the struggle and a second coalition was formed the following year the war was renewed and the commerce of the neutral northern nations was so harassed by the english french and spanish privateers that every merchant vessel had to be convoyed the eccentric emperor paul of russia who had succeeded his mother catherine the second on the throne also assumed a most threatening attitude towards denmark norway and the government finally yielded to his demands and joined the coalition against france actual hostilities were however avoided bonaparte who at this time returned from egypt and made himself first consul maintained friendly relations with the northern kingdoms and also with emperor paul of russia who had already changed his mind and had suddenly become very hostile to england the situation though not much improved was no worse than before and prudent statesmanship would have adhered to the course so successfully pursued by a p bernstorff but the government arranged instead a new alliance of neutrality between denmark norway sweden russia and prussia and reaffirmed the principles of the rights of neutrals which had been formulated by a p bernstorff and catherine the second the step proved to be a mistake as it aroused the resentment of the english government which regarded the new alliance as a coalition hostile to england in march eighteen o one an english fleet of fifty-three warships under admiral hyde parker with lord nelson second in command was sent to the baltic that war was imminent was now apparent but sweden had neglected to make preparations and denmark norway had to meet the attack of the great english fleet alone on march thirtieth the fleet passed the sound and took up a position before the copenhagen roadstead where the danish norwegian fleet was anchored wholly unprepared for active service on april two eighteen o one was fought the battle of copenhagen one of the most memorable struggles in the history of denmark norway
admiral nelson with the main fleet of thirty-five ships one thousand one hundred and ninety-two guns and eight thousand eight hundred and eighty-five men were ordered to attack the danish norwegian fleet which was much smaller both in size and armament the part of the fleet retained by parker under his own immediate command should act as reserve the battle grew furious as the combatants fought at close quarters and no attempt was made to withdraw a vessel from the battle line until it was almost demolished the danes and norwegians suffered terrible losses but they entertained no thought of yielding seven english vessels ran aground and many were severely damaged the outcome of the struggle seemed very problematic and as the whole english fleet was in the gravest danger admiral parker signalled to nelson to stop the battle and retreat but this humiliation nelson would not suffer he put the field-glass to his blind eye said he could see no signal and let the battle continue in order to bring the combat to a speedy close he resorted to a clever stratagem he dispatched an officer with the following letter to the crown prince who was watching the battle from the shore lord nelson has instructions to spare denmark when no longer resisting but if the firing is continued on the part of denmark lord nelson will be obliged to set on fire all the floating batteries he has taken without having the power of saving the brave danes who have defended them a second letter was dispatched immediately after the first in which he stated that he made this appeal from humanitarian motives that he would regard it as the greatest victory he had ever won if his flag of truce might be the signal for a permanent and happy union between his sovereign and the king of denmark the thread in the first letter was of course only a ruse but he succeeded in disheartening the crown prince who immediately ordered a flag of truce to be hoisted the last great battle in which the danes and norwegians were destined to fight side by side was over and a preliminary peace was concluded april ninth the alliance with russia had only brought war and disaster and denmark norway had good reasons to feel that they had been left to shift for themselves at a critical juncture on march twenty three emperor paul was assassinated and his successor emperor alexander i concluded a treaty of alliance with england without consulting the other allies waiving nearly every right claimed by the neutrals but even under these circumstances denmark norway felt compelled to join the new alliance in order to recover their lost american and asiatic colonies which had been seized by england in eighteen o two peace was concluded between france and england at amiens but both powers felt that it could be nothing but a truce and a year had scarcely passed when hostilities were renewed the danger to denmark now became more imminent as bonaparte seized the electorate of hanover which belonged to the king of england the theatre of war had thus been moved closer to the danish border and the crown prince advanced into holstein with an army of sixteen thousand men to protect the kingdom the mounting ambition of napoleon manifested by his proclamation as emperor of france in eighteen o four made all europe regard him as a common enemy and a new coalition was soon formed against him consisting of england russia and austria napoleon crushed the austrians at ulm and the united forces of russia and austria at austerlitz but england dealt his naval power a deadly blow at trafalgar in eighteen o six the confederation of the rhine was organized under the protectorate of the emperor and the old german empire ceased to exist prussia declared war only to be crushed at jena and Auerstadt, and napoleon occupied berlin in rapid succession the continental powers had been vanquished but england was still defiant and as her proud navy controlled the sea he would have to strike at her only vulnerable spot her commerce in eighteen o six he issued his noted berlin decree declaring the british isles to be in a state of blockade and interdicting all trade with england not only in france but in all ports of europe over which he exercised authority including the netherlands western germany prussia and italy after the treaty of tilsit eighteen o seven he also subjected russia to his continental system in december eighteen o seven he issued a second decree from milan in which he threatened to seize any ship which touched at a british port the english retaliated by orders in council declaring the ports of france and her allies to be in a state of blockade but allowing neutral vessels to carry on trade between these ports and great britain the crown prince who had been stationed in holstein where he had gathered an army of twenty thousand men finally withdrew the greater part of his force across the eider it seemed to have been his purpose to maintain neutrality as long as possible and to cast his lot with england if he were finally forced into the struggle the situation was constantly growing more critical as any move which this government might make was interpreted as unfriendly either by napoleon or england in direct contravention of the concessions which had been made to neutral powers in eighteen o one the english government issued new orders in council forbidding neutral ships to trade between the ports of france or her allies 
this new restriction would damage danish norwegian commerce very seriously but although sharp diplomatic encounters followed no redress of wrongs could be obtained the ultimate rupture with one or the other of the belligerents could evidently not long be averted even by the most watchful prudence after the battle of friedland and the peace of tilsit napoleon succeeded in winning to his side the imaginative emperor alexander i of russia alexander promised to attempt to negotiate peace between france and england but if the english government should refuse to accept the terms on which the two emperors had agreed russia should join france denmark norway sweden and portugal would be requested to close their ports to english commerce and if they refused they should be treated as enemies this cunning stroke of napoleon shattered the policy of neutrality and forced the smaller nations to choose sides in the conflict the news of the alliance between france and russia and their plans regarding the neutral nations caused the greatest alarm not only in copenhagen stockholm and lisbon but also in england the english government imagined that denmark norway was a secret partner to the compact and without even taking the time to ascertain the real state of affairs a large fleet was immediately dispatched to denmark on august the sixth the english diplomat sir francis jackson arrived in kiel where the crown prince and christian bernstorff were staying and presented an english ultimatum as a guarantee that denmark norway would be the ally of england they should turn their fleet over to the english who would use it during the war and return it to the owners after the peace had been concluded forty thousand english troops should cooperate with the danes against france and in return for the aid which denmark norway should give england they might receive a few english colonies the crown prince and bernstorff were so taken by surprise that they lost their presence of mind and the negotiations became a scene of almost pitiable confusion so much they nevertheless succeeded in making clear to the english ambassador that the ports of the realm would not be closed to english commerce and that denmark norway would enter into an alliance with england but the english demanded the fleet as if they were negotiating with criminals whose words and pledges could not be relied upon even an alliance would not be accepted as sufficient guarantee no more humiliating terms could have been offered an independent people but it was folly for the crown prince to make open resistance the english forces concentrated on sea land under lord cathcart numbered thirty one thousand men commanded by the most experienced english generals among others general wellesley the later duke of wellington the fleet commanded by admiral gambier consisted of twenty-five ships of the line forty frigates and a large number of smaller vessels and transports to subject the capital with its antiquated defences to the bombardment and attack of such a force when it was defended only by some fourteen thousand men of whom not above six thousand belonged to the regular army appears like a don quixote adventure even under such circumstances from the second to the fifth of september copenhagen was bombarded until it looked like a sea of flames large portions of the city were laid in ruins and between two and three thousand people were killed the commandant general payman was forced to capitulate and the danish fleet of seventy vessels which was lying in the harbour wholly unprepared for active service was taken but england had gained nothing and lost much by her precipitate haste the unprovoked attack on denmark was not only an outrage on a friendly nation but it was a political mistake of the worst sort the assumption advanced by english historians that napoleon planned to seize the fleet of denmark norway to use it against england and that his plan was frustrated only by the prompt action of the english government must be dismissed as pure hypothesis napoleon was taking steps to coerce denmark norway to submit to the demands of france and russia if the english fleet had not arrived when it did a rupture with france would have followed and denmark norway would have become the ally of england their fleet would have co-operated with that of england and their army which was already stationed on the southern border to protect the kingdom against french attack would have been ready to co-operate with whatever forces the english government could have placed in the field against napoleon but by this ill-starred event the danish norwegian fleet had been destroyed as a fighting force and in her despair denmark formed an alliance with france the english government was much disappointed at the outcome of the expedition to copenhagen even after the capture of the fleet attempts were made to persuade the danish government to enter into an alliance with england this might have been the wisest policy for denmark norway even at that moment but it must be granted that such a step would require a degree of self-abnegation which is not usually given to human nature the english attack had not only brought about the destructive bombardment of copenhagen and the loss of the fleet but by forcing denmark norway into an alliance with napoleon it resulted in still greater disasters to the twin kingdoms 
by a treaty of alliance concluded at fontainebleau october the thirty first eighteen o seven denmark norway agreed to cooperate with france and russia and to close all ports against english commerce on november fourth england declared war against the two kingdoms it was a dark moment for denmark norway the english had not only taken the fleet but all the military stores in copenhagen and because of the suddenness of the attack they were also able to seize about a thousand danish and norwegian merchant vessels in their own harbours and elsewhere they had also occupied the island of helgoland a step which denmark mark norway could not prevent as they had been deprived of all means of defending themselves at sea the interruption of commerce and the destruction of lives and property incident to the war brought upon the north a period of intense suffering this was especially the case in norway where the necessary quantity of grain cannot be produced and where the cessation of import trade finally added famine to the many trials of those dark years but the otherwise gloomy picture is brightened by the intense patriotism and high courage with which the peoples of both kingdoms waged the long struggle with their powerful enemy the english had estimated that the fleet and supplies seized at copenhagen represented a value of two million pounds during the war they captured about fifteen hundred danish or norwegian merchant vessels and smaller craft but in balancing accounts at the end of the war they still found that the struggle had netted them a considerable loss after the loss of the fleet denmark norway still had two ships of the line which were not at copenhagen at the time of the bombardment and with resolute energy they set to work to create a fleet of small vessels each carrying a couple of guns with this flotilla of gunboats manned with experienced seamen they began a guerrilla warfare at sea which proved destructive to english commerce in the baltic the lighthouses remained dark and the boys were moved to misguide the stranger while the gunboats and privateers lay in ambush behind the rocks and skerries of the dark coast ready to swoop down upon the enemy at any given opportunity the dangers became so great that the english merchant vessels had to unite into fleets under convoy of men of war but these naval caravans moved slowly as the whole fleet had to stop whenever a vessel was to make port and even such convoys were in danger of being attacked by the gunboats in eighteen o eight the gunboat flotilla attacked an english convoy at malmo and captured or destroyed eleven merchant vessels many valuable prizes were taken from time to time according to documents in the danish archives the value of prizes brought into danish norwegian harbours amounted to twenty eight million eighty one thousand thirteen rigs dollar and the value of those which were actually confiscated amounted to fourteen million nine hundred and thirty three thousand nine one hundred and nineteen rigs dollar in all two thousand english merchant vessels were seized by the danes and norwegians during the war at times successful battles were also fought with english men of war on march fourteenth eighteen o eight the norwegian brig logan defeated the english brig childers and on june nineteenth the same year the logan captured the english brig seagull which was incorporated in the norwegian fleet but such moments when victory brightened the melancholy aspect of the unequalled struggle must have been few and far between the english men of war swept along the coast and picked up every little craft which sought to steal across to denmark to fetch food for those who were starving at home and the daring voyagers who would risk all to relieve their growing distress were carried off as prisoners of war and huddled together with like unfortunates in the dreadful english prison ships the norwegian privateers did valiant service in the guerrilla warfare but officers and crew would often pay for their daring by languishing for years in the unsanitary military prison pens which sometimes harboured whole armies of those unfortunate victims of war the english themselves disliked this war with denmark norway which was waged for no definite purpose which proved so expensive and so destructive to their commerce and which cut off their supply of norwegian lumber and shipbuilding material the old insane king christian the seventh died march thirteenth eighteen o eight and the crown prince who had long acted as regent ascended the throne of, as frederick the sixth the political situation was so extremely difficult that he might have needed the assistance and advice of the ablest men but he preferred to exercise unlimited autocratic power even to an extent hitherto unknown not till in eighteen thirteen when utter ruin threatened the realm did he summon his ministers for consultation he sought with great earnestness and uprightness of purpose to promote the welfare of the people but he entertained very extravagant notions as to his own ability as a ruler and looked with jealous disfavour upon any minister who exhibited any 
independence of mind and ventured to offer suggestions or advice his overweening self-esteem which made him unnecessarily despotic in affairs of government was fully equalled by his confidence in his military ability and his love for martial adventure and display these traits of character which rendered his statesmanship venturesome and ill-advised were particularly unfortunate at a critical juncture when the state policy should have been dictated by the greatest wisdom and prudence to the norwegians the war with england was ruinous their coasts were blockaded and their lucrative commerce destroyed yet the struggle which was as useless as it was hopeless was nevertheless waged for a cause but when king frederick also declared war against sweden eighteen o eight as it appears for no cause whatever except that sweden opposed france and russia it must be regarded as sheer madness it was clear that the norwegians would also be compelled to bear the brunt of this war though they lacked not only military stores but the necessities of life while their unprotected coasts were ravaged by the english they would also have to guard their extensive borders against the swedes and it must have been evident to the king that any hope of aid from denmark was precluded from the outset as the danes had no navy and the norwegian coast was patrolled by english warships it had furthermore been evident for a long time that the swedish kings sought to gain possession of norway and no better opportunity could be offered than a war under such circumstances the immediate danger was however less than might have been expected as gustavus the fourth of sweden who was tottering on the brink of insanity brought upon his country such disasters that its very existence was threatened he could not be persuaded to submit to the continental system he regarded napoleon as the beast of the apocalypse against whom relentless war ought to be waged and as he believed himself to be a reincarnation of charles the twelfth he did not hesitate to join england against france and russia by a war against these powers sweden would gain nothing and with a blindness which finds an explanation only in his insanity he thereby exposed St. finland to the attack of russia which was becoming an ever greater danger to the scandinavian kingdoms on february the twenty first eighteen o eight alexander the first sent an army of sixteen thousand men to occupy finland without the formality of a warning or a declaration of war on february twenty ninth king frederick the sixth persuaded by his french and russian allies declared war on sweden regarding the feeling which this step created in norway the contemporary norwegian statesman jacob al says in his memoirs it was regarded even by those who were most devoted to the danish government as a great mistake in danish politics and a presentiment was felt of the possible results which in the fullness of time might reveal themselves this war prepared the way for the separation of denmark and norway and some norwegians began though vaguely to think of the advisability of a union with sweden the very possibility of which had hitherto wounded their innermost feelings on account of the interruption of communications with denmark the king was now obliged to create a special government for norway a government commission reg gering commissionen for norge at the head of which stood prince christian august of augustenburg commanding general in southern norway count Vettel jarlsberg was placed at the head of a subsidiary commission which should seek to provide the country with the necessary supplies a most difficult task under the circumstances a superior court was also created in eighteen o seven over a criminal retin which should meet in christiania and should be the highest court of appeal in all criminal cases this gave norway an autonomy in judicial and administrative affairs which it had not enjoyed for centuries where russia attacked finland napoleon ordered marshal bernadotte to march through denmark and attack sweden in eighteen o eight an army of about twenty three thousand men was sent to jutland a danish force of about fourteen thousand men was to join it in sealand but what might easily have been foreseen happened the army could not be transported across the sound which was patrolled by english warships and the plan had to be abandoned denmark was cut off from both her adversaries and norway was left to fight her battles alone the swedish forces in active service at this time numbered about one hundred thousand men but owing to the war with russia and finland and a possible attack on southern sweden only the western army of thirteen thousand four hundred men under general g m armfelt and a smaller detachment in Jemtland of two thousand men under colonel bergenstrahle could operate against norway the norwegians could mobilize only about one half of their southern army of seventeen thousand men and so poor were the equipments that the soldiers had to wear old uniforms which had been in use in the war of seventeen eighty eight ragged and half naked these defenders of their country were sent against the superior invading force but the people resolved to hold the enemy at bay and from their scant supplies they provided the soldiers with food and clothing as far as this could be done under the circumstances 
well-to-do citizens organized volunteer companies and equipped them at their own expense and many burned her and re-enlisted as volunteers when the term of required military service had expired and of old de Valsum, count hermann vettel jarlsberg and other leading men labored with untiring zeal to provide means for carrying on the defense of the country and prince christian august commander of the military forces gained the love and confidence of the soldiers by his democratic ways and true soldierly spirit the patriotism and love for their leader which inspired the norwegians made them formidable in a border war of the kind which had just begun and as the swedish general g m armfeldt divided his forces into different columns instead of concentrating them for a main attack it became possible for christian august to meet and defeat each detachment in turn on april fifteenth general armfeldt attacked the norwegians at lear not far from the glamen river south of the kongsvinger and drove them back across the river but this was to be his only success at torvrud one of his flying columns under count axel mourner was defeated and captured april twentieth by a norwegian force under major welby and at trangen another detachment under major gon was captured by major staffeldt these victories aroused great enthusiasm and the people contributed liberally to the support of the army jacob al writes every one hastened to place his offering on his country's altar provisions money and clothing poured in for the army on the border and the merchant john collett in christiania distinguished himself especially by collecting or sending provisions and by personally contributing to the maintenance of the army nearly every number of Budsticken published lists of contributions of this kind in that first war with sweden private charity made good the deficiency in the provisions made by the public authorities due to the lack of means and the depleted and impoverished condition of the country after the war had lasted two weeks collett could announce that fifty-five mostly two-team wagons had been sent to the army the unsuccessful engagements already fought made it clear to king gustavus the fourth that further operations against norway with the forces then available would prove unsuccessful successful and he ordered general armfeldt to retreat to the border the swedish general concentrated his forces at enningdalen but he suffered new losses in an engagement at presterbach june tenth where over four hundred men and twenty-seven officers were taken prisoners this was the last engagement of any importance between the swedes and norwegians in this war sweden had to employ all her strength in against the advancing russians and finland and the norwegians did not wish to carry on an offensive war against sweden the friendship which had been developing between the two peoples had manifested itself quite clearly at the time when they sought as allies to defend their neutrality but in the present war it was shown in a still more emphatic way the norwegians would defend their country with every possible means but they made it quite clear that although they had been forced into war they entertained none but the kindliest feelings for their swedish neighbours the war with finland had brought sweden into great peril her armies indeed won brilliant victories at lapo utis and other places and several of her generals as alder Krutz, Budubelin and sandals had greatly distinguished themselves but the lack of proper support from home and the treasonable surrender of the strong fortress of Sveborg with military stores a hundred vessels of the coast fleet and a garrison of seven thousand men made the situation critical on september the fourteenth eighteen o nine general alder Krutz suffered a crushing defeat at Oravais, and before the end of the war the swedes were expelled from finland which was turned into a russian province in eighteen o nine the russians prepared to follow up their advantage by an invasion of sweden national peril and disaster intensified the growing ill-will against the incompetent and mentally unbalanced king gustavus the fourth who had involved the kingdom in this disastrous war it had long been evident that he was mentally unfit to direct the affairs of government and a conspiracy was formed to depose him one of the leaders of this movement was george aldo spar commander of the right wing of the swedish army operating against norway he determined to lead his forces against stockholm but the situation was so critical that this could not be done without the greatest hazard unless he could persuade the norwegians to suspend operations christian august was expected to attack sweden at the same time that the russians were preparing to advance from the east the russian general skuvalov had already entered northern sweden by crossing the tornea river barclay de Tolly occupied umea and russian cossacks from the eland islands had appeared in stockholm len 
prince christian august hesitated he saw sweden's plight and reflected upon the consequences to the north if the kingdom should be overwhelmed by russia would not the scandinavian peninsula share the fate of finland when aldaspar turned to him with the request to refrain from aggressive operations against sweden he promised that he would not cross the border unless he received peremptory orders from frederick the sixth to do so and even then he would not enter swedish territory without giving a ten days notice this was more than a courtesy it was rendering an enemy a service so important that it might have been construed as treason if it were not for the exigencies of the situation and the friendship which really existed between the two peoples in sweden it was officially stated that prince christian august had shown the country a greater service than had ever been rendered it by a foreigner the prince had risked this step for sweden's sake and no one has ever questioned his patriotism and loyalty frederick the sixth failed to comprehend the situation time and again he ordered the norwegian army to invade sweden and join the advancing russians on swedish soil but christian august who saw that such a step would be suicidal always found new pretexts for postponement and the army never crossed the border as soon as alderspar had received assurances from christian august he hastened to karlstad where he raised the standard of revolt and new troops constantly joined him on his march but even before he reached stockholm the king was arrested by general alderkreutz who had just returned from finland the estates were summoned duke charles of sodermanland was placed on the throne as king charles the thirteenth and a constitution was adopted which made sweden a limited constitutional monarchy the victorious advance of the russians which as frederick sneedorf had predicted in seventeen ninety two had become more than an imaginary peril to the north revived again the pan scandinavian sentiment swedish politicians began to consider the advisability of choosing frederick the sixth of denmark norway swedish crown prince as the newly elected king charles the thirteenth had no heirs the plan which would lead to the union of the three kingdoms was supported by prince christian august and many leading men in norway especially by count hermann vettel jarlsberg but king frederick himself soon defeated it by his prejudice and narrow-minded absolutism as he would not accept the crown of sweden had a constitution limiting the power of the king in the meantime alsner spar who at this moment was the most influential man in sweden was endeavouring to secure the election of christian august as the heir to the swedish throne the prince was very popular in norway and it was hoped that the norwegians could easily be persuaded to make him their king and a union between norway and sweden would thus be established for this plan he received an enthusiastic support of prince christian august's chief adviser count vettel jarlsberg who soon abandoned his pan scandinavian ideas and developed a political policy which aimed at a united scandinavia that the position taken by the count strained to the breaking point the ties of loyalty to king frederick the sixth seems quite apparent but norway had paid dearly enough for the political blunders of the oldenborg kings the time had come when the norwegians would safeguard the interests of their own country in any way which they might deem expedient to protect norway against possible russian aggression to secure peace with england and sweden and to save the country from impending famine seemed more important to count vettel jarlsberg and his associates then to earn the compliments and goodwill of the king the count proposed to christian august that the norwegians should declare themselves independent of denmark and elect him king of norway but the prince would agree to no plan which seemed treasonable he promised the swedish messengers however that he would accept the election as swedish crown prince if king frederick the sixth would grant him leave to do so in july eighteen o nine he was elected crown prince of sweden as charles august and king frederick granted him permission to accept the proffered honour on september seventeenth of that year a treaty of peace between sweden and russia was signed at frederickshamn by which finland was ceded to russia and sweden had to submit to the continental system on december tenth peace was also concluded between sweden and denmark norway at jonkersping the war with england continued but in order to appease the norwegians king frederick agreed to a proposal made by the council of regency to raise the embargo on commerce between norway and england by a mutual agreement with the english government according to which norwegian merchant ships could sail to english harbours if they purchased in london a license which would ensure them against attack by english privateers and men of war this license trade or neutral commerce helped greatly to relieve the distress in norway as grain and other commodities could be imported and the export of timber and other articles could be resumed in eighteen ten prince charles august 
left norway for his future kingdom his departure was celebrated with great festivities and the people showed him the most devoted affection count fedel jarlsberg who accompanied him across the border had been unable to persuade the prince to head a norwegian uprising but he had not relinquished the hope of bringing about a union between norway and sweden at the time of his election as crown prince charles august was less than forty-one years of age but he was not destined to ascend to the throne of sweden on may twenty eighth eighteen ten while attending military manoeuvres in skane he died suddenly of an apoplectic stroke this opened anew the difficult question of the election of a swedish crown prince destined to produce such important political changes in the north End of chapter forty nine